The story begins in a school, where Chen Zhilao occupies his class and contemplates being known as Chen Zhilao, a genius at studying. He believes there are no questions in this world he can't solve. However, his certainty is challenged when he encounters a difficult question and unexpectedly falls in love with a troublesome girl. At that moment, Tai Zio Mei enters the class, takes a seat on Chen Zhilao's desk, and informs him that she will pass the homework to him again, emphasizing that she needs to play the game later that night. The class teacher intervenes, stating that the student's desk is not her bed, and instructs Tai Zio Mei to get down. Chen Zhilao agrees to take her notebook, saying okay. The teacher warns Tai Zio Mei that if she continues to disturb the study community member, she should go outside. Chen Zhilao seizes the opportunity to ask if she can let him join her for the game. Tai Zio Mei walks out of the class, affirming that she lacks a healer and arranging to meet at 8.30 p.m. in the newbie village, with her ID being Bursting Sweetheart. After a while, he heads home, recalling her ID Bursting Sweet, and mentions that there's an uncommonly anticipated thunderstorm set to hit their city at 8.30 p.m. He advises everyone to close all electronic devices to prevent accidents. Upon entering the house, he informs his mom that he's back. She notices his early arrival at home and inquires about it. He explains that due to the weather, they were released early today. Commenting on the fierce rain, she advises him to rest up as dinner will be ready soon. He inquires about any packages for him, and she confirms there is one in the corridor. Spotting the package, he heads towards his room. She questions if he has started playing a game and reminds him to relax, urging him to come down and eat later. Observing his hurried ascent, she speculates whether he promised to meet someone, possibly a girl. After a while, he lies on the bed and mentions that Cosmos is currently the most popular VR online game and that using the helmet can provide a mental sense, achieving a reality-like gaming experience. He berates himself, thinking he should have started playing the game earlier, and Sayo may must already be a high-ranking player. However, this should be easy for him. Just then, he receives a notification of a message. He checks it and reads, hurry up and come online. She has been waiting for him for a long time. He hurriedly gets up and sets everything, thinking this might be his first time dating someone. He starts the connection to the cosmos. Upon landing in the game, a notification thanks him for purchasing cosmos and welcomes him. He finds it quite cool. The status window notifies him that Cosmos is a survival game, a worldwide adventure in a dangerous world filled with treasures and artifacts. It instructs him to pick a new profession to start his journey. He exclaims that it has begun. The status screen presents him with different professions. Remembering Zio Mei saying a healer should be chosen, he picks a healer. The status window notifies that the first purchase of a clothes set is free. Determined to look good on his first date, he selects the clothes. Meanwhile, in the real world, they announce that the city's thunderstorm has reached a red warning, urging everyone to close all electric devices to prevent accidents. A thunderstorm hits Chen Jiala's house, and a short circuit occurs in his Cosmos helmet. He informs Xiaomi that he's coming for their first date, but he gets an electric shock badly. He wonders what is going on as his body starts flying into the room. After a while, his mom enters his room and inquires if he knows why their home's electric power has failed. Not finding him in the room, she asks where he is. Chen Zhilao sees monsters approach Tai Zio Mei, and she calls out for someone to save her. She sees Chen Zhilao coming closer to her, and he remarks that he's late but assures her not to worry as it's over. She acknowledges him as her hero and suddenly moves closer and tries to kiss each other while a chameleon licks his lips. He advises her to slow down, mentioning that there is so much saliva that it's all over his face, and sees that chameleon on his face. He quickly gets up and shouts Tai Zio Mei, removes his coat, and contemplates that he will lose 900 milliliters of sweat every hour in this hot weather. He realizes that getting dehydrated and fainting is only a matter of time, and he is no longer playing around. He expresses surprise at the high difficulty level of the game. She is still waiting for him, so he should log out first and explain it to her while he tries to log into his portal. However, it shows a notification stating that he is unable to log out. He tries again and asks if she's joking, but once more, he can't log out. He questions whether he's unable to log out and expresses frustration, wondering what is happening. He starts to think that she may have triggered a mission, and he checks his portal again to find information on how to survive. But he can't retrieve any information. Chen Zhilao becomes anxious and states that he only wants to play a game with Tai Zio Mei. He questions why he is now trapped and punches the floor, exclaiming God, damn it. He reflects on how he can't log out of the game, regardless of the method he tries, and he can't contact anyone. 
he wonders if he will be stuck here forever. The scene shifts after eight hours, and he walks, expressing disbelief that he is trapped in a game. As time passes, he accepts the reality that he won't be able to exit the game. He discovers that the game mechanics mirror those of the real world, and the nausea and dizziness from dehydration and heat feel very realistic. He realizes that if he continues in this manner, death is the only outcome, and to survive, he needs to find a water source first. After a while, he spots a small rock and recalls from watching Ed Stafford's survival show that this type of limestone is typically found near spring water, suggesting he is close to a water source. Observing numerous rocks, he speculates that there must be a water source in the rocky area, and declares let's go, as a desert wolf notices him and begins following. He arrives at the entrance of a cave, expressing hope that his judgment is correct. Upon reaching the cave, he discovers a water pond, rushes towards it, and drinks. Feeling grateful to be alive after quenching his thirst, he lies down while the desert wolf also follows. He believes the water problem has been solved, but there is still no way to escape from this place. Meanwhile, he once again checks his portal screen and comments that, being a game, there should be a hint on how to exit this desert. He examines the map for location information and remarks that the map function only displays areas that have been explored, acknowledging it won't be that easy. To be cautious, he decides to carefully examine the system panel. Taking a deep breath, he notes that with such low stats and no attack skill, his only option when encountering a monster is to run. He wonders how to acquire a skill by triggering specific conditions. Deciding to inspect his equipment, he opens his beginner package and finds an iron sword and leather gloves. He mentions that a healer's first piece of equipment is a sword while putting on the gloves, emphasizing the importance of having weapons on him at all times for safety. After a while, he practices with his sword and considers that the hardness and durability of this sword surpass that of reality. The wearing down of the sword is also displayed, and it seems like everything in the game is visualized. He concludes that there is no more useful information for now, and he should go out to find some food. Otherwise, he won't be able to hold on for much longer. Hearing some sounds, he questions what was that sound and ventures further into the cave. Observing the spacious interior, he realizes that, while he was previously focused on drinking water, he should now thoroughly investigate. To his surprise, he encounters numerous bones and skeletons. Shocked by the discovery, he wonders why there are so many animal skeletons there. He grabs a bone and notices teeth marks on it, feeling like he has seen these marks in a book he read before. Meanwhile, he realizes the urgency of the situation and remarks that it's not good to stay here for long. He asserts that he needs to leave quickly, running out. Suddenly, a wolf appears in front of him, almost attacking his head, swiftly evading the attack. He examines the wolf and checks his portal to gather information about it. He identifies it as a desert wolf of a certain level, understanding its strength, speed, main attack, and weaknesses. Assessing the three-level difference, he notes that the opponent's attack has a crushing effect, and he feels his hand is badly injured. Acknowledging the presence of real monsters, he reflects on the recent attack, realizing that the wolf's speed far exceeds his own. Recognizing the importance of running away, he concludes that he can only fight if he's willing to accept the risk of dying. The scene shifts into a flashback as Chen Jilao reminisces about his high school days. He recalls being the president of the Fengji Kendo Club and proudly mentions that he was the youngest person in the country to achieve the sixth degree in Kendo while practicing with a wooden sword. Reflecting on the question of why he learned Kendo, he provides a simple reason. He recounts that his mother, once a star chaser in her youth, developed a strong admiration for City J's Kendo star, Kimura Yi. While watching a game on television with his mother, he explains that she influenced him to start learning Kendo from a young age. Initially thinking Kendo was easy and merely a display of skill in gorgeous attire, he soon realized, upon dedicated practice, that the sport was far more complex than he had initially perceived. Meanwhile, his master explains that when one faces a real enemy in a kendo suit, the experience involves listening to the opponent's breathing and heartbeat during the fight. He describes how an inexplicable fear tightly surrounds the individual, slowing down their movements and almost engulfing their entire body. This sense of horror stems from a realization of one's lack of strength. The master emphasizes that the only way to become stronger is through persistent practice, continuous self-strengthening, and pushing oneself consistently. Chen Jiliao adds that he spent all his spare time in the dojo, which lacked air conditioning, performing the same actions he had repeated a thousand times. Enduring constant failure, regular injuries, and continuous training, he kept swinging until he became the youngest Kendo 6th Dan in City Z importantly. 
he emphasizes that he has not given up on training. The scene returns to the present, and he comments that in a world where the strong prevail over the weak, the winner reigns as king. He observes a desert wolf running toward him with the intent to attack and acknowledges that he doesn't know how terrifying his next opponent is, but he is now ready to face it. Despite preparing to attack, he underestimates the desert wolf, striking it with his sword. However, the wolf shows no signs of injury, quickly evading the attack and kicking him away. As he falls, he attempts to catch his breath and wonders why his sword attacks have no effect. Realizing that the desert wolf has a strong defense, he receives a notification on his status screen, indicating that the weakness of the desert wolf is its abdomen. After a while, he realizes that, except for the abdomen, attacking other places has no effect on the desert wolf. As the wolf comes toward him again to attack, he curses and attempts to escape, pondering the futility of knowing the weakness if he can't effectively act on it. He notes the wolf's incredible speed and the challenge of reaching its fatal body part if his attacks have no impact forcing him into a passive defense. Fearing that he will eventually succumb if the situation persists, he contemplates the grim possibility of dying in this challenging environment. His status screen notifies him of decreasing HP, urging him to replenish blood volume quickly. Realizing that the animal's weakness is the abdomen, he formulates a plan, thinking that if this trick works, it should be enough to defeat the beast. The desert wolf bites hard on his shoulder, causing his blood to fly onto the wolf. Despite the pain, he manages to stab the wolf, confidently stating that it's impossible for the attack to be invalid this time. He successfully kills the wolf and declares victory. Reflecting on the battle, he realizes he deliberately allowed the beast to bite him, aiming to make it relax its guard on the weak point, finding the game truly interesting. His status screen issues another notification, informing him that he has killed the desert wolf, gaining 6,000 experience points leveling up to 5, and acquiring 25 disposable skill points. After the level up, he notices that the wounds on his body have instantly healed. Another notification follows, indicating that the hidden level mall system has launched. Chen Jilao notes that this is indeed the world of the game, and like any other game, killing mobs grants experience points, while leveling up provides skill points that can enhance stats. As he checks his status screen, he wonders about the hidden mall system, Pressing the enter button, he decides to explore it and discovers numerous equipment listings with their specifications, confirming that this is the mall. Receiving a notification, he learns that the mall charges levels to unlock each item category, and purchasing items within the mall will also consume levels. Surprised, he realizes that, besides weapons and defensive equipment, there are even household and electronic appliances available, and they, too, require significant levels to unlock. Puzzled, he questions who would buy home appliances in a game. Meanwhile, he observes that the mercenary system requires a whopping 100 levels to unlock and check its display. As he scrutinizes the information, he notices a girl attacking him and surmises that it's a holographic projection. Examining various categories like offense type, defense type, magic type, and assassination type, he remarks on the diverse types of mercenaries available. Spotting an elf categorized as a service type, he expresses shock and questions the usefulness of such an option, wondering if the developers intend for people to live and die alone in this peculiar place. All the while, the elf performs seductive poses. He receives a notification stating that, with his current levels, he can only unlock the daily necessities category and inquires if he would like to proceed with the unlock. He confidently affirms that he knows and doesn't need a prompt, successfully unlocking the daily necessities category by consuming five levels in its first activation. Reflecting on the limited options available for redemption with his levels, he deems it satisfactory for the present. He then requests the system to display the skill points from earlier. Although his status has fully recovered, he remains clueless about the conditions for activating a skill. Realizing that, for now, he'll have to rely on increasing his stats. He acknowledges that the assigned points can't be adjusted after allocation. He concludes that these stats will likely directly influence his future in the game. After a while, he speculates that if physique determines his HP, intelligence should correlate with his magic attack damage, and strength, endurance, and agility should correlate with physical damage, defense, and speed, respectively. Reflecting on the desert wolf he killed earlier. He notes that its strength and speed were on another level despite only having a 5-level difference. Realizing that if he encounters a much more powerful monster, he'll need to ensure he can gain the upper hand in terms of speed and attack power. Pressing the yes button, 
he decides to allocate 5 points to physique to bolster his HP, 10 points to strength to ensure he can deal sufficient damage to monsters, and the remaining points will all go to agility. Meanwhile, he realizes that, as expected, after assigning the skill points, the effects are immediately activated in his body. He senses newfound strength throughout his entire body, and it feels much lighter. He appreciates the awesome feeling of becoming stronger just as he hears the howl of wolves, indicating there are more nearby. Viewing it as perfect timing, he decides to test the power of his new stats and prepares for an attack. He confidently declares that he will wipe out their entire pack today as the wolves growl and prepare to attack. With a single, powerful strike, he cuts the head of a wolf, recognizing that he now possesses enough attack power to overcome the desert wolf's defense. As a result of his successful battle, he levels up. He quickly starts to attack the other wolves, realizing that the increase in these three stats has also strengthened his swordsmanship. This means he can defeat them, cutting them into pieces one after another. His status screen notifies him of leveling up, congratulating him on reaching level 15. After killing them all, he has gained 24,000 experience points and 75 assignable skill points. Reflecting on the experience, he thinks that killing mobs after leveling up is really easy. The scene shifts to nighttime as he exits the cave, contemplating that it's now late, the temperature is cool, and he has gathered enough food and water. Ready to start looking for a way out, he notices some wolves dead outside the cave in a peculiar condition. Approaching, he wonders why all these wolves are dead and spots someone on top of a mountain killing wolves. Swiftly getting up and gripping his sword, he questions the identity of the person. He finds it strange. He thinks he clearly saw someone here just now, and the wolf's corpses are still present, so he does not believe he is mistaken. He wonders if there could be other players like him who have been trapped here. Picking up a dead body with his sword, he notes that the blood in the body seems to have been sucked away by something. He considers if another player would use such a cruel method. Feeling something strange around, he says, no, that's not it. The status screen notifies him of a warning. Seeing some tentacles approaching him, he attacks them, and his weapon durability decreases by 25%. He thinks that the thing that killed these wolves was not a human but an even higher level monster. Suddenly, a humanoid monster appears in front of him. He realizes that this is a monster of a completely different magnitude compared to those desert wolves he encountered before. If he hadn't raised his agility stat right after leveling up, he would have been dead already. The tentacle from the human monster's hand, which he cut earlier, regrows. Surprised to see it, he thinks it has regenerated. The status window notifies him that the human monster's name is Wandering Dominator, and there exist dominators in the Lacnea Desert with absolute speed, the top of the food chain that survives on the blood of other creatures and no one can escape from its hunt. He thinks that even though he has already been prepared to meet all sorts of monsters here, their fierce killing intent feels like it's pressing him into the ground, rendering him unable to move. The Wandering Dominator attacks him. He feels as if he is waiting to be hunted by it. This is the first time he has felt something so terrifying. The Wandering Dominator again comes to attack him, but he moves aside and goes to attack it back. He declares that he won't let the monster scare him. Disappearing from the front, he reappears behind it and lands a punch, throwing it away. As he gets up again, he ponders whether this is the so-called absolute speed the system mentioned previously. The Wandering Dominator launches another attack, and Chen Jilao sustains severe injuries. Reflecting on the last blow, he considers that it could have taken his life, but he wonders about the monster's intentions. Falling to the ground, he observes the Wandering Dominator walking away, picking up Chen Jilao's sword and returning to hand it to him. Chen Jilao questions if it wants him to cut at its neck, finding the scene reminiscent of, where deja vu a cat catches a mouse and plays with its prey instead of immediately consuming it. The wandering dominator throws him away, and the status screen notifies him that weapon durability has increased by 80%. He thinks it is way too fast, ordinary attacks can't hurt it at all. The wandering dominator picks him up by the neck and says, human. Chen Jilao is surprised, thinking that this creature can speak. It declares that humans are like maggots, such a weak species. Chen Jiliao attacks, cutting its arm, and retorts that it is the maggot with a dung beetle brain. The monster regrows its arm and remarks that it's interesting. It mentions that it's been hundreds of years since it last met a human that made it feel this exhilarated. Chen Jiliao replies that he is quite exhilarated as well. He declares that he hasn't felt so lively and fired up in a long time. He thinks about his family and friends, acknowledging that he still has a long life ahead of him, and he refuses to die in a place like this. He screams and says to wait for him to come back. He collects all his power, 
and the game notifies him that his extraordinary fighting spirit has activated the special blessing of the Latinea, and all his stats have been increased by 100. Wandering Dominator says, that's more like it. Bring it on. Chen Jiliao attacks him back to back, and the game notifies him with a warning that his weapon's durability has reached 0%, rendering it broken and unusable. His sword breaks, and he throws it away, then punches him in the face and throws it away. He declares that he will kill him and take his experience points. Approaching from behind, he launches a severe attack on Chen Jilao, mocking him as a foolish human and stating that humans are like maggot-like species. Chen Jilao acknowledges that he still can't beat it even in his current condition. He utilizes his power to attack him again, he contemplating if he is going to die. The game notifies that player Chen Jilao's HP has reached zero and he has died. The scene shifts as Chen Jilao wakes up in a room, wondering if he is still alive and if he has been logged out of the game. He looks around, realizing that he is not outside the game. After a while, he checks the status window, thinking that the game interface is still present. It seems he is still trapped in the game, even though he was clearly killed by that monster. Despite this, he is sitting there, perfectly whole and healthy. Examining his body, he finds no injuries at all, leaving him puzzled about what is happening. Just then, Salili enters the room and asks if he is awake. He confirms that he just woke up. She informs Grandpa Albert that he is awake. Chen Jilao questions what's going on, wondering if the game has finally transported him to the beginner's village. Meanwhile, Grandpa Albert is planting some plants. Salili asks about what he said about being killed. He confirms that his entire chest was pierced through and then questions how he got there. She explains that Grandpa Albert found him while he was hunting, on the brink of death but not dead. Grandpa Albert interjects, stating that this place is not the game or the beginner's village he was talking about, and they are not the NPCs or players he mentioned. Chen Jilao insists that it is obviously still the game's world, and he must be mistaken. He points to the status window, mentioning the game's mission tab, status tab, and equipment tab, along with the mini-map. However, they cannot see anything where he is pointing. Salili asks Grandpa Albert if the monster hit him so hard that his brain got messed up. He humorously responds that it got messed up pretty badly, too. Chen Jilao thinks that he still can't contact the GM, Xiaomei's game ID is still not searchable, and he has completely lost contact with the outside world. He contemplates how he is supposed to leave this place and expresses his desire to go home. Grandpa Albert informs him that no one in the entire Latinea desert is able to leave. Chen Jilao questions why, emphasizing that even if it's a desert, there should still be a way out. He finds it hard to believe that it's impossible to leave and inquires about how they ended up in this place. Salili explains that a few years ago, she and Grandpa ran into a thunderstorm while hunting giant dragons on the Bergama continent. When they woke up, they were here and Grandpa mentioned that this is the Latinea desert from the legends, where even gods can be imprisoned. The only way to gain freedom is by finding the location of the Temple of Kebri. Legends say that this desert is a never-ending maze. She goes on to say that countless people have set out from the town to look for the temple, but none have ever returned alive. Gradually, everyone began to accept this reality and stopped searching for the temple, and they believe it's better to keep living instead of setting off to die. Grandpa Albert mentions that every year, new people are sent here, but he has never seen anyone get out. He walks away, advising him to start accepting reality, and suggests Salili take him on a stroll around town. Chen Jiliao finds it hard to believe, he is certain that he is still in the game, except he has been transported directly into the game, just like in Manhulis. The status window notifies him of a new mission, the Revenge of Kebri's Sorrow. The mission introduction states that since he has been reborn after receiving the god Kebri's protection, he must help the god Kebri undo their seal. The mission clear condition is finding the Temple of Kebri in the Latinea Desert, then defeating Nabris, the monster guarding the sealed temple, and releasing Kebri. The reward upon completion is the key to leaving the sealed land, the Latinea Desert. Chen Jiliao lies on the grass while checking his status screen, contemplating that although he still doesn't know why he was sent here, at least he finally has a goal. He believes that as long as he finds the Temple of Cabri and kills Nabris, he can exit. When the time comes, he'll be able to find a way out. Salili arrives and asks him why he's there, mentioning that she has been looking for him. He apologizes, explaining that he didn't have anything to do, so he came out for a walk. He points in a direction and asks if that is the Latinea Desert. She confirms it and adds that the place they're currently at is surrounded by the Latinea Desert, making it all around them. Considering this, he remarks that if that's the case, he doesn't know how long it'll take to find the temple. Meanwhile, she inquires if he's going to look for the temple, 
He affirms, stating that he has to leave this place. She expresses concern, saying that there's no temple, and if he leaves, he'll definitely die. Undeterred, he mentions that he has already died once and must find that temple, no matter what it takes. He suggests going into town together, and they start walking side by side. She questions if he's genuinely going to search for the temple. He confirms while she points out the presence of extremely strong monsters in the Latinea desert. She adds that even Grandfather Alber can't confidently say he can defeat them. He reassures her, saying not to worry as his ability to fight surprises others. After a while, a sudden explosion of smoke occurs in front of them, and hunter thieves arrive. Bobin declares that the prey has been hooked. Chen Zhiliao, coughing, asks what's going on. Salili quickly moves forward to block the attack. Bobin notes that she successfully blocked his attack with a wall of fire, and remarks that they meet again. She expresses surprise, questioning if it's him again. Chen Zhiliao asks what's happening and why they are being attacked. She explains that she forgot to tell him that the hunter thieves here are scarier than the monsters. She adds that they aren't willing to hunt in Latinea, so they often resort to stealing others' items. She describes them as a group of cowards dedicated to hunting and killing their own kind for a living. Chen Zhiliao inquires about the skill they are using while Bobin waves his swords infused with magic. Bobin informs Salili that running away won't be as easy as last time. Salili instructs Chen Zhiliao to go back, find Grandfather Alber, and leave this situation to her. Grandfather Alber observes the sky and asks if a thunderstorm is on its way, mentioning that by now, Salili should already be back from town. Bobin interjects, questioning if she thinks he'd let Chen Zhiliao go back to find that old man. He asserts that Salili knows her spells can't hurt him at all, and it's better to return obediently with him. He adds that maybe he'll consider letting Chen Zhilao go in her dreams, not blaming him for being rude. Salili insists to Chen Zhilao that she'll think of a way to stop them, urging him to leave. However, he refuses, and she questions what he would say. He replies that in his dictionary, the word escape doesn't exist. Despite their short time together, he emphasizes that he's not someone who can abandon his companion and leave by himself. Meanwhile, Bobin charges towards him, delivering a punch to his face and slamming him against a tree. He demands to know who Chen Zhilao thinks he is, questioning if he believes he can deceive anyone with words like that. While pressing Chen Zhilao's face against the tree, he asserts that here, they don't use their mouths to talk, they use their strength. Chen Zhilao seizes his hand, pushing it back, and challenges him, asking if he thinks he is strong. He crushes his hand and questions if he uses the strength he spoke of to launch sneak attacks. In response, he punches him away. Bobin thinks it's despicable, realizing that Chen Zhilao's strength was sufficient to dislocate his wrist. Chen Zhilao reflects on his speed, noting that despite allocating all his points to agility, he couldn't sense the sneak attack just now. Salili asks if he's okay, and he assures her that he is. She then queries Bobin about his intentions. He responds, repeating that he has said it many times, he wants her to be his girlfriend. She asserts that it's definitely impossible, advising him to give up. Chen Zhilao asks why he's approaching the situation so nervously and irritatingly just to make her his girlfriend. Annoyed, she reluctantly says okay. Bobin questions if she found this guy instead and if she rejected him because of Chen Zhilao. She asks what he's talking about, clarifying that he's just a friend. He dismisses the notion of friendship as an excuse, insisting they have a battle between men and urging her not to hide behind excuses. If he wins, he promises to stop bothering her. Checking his status screen, he becomes aware of a mission and its reward. Contemplating that this activated a mission and the reward is a map, he wonders if obtaining the map will allow him to leave this place. He considers the proposition and thinks, in that case, alright, it's a deal. Bobin agrees to the deal, prompting his team members to wonder why he's suddenly so serious, sensing an air filled with the smell of jealousy. She questions Chen Zhilao, asking if he's sure because he can't beat Bobin, who is the strongest shadow swordsman in town. Chen Zhiliao asks about the strength of shadow swordsmen and wonders if they are genuinely powerful. She explains that swordsmen who use the power of shadows not only have a speed advantage but also possess surprisingly strong strength. The sword, intertwined with shadows, exerts a powerful force, and she warns Chen Zhiliao that Bobin will kill him. Undeterred, he walks towards Bobin, thinking that he has already died once, and compared to death, he'd rather leave this place. Chen Zhiliao contemplates seriously, unable to comprehend how a once perfectly good life could devolve into its current state. He believes it should be sufficient if he defeats Bobin, and as long as he accomplishes that, he can obtain the map to escape this hellish place. Determined, he attempts to punch Bobin, 
Bobin remains calm, skillfully evading the punch, and inquires sailorly if the person she likes is only this strong. Chen Jiliao finds it strange why Bobin keeps defending and not attacking, wondering what trick he has up his sleeve. Sailorly informs him that she'll go with them, urging them to hurry and find Grandfather Albert to rescue her. She notes that, with Bobin's strength, Grandfather Albert is the only one in town who can stop him. He insists that he won't leave her, prompting her to ask what he means. He reassures her, saying not to worry, in any case, this battle is one that must be fought. If he wins, maybe they can leave this place. Perplexed, she questions the connection between defeating Bobin and leaving this place. He reflects that everything that happened after he entered this game had no logical connection. Being trapped in a game world, unable to log out, killed yet mysteriously revived afterward. And now, the system prompting him to defeat Bobin to get the map all seem coincidental. However, he senses that someone may be manipulating something behind the scenes. Bobin calls him, instructing him to raise his head. He throws his sword on the floor and questions why Chen Jilao is just standing there. He asks if he's afraid and remarks that it's too late to regret it now. Chen Jilao denies being afraid, but Bobin taunts him, accusing him of acting like a turtle and hiding around. Bobin explains that he suddenly felt that it was no fun to fight an unarmed, worthless piece of trash. He insists that since it's a formal fight, it should be fair and throws his sword towards Chen Jilao, who catches it. Bobin emphasizes that he doesn't want Sailorly and his subordinates to think that he's bullying them, while Chen Jilao tightens his grip on the sword. His team members note that the boss is unusually serious this time. Chen Jilao remarks that he didn't expect him to be a guy who follows the rules, but he hasn't forgotten the sneak attack launch just now. Bobin dismisses it as a desperate reaction, but Chen Jilao insists on stopping the yapping and proceeding to a fair and square battle. He acknowledges that, in any case, he has to defeat Bobin to get the map. Chen Jileo runs to attack, but Bobin counterattacks. They both attempt to defeat each other. Sailorly shouts a warning to look out behind him, and Chen Jileo turns and dodges the attack. His status screen notifies him that attacking deducts 300 HP points, leaving him with 700 HP remaining. He notices a wound on his chest. Bobin suggests admitting defeat, asserting it's impossible for him to win. Chen Jilao refuses, stating he will never admit defeat. His status screen provides the option to use the healing function, and he decides to use it. He reaches healing level 1, restoring 100 HP, and the bleeding stops. Bobin's team members laugh, commenting on how amusing it is that a priest challenged a shadow swordsman. They find it too funny. Bohan tells him to leave Sailorly behind, asserting that someone who has awakened as a priest is not worthy of being his opponent. Chen Jilao questions if Bohan is afraid of being defeated by a priest and getting humiliated in front of Sailorly. Bohan shouts in frustration, prompting Chen Jilao to tell him to stop messing around and start fighting. Bohan declares that he'll show Chen Jilao the real strength of a shadow swordsman. Chen Jilao contemplates whether this man can split into three, and it seems like shadow assassins rely on clones for battle. When he attacked him before, the clone attacked him first, then, the real Bohan attacked him from behind. That means the clone and main body must be able to swap positions. He thinks it's a troublesome profession to deal with. Bobin expresses his disdain for Trash Awakened as a healer. He says that since he wants to know Chen Jilao's true power before he dies, he will let him witness his Shadow Assassin's invincible attack. He says, then let him see it, and goes to attack him. Bobin commands his Shadow to play with him. His Shadow moves to attack him, and they both engage in a fight. Chen Jilao blocks his attack and thinks he is so strong. He just barely blocks one clone's attack, and there are still two more. Bobin appears behind him and says he was lucky to avoid it last time, but he won't be so lucky now and moves to attack him. Everyone is shocked to see Chen Jilao dodge his attack. Bobin thinks, how is it possible he dodged his sure hit attack and asks what is going on. He thinks that was close, he almost died just now. The status window notifies him that, due to his increase in agility, he has obtained a new skill, Burst Slash Level 2, and a hidden skill when met with a killing strike. A new skill is obtained based on his agility attribute and Burst Slash, and this new skill allows him to dodge every physical attack for 2 seconds, and the subsequent attack will inflict 150% of the original damage, with a cooldown time of 5 minutes. He thinks that if he had not obtained this ability in time, his head would have been chopped off. He now realizes that he only needs to defeat the other clones. Bobin retreats his clone and says, this is interesting that he managed to avoid it again. But he only injured his clone, and the real game begins now. He orders them to attack again. He asserts that showing mercy to the enemy is being cruel to himself and underestimates him. 
he declares he is not playing anymore, opens his eyes wide, and looks closely. All the clones merge their swords and execute a barren strike. They proceed to attack him. He attempts to save himself, but a sword hits his arm, causing it to start bleeding. The status screen notifies that his HP has been reduced to 30%. Please heal immediately. He thinks that without a weapon, he can only dodge and can't even fight back. He sees Boban coming to attack him directly, and he quickly moves back. Boban says the Grim Reaper is here for his life and declares he will find a good place for his grave. An explosion occurs, stunning everyone. Chen Jileo tries to attack him, but Grandfather Albert comes in between, stops him, and declares that's enough. He tells Chen Jileo he should stop. Sailily asks if he is okay. He says he is fine. Grandfather Albert suggests they go, as a thunderstorm is coming. Boban sees them leaving and remarks that this is so funny. He asks Grandfather Albert if he thinks his arrival means he can easily take them away now. He questions whether, had he not intercepted Chen Jilao's attack just now, he would not be dead by now. Boban believes he is lying and dismisses it as nonsense, stating that an awakened priest cannot possibly kill him. He adds that if Grandfather Albert hadn't been nosy, he would have killed him long ago. The status screen notifies him that the mission is accomplished and provides its details. He wonders what the system determined for him to be defeated. Grandfather Alba reiterates that a thunderstorm is coming, and they should leave. The green-haired man tells Boban, let's go, they will be screwed if the thunderstorm comes. Boban urges Chen Jilao to come back, insisting that the battle is not over and he should continue fighting him. Chen Jilao looks at him, and she asks why he is staring blankly. She reminds him that the thunderstorm will arrive soon. He responds, saying he is coming. After a while, Sailily bandages him and says, don't move around, it'll be over soon endure it for a little longer. She mentions that she can't apply the medicine like this. He apologizes, and she asks what he is apologizing for. She adds that, anyway, she did not think he was that strong. He expresses regret, stating that he has inconvenienced her and her grandpa once again, and he is genuinely sorry. He reflects on the fact that he did not level up after receiving the experience, and his wounds need to be treated. He realizes he needs to research the upgrade mechanism more. He asks if both she and grandpa know Boban. She explains that she and Boban grew up together and, in a sense, were like blood-related siblings before. She states that she has dealt with all of the wounds. He expresses his gratitude, and she responds by saying she should be the one thanking him. She leaves there, saying she still needs to go help Grandpa Albert and he should rest first. He agrees, saying, okay, go ahead. He sits alone on his bed, and it is raining heavily outside. He reflects that on that day, it rained really hard, and he wonders how his mother is doing. He thinks she is probably feeling anxious because she can't find him, though he should be able to return fairly quickly. After defeating Boban and accomplishing the mission, he received the map of Latinea. He checks the status screen and believes that he just needs to find the holy temple by following the map. After defeating the boss inside, he can finally set off once the rain stops. The status window notifies him that he has received a hidden key, and he should confirm it. He wonders what a hidden key is for. He considers that during a battle, mysterious treasure chests of various colors will randomly drop, white, green, purple, red, orange, and black, and by using a key to unlock them, they will randomly drop a gem or a piece of equipment that he can't buy from the market. So, that's what it was treasure chests will randomly drop during battles. He thinks he will be able to leave very soon. After a while, Grandfather Albert enters the home. He says that he is back. He apologized for not checking on him earlier, explaining that it was raining really hard, so it took time to finish protecting the seedlings. Chen Jilao says it's fine and asks if there is something he needs from him. Grandfather Albert inquires about his injuries, and Chen Jilao replies that they were just abrasions and will heal in a few days. Grandfather Albert expresses relief, mentioning that he didn't expect Chen Jilao to win the battle against Boban, considering Boban is a very strong swordsman in the village. Chen Jilao explains that if Boban hadn't underestimated him, he wouldn't have had a chance of winning. Grandfather Albert acknowledges Boban's strength but emphasizes that during a battle, one can't rely solely on power and must consider factors like willpower. He adds that it was not a coincidence that he won. Chen Jilao asks about Boban and Sailily growing up together and wonders how Boban became the way he is. He responds that it's a long story. He recounts that 10 years ago, it was raining heavily, much like today. He and Sailily had just arrived in Latinea, passing by a house. Just as they were about to ask if they could stay for the night, they discovered a strange demonic monster attacking the family. Unfortunately, they were too late. The monster had already killed the host and hostess of the house. Thankfully, their child survived. 
the story shifts to a flashback where the monster attacks Boban, and Grandfather Albert arrives in time to strike the monster. Boban manages to escape. He explains that the child was Boban, and afterward, he took Boban with him when he buried the child's parents and brought him into his care. The story comes to the present, and Chen Zhilao says, so that's what happened. He asks why Boban acts like that towards him, too. Grandfather Albert explains that Boban thinks his reason to live is to find the monster that killed his parents. However, he has always been trying to persuade him to give up that goal and live happily. He points out that there are strong, powerful monsters within Latinia that Boban can't even imagine. Even if Boban uses all of his power, he might not be able to kill the monster that murdered his parents, much less Boban himself. Chen Zhilao realizes that he left afterward and reflects on the terrifying existence of that monster. Even though he has the map, he has to travel through the desert to find the temple. Grandfather Albert concludes that they have talked for a long time and he should rest. Chen Zhilao mentions that he doesn't know how many more powerful monsters there are in Latinia, considering he was killed so easily by the previous one. He contemplates that with his current strength, he might be killed by a monster before even finding the temple. He reflects on the last battle with the monster, realizing that despite possibly gaining an attribute bonus, he was effortlessly killed. He acknowledges that this won't do, and he has to improve. He tells Grandpa Albert to please wait and expresses his desire to learn how to fight. He wants to become strong, find the temple, and leave this place. He tells him to have a good rest and moves to leave. Chen Jilao insists that he is serious and has an idea of how to leave. He wonders to himself if he was too impulsive in saying that just now, considering Boban and Grandpa Albert parted because of this. He tells him that tomorrow when the thunderstorm is over, he will come to the hill, and if he can pass his test, he will agree to teach him. Chen Jilao assures him not to worry, as he will definitely pass. He thinks he does not know why, but after meeting him, his hopes of leaving have been reignited. He reflects that in the battle before, Chen Jilao used some terrifying combat skills, and even the Thunder Shield, his strongest defense skill, began to break. Perhaps this young man can indeed lead everyone out of there. Meanwhile, the status window notifies the mission reminder. He checks the details and sees daily missions, 19 kilometers of running with weights, 3,000 push-ups with weights, and 2,000 sit-ups. He acknowledges that it's a hellish workout, but these attribute points are important to him, and he can't give up. He accepts the mission. The scene shifts to when Chen Jilao does exercise, and he thinks the system is much too caring to even provide him with the weights he needs. It lists 10 kilometers of running with weight, 1,316 over 1,300 push-ups with weight, and 984 2,000 sit-ups. He reflects that it's been a long time since he has felt the pressure of working towards a goal, so this challenge makes him happier than solving difficult problems. The status screen notifies that the mission is complete and rewards him with four attribute points. He thinks about which attributes he should add these four points to. Upon checking the status screen, he considers his healing skills and defense. He decides to add two points to intelligence and two points to stamina. Salili comes there and calls him. He asks why she is here. She says she wants to bring him breakfast in the morning and finds that he is not there. So she asks Grandpa Albert, and he says he will probably be there. She asks why he is not wearing clothes and if he is training. She gives him a bag and says he is probably hungry by now, this is his breakfast. He says Grandpa Albert said he'd teach him how to fight, so he came here to get used to training. She asks if Grandpa agrees to teach him how to fight, and he confirms. She says that's great, she really wants to see what kind of abilities he will awaken. He asks if he is not a priest and if he can awaken other abilities. She says, of course, the priest is just the profession that God gave him but his own elemental attributes are acquired according to his personal abilities. She explains that, just like how she is a fire attribute user, Grandpa Albert is a thunder attribute user, and Boban is a shadow attribute user. Everyone is different, the profession is just a direction of development, while the attribute decides his fighting skills. He says, so it's like that, and now he really wants to see which attribute he will awaken. Salili asserts that this world is divided into five areas. He is currently situated at Latinea Mainland's Human Gathering Area, where the vast resources and trade stand as the main markers and symbols of this land. People from all over the world gather here. On the west side lies the volcanic land Megara, the hometown of dragon riders. To the north is the winter land Quesancito, inhabited by giants and other berserk monsters, along with rich crystal resources. To the east is the Vergama Forest, where magical elves and other types of mystical monsters dwell. 
To the south is Chubatil Land, the residence of dwarfs, renowned for their crafting and blacksmithing skills. This place is also known as the end of the world. She states, according to rumors, that this place is connected to the god world's endless sea. If one passes through it, they will reach the god's residence area and obtain endless power. She states that, at first, she thought the endless sea and god's palace were just rumors. Then, he arrived at this place, and she realized all those rumors might have been true. He acknowledges that they need to find that palace to leave the desert, emphasizing that it's not just a rumor, they can definitely leave this place. She agrees. Grandpa Alba arrives and expresses surprise that they are here so early. He asks Sayoli if she has confessed to him already so quickly. She questions what he is saying. He then asks Chen Jilao if he is ready to take his test, and he responds affirmatively, saying that he is ready. After a while, Grandpa Albert explains that at the beginning, God created many different races with different attributes and professions. However, the one thing in common between them is the elements, which act as the base of this world. In this world, there are things outside of what one can see and touch, such as water, fire, thunder, earth, wood, and others that can't be touched, like light and shadow. He elaborates that to grasp the power of the elements, one must sense and awaken it. Grandpa Albert starts using his power and emphasizes that he must feel its presence inside him, experiencing it through his body. He creates a magical circle on the ground and explains that this magic circle will teleport him to a monster's dungeon somewhere in the Latinea Desert. He came upon that area while he was out hunting. He displays his sword, Ozil, stating that it has been with him for many years. He announces that three days from now, he will open the transport gate again, and if he can use this sword to kill the Beast King and bring back its head, he will pass the test. He emphasizes that only when he awakens the elemental power can he fully unleash this sword's potential. Only then will he be able to kill the Beast King. He cautions that once he is there, he might not have a chance to back out. Therefore, now is the time to decide if he wants to give up. Taking the sword, he declares that he is not giving up and affirms that he will bring back the Beast King's head with him. He moves toward the magical circle. He stands in the magical circle and the status window notifies him that the activated dungeon's mission is to kill the Beast King and bring back its head. It requests him to accept, and he confirms. The status window also notifies him about the mission duration. After he leaves, Grandpa Albert mentions that the monsters in there have strong defenses. Only those who grasp the elemental power can kill the Beast King, and the quickest way to awaken his element is to push his limits under desperate situations. After a while, Chen Jiliao arrives at a dungeon and inquires if this is the location of the dungeon. He observes that the sand is black in color, and the sky is gloomy without any light. He detects a disgusting, weird smell and notes that aside from his mission to find the monsters, the environment is challenging. He checks the status screen and notes that, with his current level, defeating the boss might be difficult. He acknowledges the need to kill some small mobs and grind to level up first. Determined, he thinks, all right, let's do it. Suddenly, something attacks him from behind, but he moves aside, realizing he has been spotted already. He sees a monster in front of him, and the status window notifies him about its details. Dotham, level 20, Latanya's most mysterious monster. He reflects that even though he has not awakened his elemental power yet, he can still use this sword, and its strength depends on how he uses it. He takes the sword and declares, let him see how strong he is and states that with every battle, his experience increases, and now, he is no longer a weak newbie. He goes on to attack the monster, realizing that no matter what kind of monster he faces, he is no longer afraid or hesitant. Instead, he feels the endless battle spirit pushing him forward. As he attacks the monster, he thinks that killing monsters to obtain experience and level up allows him to continue becoming stronger. He repeatedly attacks the monster, reveling in the feeling of constantly getting stronger after each kill and level up. When he stabs the monster, the status window notifies him that he has obtained 35,000 exp, leveled up to 17, and gained 5 attribute points. He reflects that this continuous process keeps him motivated and focused. Bobin practices with a sword on a rock, expressing dissatisfaction and stating that it's still not enough. He quickly attacks the rock, contemplating the impossibility of losing to someone like Chen Jiliao, a healer who hasn't even grasped elemental power. He reflects on how Chen Jilao unleashed a scary attack power that made him shiver in fear, acknowledging that he had never seen Wu Bu Lei use such a skill before. Despite barely blocking the attack, Bobin wonders about Chen Jilao's identity, exclaiming who the heck is he. The scene shifts to another side where Chen Jilao attacks monsters, receiving notifications on his status screen that he has slain Dotan. 
leveling up in the process. Another notification congratulates him for reaching level 25, granting him 45 undistributed attribute points and access to a medical store. Yet another notification asks if he wishes to use 15 levels to unlock the medical store. He questions the idea of spending so much effort to reach this level only to need 15 levels to unlock a medical store, finding it somewhat frustrating. He contemplates the situation, thinking that if this is how it's going to be, as his level increases, the level up difficulty will also increase. Later on, if he wants to unlock or buy items, the payment fee might become more expensive, especially if he wants to unlock all stores until the highest mercenary store, requiring a total of 300 levels. He considers that, in such a case, it would be wise to save his levels to unlock the higher stores first. However, the current situation doesn't allow him to do so. As he still has to kill the Beast King, he decides to obtain some medical items to increase his chances of survival. He employs his recovery potion to heal himself and acknowledges that it works as expected. Just as he thought, the store's potions heal according to level, implying that the more HP he has, the more it recovers. This leads him to contemplate the future scenario where, if his HP is 10,000, he can recover 8,000 HP in 10 seconds. He envisions the potential invincibility of these HP recovery potions. Notifications appear on his status screen, indicating that he has unlocked his medical store by using 15 levels and has purchased the Berserk Warrior's Morning. The screen also shows that his current level is level 2. Meanwhile, he considers having two lives now, feeling more emboldened. Despite using a lot of energy to kill those monsters, he is left with only two levels. He contemplates what he can buy from the daily essentials and notices an item with the effect of reducing hunger. Deciding to purchase it, he consumes the food, finding it hard and reminiscing that Salili's bun is much better. Aware that 12 hours have passed, he calculates that he still has around 60 hours to complete the mission. Recalling Grandfather Wu Bu Lei's advice about the beast men being on the northwest side, he decides to follow the map towards the mark to find the beasts. After a while, his status screen again notifies him that he has 45 undistributed attribute points, so he should allocate them as soon as possible. He realizes that he forgot to distribute his attribute points and contemplates how he should allocate them. Considering his previous thoughts, he acknowledges that while his strength and agility might have increased significantly, his MP, and defense are too low. He understands that having MP-related skills could be restricted by his low MP bar, and he has recently noticed that when his HP is low, his attacks tend to miss. Recognizing the importance of balancing his attributes, he compares it to exams where he needs to perform well in every subject to achieve a high score, but in this scenario, he only has one try. Meanwhile, he reflects on the fact that here, he can obtain endless attributes and gain levels repeatedly. He realizes that he just needs to choose different strategies at different times to achieve the perfect battle outcome he desires. Deciding on his attribute allocation, he determines to add 15 points to physique, 15 to strength, and the remaining 15 to defense, agility, and magic, with 5 attribute points each. He acknowledges that if needed, he can use Berserk Warrior Morning to recover his health effectively. Satisfied with his plan, he concludes that now he just needs to find the Beast Cave and complete the mission. On the other side, Salili expresses concern, stating that the Beast Cave is very dangerous, and that he shouldn't have let Chen Jilao go by himself. She inquires with Grandfather Wu Bu Lei, asking if he will truly be fine. He reassures her, mentioning that he left a mark on the sword, and if Chen Jilao faces a life-threatening situation. He will intervene to bring him out safely. However, she questions why he wants Chen Jilao to enter the Beast Cave, expressing that she hasn't heard of him going there before. He casually mentions that he accidentally stumbled upon it during a hunting expedition. As he walks away, he adds a reminder for her to enter the town for a while, and to remember to cook the rice. Puzzled, she feels that something is amiss. Grandfather acknowledges that no matter what he tells Chen Jilao, he won't be able to dissuade him from wanting to leave this place. He decides to let Chen Jilao realize the harsh reality of this world by sending him to the Beast Cave. Although he knows it's improbable for Chen Jilao to pass the test, he still wants to believe that he can bring back the Beast's head. Grandfather reflects on this belief, wondering why he clings to the hope that Chen Jilao might succeed. If Chen Jilao manages to accomplish the feat, it would establish him as the one capable of leading them out of this place. The scene shifts to Chen Jilao who walks towards the Beast Cave, estimating that he has been walking for around three hours already. 
he believes the beast cave should be further ahead. Suddenly, he hears the desperate cries of a woman running towards him, carrying a baby. She pleads for help and implores him to save them. Surprised, he turns around to see her seeking refuge behind him, fear evident in her eyes. He wonders why there is a woman with a child in this place and how they ended up here. As she reaches him and continues to hide behind him, she begs him to please save them. He reassures her, urging her not to be scared, and asks her to tell him what happened. In a trembling voice, she explains that there is a monster desperately pleading for his assistance. She states that demonic beasts in the Latinea desert possess extremely high attack power and health. They are slow-moving tank-type monsters. The status window indicates that Barbaric Beastman Ratchetler, level 40, is a low-rank intelligence-type beast tamer of the Latinea desert. It can summon and control barbaric giants, commanding them to attack its enemies. He inquires, so, this is a beastman. He moves her and her child back, says, back off, and thinks its level is much higher than those of the monsters he has encountered before. And it's an intelligence type, just like the plunderers he has run into previously. This is good news, and the appearance of a beastman must mean that its nest is nearby. The woman and her child are quite strange, too. He wonders if it could be that they have been transported here just like him and Grandpa Albert. He reassures, saying not to worry, he will keep the two of them safe. Ratchetler calls them foolish, ignorant, and cowardly bugs. He reflects on how the guy who killed him before also called him that and wonders why it's always the damn bugs. Ratchetler questions why he does not obediently stretch out his neck and savor the pleasure of being chewed to a pulp. The big monster instructs him to let him enjoy the thrill of shredding these bugs into pieces. The monster moves to attack him, but he counterattacks and kills it. She is shocked to see this. He thinks he has become quite strong after leveling up. Ratchetler points to the other monster and asks why he is standing there looking like an idiot, and instructs him to kill it already. He proceeds to kill that monster as well. Ratchetler expresses frustration, calling him a useless piece of trash and questioning if he really thinks he can't survive without the two of them. He confidently declares that he will take care of this bug by himself. Chen Zhiliao points his sword at him and instructs him to put his club down and not move, or else his head will fly. He then instructs him to answer why they were trying to kill them. Ratchetler responds by warning him that he is a servant of God and that if he kills him, his God will curse him for the rest of his life. Chen Zhiliao hits him near the eye with a sword and declares that next time, it will be the blade, asking where the beastman's nest is. Ratchetler points towards the mountains and says it's over there. Chen Zhiliao remarks that it doesn't seem like he's lying, and it pretty much aligns with what the system showed him. He concludes that the Black Rock Mountain is where the nest is located. Ratchetler quickly moves to the girl and her child, catches them, and states that he is trying really hard to protect these two bugs. He declares that he shall force him to watch as he slowly twists their necks and sucks their blood. He starts using magic and claims that this is his true strength. Chen Zhiliao moves from one side, and Bross moves from the other, kicking Ratchetler in the face and knocking him out. Bross comments, saying he's not bad. After a while, Chen Zhiliao asks who he is and how they guys got there. Bross explains that he and his companions were somehow transported here three days ago. They were attacked by the beastmen, and one of his companions was captured by them during the chaos, and they were following the footprints and ended up running into him. He introduces himself, saying his name is Bross, a warrior, and it's nice to meet him. He points to Philoga, an assassin, and Rachel, a healer. Chen Jilao introduces himself as Jilao. Bross inquires if he happens to know why they were transported here. Chen Zhiliao apologizes, stating he has no idea, but suggests that Ratchetler might know something. Ratchetler complains about a sneak attack and condemns the treacherous nature of these bugs. He declares that one day, he will kill all of them. He asks what he is doing and replies that these bugs are just food. He expresses anger at the disrespect towards God and claims that his God will kill them all. Chen Zhiliao calls his name, and Ratchetler wonders how he knows his name. Chen Jilao says he has a few questions for him, advising him to be a good boy and answer honestly if he wants to live. Ratchetler insists that he is speaking the truth and pleads for belief. He emphasizes that he has already shared everything he knows and points out that, being of a lower rank in the tribe, he only has limited knowledge, and according to him, God has captured them all to be their food. He explains that he is merely following God's orders to guard this place and genuinely does not know anything else. As he speaks, a thunderstorm arrives. After a while, in Delk Town, Hicks questions Grandpa Alber, asking if he has gone crazy. He points out that it's been so many years, yet he still believes in those rumors. Even if he finds the palace, he questions the point, 
as they can't defeat the monsters guarding the palace. He expresses concern that he is betting his hopes on a kid who hasn't even grasped elemental power yet. Moreover, he thinks he should know the consequences of angering the god. He warns that the whole village will be in danger and suggests heeds his warning, kills the kid and the beast then, reflects on his thoughts, and prays for mercy and forgiveness. Grandpa Albert dismisses this idea, calling it a joke. He argues that the god Hicks spoke of can torture them however he likes, treating them like worms and sacrificing the innocents in exchange for his so-called peace. He criticizes the fact that the villagers still treat them like heroes. He comments that, in fact, they are just a bunch of weaklings living by sacrificing others. Hicks questions what he just said and gathers his magic, declaring that he shall execute him right now in the name of God. Grandpa Albert protects himself with a thunder shield, rendering Hicks' magic ineffective. He tells him to get lost, which infuriates Hicks. Grandpa Albert apologizes, stating that he cannot feel at ease living on the sacrifices of others in exchange for peace. He vows to use his own strength to find a way to leave this place and protect the innocents, even if it means fighting his so-called god. Hicks warns him not to dare look down on him. A hidden-faced man intervenes, telling them both that it's enough. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao stands on the mountaintop and reflects on the idea of treating people like worms and throwing them into Latinea as monster food. As a player with no feelings toward this place, he used to consider it just a game setting. However, after meeting Salili, Grandpa Albert, and the others, he realizes that he can no longer treat this as a game and everyone here is a living human, not mere NPCs. He acknowledges that he can't leave them to their fate. He resolves to find Kebli's god's palace and bring everyone out of this place. He reflects on Kebli, remembering reading about Egypt's legends at the library previously, and he knows that Kebli is one of Egypt's strongest gods and Rastian's incarnation. However, he wonders why such a powerful god would be sealed in a place like this. From what Ratchidler said, Kebli is guarding this place on god's orders. He considers the possibility that the Kebli god's palace might be near the beast den, however, he dismisses this idea realizing that this place and the Kebli God's palace are in different directions. He ponders on what they might be guarding here or if there is some other god sealed in this location. Just then, Bross announces that they are all set and suggests heading to the beast's den. After a while, Chen Jileao moves and considers that they don't know what type of monster they will encounter on the way to the beast's den. But this place should be much safer. Philoga ties Ratchidler with ropes. Bross mentions that even though Rachel is a healer, she can create a magic barrier and enhance elemental powers damage. She will stay behind to protect them. Rachel assures them not to worry, she will keep them safe until they come back. Bross then suggests heading to the beast's den. Ratchidler warns them that if they go to the beast's den, they will all get eaten by those high rank beasts. He tells them not to say he did not warn them. Chen Jilao expresses that he thinks he is scared that he will be eaten along with them. Ratchidler denies being a cowardly beastman. Ross grabs his rope and instructs him to stop talking and start walking. He remarks that they are really out of their minds and are basically committing suicide. He suggests negotiating and offers to help them guard the exit while he goes in, promising not to run away. He asks if that is okay. He accuses them of being heartless and insists on being let go, expressing his unwillingness to go with them. After a while, in the beast den, some monsters kill and eat humans, while others carry more humans in a cage. They put the cage down and inform Beast King Sunil that these are all the food they found today, asking for his orders. Suddenly, Mage Ngam uses his magic to freeze the monsters, freeing the humans. He reassures them not to be scared, introducing himself as the great Mage Ngam and promising to bring everyone out of this place. He mentions that there are other heroes with him who will kill these monsters and rescue everyone. He declares the act of killing so many innocent people for greed is unforgivable, and vows to make them pay. He uses magic and throws an ice sword blizzard toward the monster king, but he uses a protection shield, and it doesn't hit him. Mage and Gom is shocked to see this. Beast King Sunil uses magic, causing Mage and Gom to slowly fly up. Confused and frightened, Mage and Gom asks what is happening and screams. The Beast King applies magic to him, and his body explodes. Everyone becomes scared and trembles in fear. Ross attacks the monsters, and Philoga captures a monster with magic while Chen Jilao takes his sword and attacks the monster. Ratchidler is shocked to see this and thinks that these people are stronger. He observes that Chen Jilao seems much stronger than before. Ratchidler questions who he is and where he comes from. After killing all the monsters there, Chen Jilao thinks that the closer they get to the beast den, the more monsters they encounter, and their attack power and level are also much higher. 
He checks the status window and reflects that even though he is using his level for unlocking things, the amount of experience required to level up again is the same as before. Even though these monsters give a decent amount of experience, the speed at which he is leveling up is getting slower, and he has to find a way to grind faster. Ross asks if he is still not used to the intensity of these battles. He responds that even though these demon beasts move slowly, killing them still requires some strength. However, he is the first person he has met who has killed a demon beast so easily without grasping elemental power, and it seems like he is his fated one. He expresses that he likes him, and if they leave this place, he hopes he will join their guild. He mentions that there are many pretty girls with nice figures, and he can introduce him to them, especially since he likes older girls. Chen Jilao questions what he means by liking older girls. Filoga asks if he didn't say his guild only has him. Dismissing Filoga's comment, Ross tells them to continue moving. Filoga points ahead, saying that the place ahead should be the entrance to the beast's den. Chen Jiliao asks Ratchetler if that is the entrance in front. However, Ratchetler is not there. Ross suggests that he must have escaped when they were fighting. Meanwhile, Ratchetler quickly runs into the den, stating that he has to inform the Beast King about these humans invading. He considers that maybe the Beast King will reward him handsomely. Ross comments that this must be the place, given the Beast Man's stinky smell, so at least that bastard, Ratchetler, did not lie to them. He suggests, let's enter, and they move to enter the cave. Ross asks why he feels that this place is weird. They have been walking for so long, yet there is not even a trace of a single Beastman. Chen Jilao looks in front and sees three ways. He suggests that it seems like they have to split up here. He notices Chen Jilao's hand and says that it is the mark of the flame gate. Since they are splitting up, if any one of them encounters danger or discovers any information, it will allow them to teleport to each other's side and provide support. He proposes that he will go through the left cave, Filoga will go through the right, and Chen Jilao will take the middle one. They agree, and he instructs them to remember that if any of them find themselves in danger, they should recite the mantra he taught them. After a while, Chen Jiliao runs into the cave and contemplates that the only way now is to level up quickly. However, he wonders what if this place does not even have a single beastman. He witnesses monsters killing and eating a girl. The status window notifies him about the corpse-eating ghoul, a level 47 creature described as the soul that is abandoned by the god in hell and the ghoul possesses incredible biting force, is scared of sunlight, lives in groups, and won't appear alone. The monster spots him, and he thinks that he got what he wanted. They all move to attack. Ratchetler arrives and informs Lord Sunil that three worms have invaded their cave. They have separated and entered different traps, so they must have already been torn apart by those evil corpse-eating ghouls. Chen Jilao considers that the attack power of these corpse-eating ghouls isn't high, but their numbers are significant and the experience points they provide aren't substantial. As he engages with a corpse-eating ghoul, he receives a notification on his status screen indicating that he has killed a corpse-eating ghoul, earning 20,000 XP. He reflects that eliminating them one by one is not an effective strategy. Shortly after, he receives another notification stating that he has killed another corpse-eating ghoul and gained 60,000 XP. Chen Jilao realizes that every time he levels up, the XP bar increases by 40. With limited time remaining, he understands the urgency of swiftly passing through this area. Meanwhile, he stabs another corpse-eating ghoul and gains 200,000 XP. His status screen notifies him that 999 corpse-eating ghouls have been killed, congratulating him on reaching level 14. Additionally, he acquires the professional skills of Holy Light and Annihilation Slash, along with another professional skill, Blessing. Faced with a choice, he can select two out of the three skills. Contemplating the skill introductions and details, he finds it challenging to decide. He believes that Blessing and Holy Light make a good combination, while Annihilation Slash and Blessing form a double effect combo of damage and recovery. He remarks that all these skills are buffs for close combat, and he can utilize Blessing to enhance his speed, getting close to enemies to use Holy Light or Annihilation Slash. However, he dismisses Holy Light as a good choice due to its short attack range unless he gets close enough to the enemy, making it ineffective for dealing damage and limiting it to self-healing. After a while, he decides to choose Blessing and Annihilation Slash. He wonders if Bross and Philoga are alright or if they encountered the same trouble as him. However, the Mark of the Flame Gate has no notification, indicating they should be safe for now. On the other side, Bross observes more corpse-eating ghouls approaching him. He decides to continue moving forward and runs towards them to engage in battle. Ross utilizes Hellflame Stomp to burn the ghouls while they growl. 
standing his ground. He hears some music and wonders if it is indeed music. A girl walks towards him, singing the melody. He inquires if she is the one sending all these corpse-eating ghouls at him and declares his intention to turn her into dust and ashes. She smiles, breaks the floor, and summons shadow hands that capture him. Frustrated, he exclaims damn it, he can't muster any strength at all. He attributes it to the music and attempts to escape as she approaches. She remarks that it's been a long time since she enjoyed such a delicious worm, licking his face, and then proceeds to stab him with her nail. He realizes he must escape, contemplating whether he is going to die in her hands. Just then, Chen Zhilao arrives and swiftly cuts her hands. She screams, and her shadow hand spell also shatters. Chen Zhilao asks Bross if his timing is perfect. She questions if he escaped from Dikar while he throws a monster's head towards her, asking if he is the one she is talking about. She claims he was much stronger than the corpse-eating ghouls, but it was still an easy kill. She shouts and creates her musical magic circle. Chen Zhilao walks toward her, but Bross warns him not to go because she employs death spirit enchantress, causing numbness. Bross states that now both of them will die. However, Chen Zhilao quickly activates his blessing skills and cuts her into pieces. He mentions that her voice is torturing his ears, while Bross acknowledges his strength and alerts him through the notification from the mark of the flame gate that Philoga is in danger. Philoga attempts to stop the attack, thinking damn, the gap between this monster and him is simply too big. All he can do now is hold up against its attacks, and it's impossible for him to kill it. An explosion occurs, breaking the wall and throwing him away, leaving him badly injured. He sees the Hellfire Python and wonders if he's really going to die. Chen Zhilao arrives, attacking the Hellfire Python and killing it. He apologizes to Philoga, stating they are a little late. Philoga thinks this guy is shockingly strong while Bross mentions that both paths Chen Zhiliao and he took were traps. It seems like this is the true path leading to the Beastman Nest. Bross extends a hand to help Philoga stand up and asks if he is alright. Philoga replies that he's fine and won't die. Philoga remarks, but this Hellfire Python is simply too strong, and he has never seen a creature like this before. It's like those monsters mentioned in the legends. If they meet the Beast King, he'll probably kill them in seconds, right? Chen Zhilao responds, stating that what will kill him is not the Beast King but his fear. He emphasizes that having fear on the battlefield will only bring him closer to death. He points out that this is just one Beast King, and in the future, after they leave Lacnea, who knows what sorts of strong creatures they'll have to fight for their companions and obtain freedom. Even if he has only one breath left, Chen Zhilao asserts that he will definitely fight until the end. After a while, the Hellfire Python wakes up again. Philoga suggests fighting together, and they run towards the snake. Ross tells Chen Zhilao to let him go first and directs his attention to the Hellfire Python, calling it a giant earthworm and attempting to attack it. The Hellfire Python responds by throwing fire at him. Philoga realizes he has to prepare to unleash his elemental power and cannot become a burden again. This time, he wants to give it his all and uses Kaysidagarbha's palm magic to grab the python's neck. They both notice Chen Zhilao coming from behind the Hellfire Python, jumping on its head and stabbing it. His status screen notifies him that the Hellfire Python's flame armor is 20% damaged. He continues to stab it, and the armor is damaged 30%, then 50%, 80%, and finally 100%, completely destroying it. They quickly descend as the Hellfire Python dies. Ross excitedly declares that it's dead. Chen Zhilao receives a notification on his status screen, indicating that he defeated the Hellfire Python, gaining 200,000 exp and leveling up. He receives another notification that, for annihilating a hidden boss, he has obtained secret equipment, Hellfire Gloves. He checks its specifications and thinks that acquiring equipment with such attributes is akin to leveling up by several levels. Another notification prompts him to equip the Hellfire Gloves, and he conceals their appearance. Meanwhile, Bross observes that they have only split up for a few hours, yet this guy seems to have undergone a tremendous transformation. He wonders what on earth has happened and questions who this guy really is. Meanwhile, Ratchetler arrives, and they all notice him, preparing to attack. However, he surprises them by sitting on his knees in front of them. Bross questions why Ratchetler has delivered himself into their hands. Ratchetler explains that he got lost just now, and the Beast King must have activated the traps. Chen Zhiliao reflects on the traps, realizing why they have encountered such monsters. Ratchetler reiterates that they are lucky to still be alive. Bross demands that Ratchetler spit it out, if he doesn't lead them to the Beast King, they will kill him right now. Ratchetler assures them he'll tell them and knows the way, the entrance is right over there. Bross warns him that if he plans to pull any tricks, he'll castrate him. 
Ratchetler utters some magic spell at the entrance, and the gate opens. Grandpa Albert enters his room and opens his cupboard, where he observes his armor. Bobin arrives and tells Grandpa Albert that, despite hesitating for a long time, he still ended up opening it. Bobin mentions that in the past, Grandpa Albert never allowed him and Sailly to come close to this room, and they have always been curious about what's inside. Grandpa Albert reveals that it's his battle armor. However, Bobin suggests that perhaps what has been sealed away in this room is Grandpa Albert's desire to leave this place. Grandpa Albert, surprised that Bobin is already there and that he didn't detect him, listens as he explains that he has heard about Grandpa Albert's intentions. He expresses his desire to form a team to leave Lacnea. He believes that, along the way, they might encounter the monster that killed his parents. All the years of his hard training have been leading up to this moment. He declares that he wants to join Grandpa Albert, and this time, he won't choose to stop him, right? On the other side, Ross warns Ratchetler not to try any tricks this time. He threatens to kill him if he dares attempt anything, grabbing his neck. Ratchetler insists he won't and points in a direction, indicating that up ahead is the Grand Hall of the Beastman Nest, and the Beast King is right there. Chen Jiliao inquires if Ratchetler knows where they lock up those people who have been brought here. Ratchetler confidently replies that he does and is very familiar with that place. Chen Jiliao moves forward and instructs Bross that after Philoga enters the Beast Men's Nest's Grand Hall, let Ratchetler take them both to rescue their companions. Meanwhile, Bross questions if Chen Jiliao thinks that Philoga and he will hold the Beast King back. He advises Chen Jiliao not to think too highly of himself just because he saved them and emphasizes that he is not that strong yet. Chen Jiliao denies wanting that. However, he receives a warning notification that the appearance of an unknown boss has been detected up ahead. Given his current strength, his chances of victory and survival are only 10%. Chen Jiliao is surprised, thinking that the chance of survival is only 10%, and he has already tried his best to level up. Even if he doesn't obtain any elemental powers, the success rate shouldn't be so low. Philoga asks what is wrong with Chen Jiliao. Chen Jiliao replies that it's nothing and he doesn't want to implicate innocent people because of his own affairs. After they enter, he instructs them to go and rescue his companions immediately, and he'll deal with the Beast King. Bross firmly states that there's no way he will ever abandon a companion and leave him alone in a dangerous situation. Chen Jiliao responds by pointing out that the monster inside is definitely not as simple as they think, and their chances of victory are only 10%. He argues that even though there are little to no chances of victory, he won't run away by himself and asks Philoga for his opinion. Philoga nods his head in agreement. Chen Jiliao reflects on his past, mentioning that growing up, whether in school or while learning Kendo, he solved all the problems he encountered on his own. Even though he never thought he experienced hardship, he inevitably felt lonely. However, he thinks that now he's no longer on his own. Ratchetler interjects, urging them to look, as the Grand Hall is just in front. He questions if he can stay there to wait for them because the Beast King will kill him. Ratchetler states that it's fine if they want to die, but he doesn't. They all move forward and reach the Grand Hall, but no one is there. Chen Jiliao finds it strange and wonders why there isn't a single person present. He questions Ratchetler about the Beast King, asking if he didn't say the Beast King is right here. Ratchetler replies that he doesn't know what's going on either, as this place is usually heavily guarded, and he's puzzled about why there's no one here today. As they look around, Beast King Finire, level 85, appears and captures Philoga with magic. Ratchetler expresses fear, and they all notice him. Chen Jiliao runs towards Beast King Finire and attempts to attack him, but his defensive shield protects him and throws Chen Jiliao away. Meanwhile, Ross rushes towards Philoga, grabbing him in his arms, and asks if he's alright. Chen Jiliao wondered since when Beast King Finire was sitting there and realized that he had easily defused his attack just now. Philoga twists his wrist and shouts, prompting Bross to advise him not to force himself. Philoga insists he's fine and urges them to go. Bross uses his powers to break the Beast King's defense shield, jumping on it, and Philoga activates his powers to form a giant axe. Chen Jiliao also joins in. Together, they attack the defense shield, managing to break it. However, the Beast King quickly rebuilds it, leaving them all disappointed. The Beast King throws them away from the shield, and one of its followers exclaims Lord Beast King is so cool. Chen Jilao thinks to himself, frustrated. He had assumed that the boss's skill could only be used on one side, but he didn't expect it to cover its whole body. The Beast King's attack strength is terrifying. Chen Jilao asks Philoga and Bross if they are okay. They both reply that they are fine. Chen Jilao reflects on not knowing the full extent of the Beast King's skills and abilities, feeling uncertain about what it can do. 
Meanwhile, the Beast King gets up, laughs, and remarks that the bunch of bugs sure are interesting. He declares that they should let him play with them and disappears. Chen Zhilao wonders where he went and sees a magic spell behind Bross. He warns Bross to be careful, and as Bross turns around, the Beast King reappears and punches his chest. Bross attempts to counter-attack, but the Beast King grabs his wrist. Bross tries to kick him, but when he does, he feels his ribs break, screams, and falls down. The Beast King launches another attack on him, prompting Filoga to shout Bross's name. Chen Jiliao and Filoga rush to pick up Bross. Chen Jiliao instructs Filoga to take care of Bross, who apologizes for being a burden again. Filoga tells him not to move. Chen Jiliao insists that they leave the rest to him, expressing his determination to defeat the Beast King. The Beast King taunts them, calling them a worthless bunch of worms. Chen Jiliao suspects the Beast King is using the same tricks again as he tries to punch him. However, the Beast King blocks his punch with full force. Chen Jilao notes that even though he can't break through the Beast King's skill when it comes to strength and agility, he is not weaker. Observing this, Bross thinks that he blocked the monster's attack, acknowledging that even with 10 more years of training, he might not be able to achieve the same feat, recognizing Chen Jilao's strength. Meanwhile, the Beast King remarks that it's the first time a mere worm has been able to block his attack, finding it interesting. However, he still considers the opponent is nothing more than a worm, and the struggle will only excite him more. The Beast King throws a magical ball through Chen Jilao, declaring, now he dies, a worm. In response, Chen Jilao counterattacks, stating that first, he'll make him pay for everything he did to his friends, and then, he'll chop off his head. Utilizing the blessing skill, he attacks the Beast King, vowing to show him what a worm is capable of and making him regret looking down on humans. Chen Jiliao kicks him and then uses Annihilation Slash for another attack. The Beast King's crown falls off, and he transforms into another body shape of a monster. Chen Jiliao employs Burst Slash for yet another attack. He resolves not to let the Beast King hurt innocent people anymore as he continues to attack him repeatedly. His team members witness this and think he's incredibly strong. The Beast King also activates his elemental power, becoming strong again. Ratchetler observes and says Lord Beast King. He is unleashing his elemental power. Now, they are doomed. Chen Jiliao recognizes that it's the Beast King's elemental power as he looks at him. The Beast King orders his monsters to attack Chen Jiliao, who prepares for defeat upon seeing them. Gathering all his skills and powers, he engages in a long fight, ultimately defeating all the monsters. Despite his victory, he sustains numerous injuries on his body and realizes he can no longer move. Exhausted and having used up all his skills, he questions if this is the end. However, when he sees the Beast King running towards him, he summons the strength to kick him away before falling down in a very bad condition. The Beast King cruelly remarks that a useless bug deserves to be trampled to death, asserting that this is his fate. Chen Jilao contemplates if it is really over this time. He recalls old memories of people questioning why his parents named him after a bug, remarking that the name suits him quite well. He mentions that he's longing for someone he feels unworthy of and laughs at himself, recalling incidents like his ID being bursting sweetheart, log off failures, and more, he gets up. He also remembers his mother urging him to come home. His team members observe him as he heals himself and retrieves his sword with strong powers to attack the Beast King. An old man calls his name and instructs him to wake up. Chen Jilao wonders what's going on, as he was fighting the Beast King just now. He questions him about the place and if he is already dead. He reassures him that he did not die, addressing him as Chen Jilao. He asks how he knows his name and who he is. He responds that he does not know who he is either, for as long as he has been awake, he has been there for thousands of years, maybe even 10,000 years, he lost count. He adds that he hears a voice saying that someday, someone will bring him out of this place, and it seems Chen Jilao is that person. Chen Jilao expresses that he does not understand what he is talking about and urges him to just tell him how to leave this place. He kneels down and suggests that Chen Jilao accept him and become his master. He relays that the voice mentioned only the one he acknowledges will be able to leave this place, so he pleads for him to become his master. Chen Jilao agrees and accepts him, urging him to bring him out of this place. He holds the old man's hand, and some magic happens. After a while, Chen Jilao wakes up in the beast den and reflects that he really came back. He acknowledges that the uncle did not lie to him, and he can feel tremendous energy flowing within his body. 
He wonders if this is because he accepted the old man and became his master. The status window notifies him that he has awakened the element of chaos. He concludes that the old uncle must be his elemental power. Beast King Sunil sees him and thinks that this is impossible, as the worm looks unscathed and seems to have become even stronger. The status window notifies that due to the elemental power's activation, his skills are strengthened, and he has obtained the new elemental skill Obliterate, with its details described. The status window further notifies that the elemental power has unsealed his weapon, currently equipped with the weapon Ozil, and describes its details. The sword changes into a new shape. Chen Jilao thinks this is the true form of Grandpa Albert's sword. He realizes that previously, it did not give him any attribute boost, but since he obtained elemental power and unsealed it, now it's time for him to counterattack. He goes to attack him. Beast King Sunil remarks that just because he awakens his element, he thinks he is a match for him, and he attacks him back. He thinks about how he could lose to a mere worm, finding it impossible. He decides not to hold back anymore and aims to crush him like the bug he is. Chen Jilao uses chaotic burst slash attacks on him, and in return, Beast King Sunil attacks him back and injures him, reducing his HP by 90%. Chen Jilao retaliates and kills him. The status window notifies that he has killed Boss Sunil, obtained 40,000 exp, leveled up, completed the Beast King mission, obtained 50,000 experience, leveled up, and received one block treasure chest. Meanwhile, in Latinea, Grandpa Albert tells Boban that if he really wants to help, then he shouldn't slack off. Boban asks how he is slacking and mentions that he is just rusty since he has not done this for a long time. Salili asks Grandpa Albert if Chen Jilao is okay, considering it's been three days now. Grandpa Albert reassures her, saying that, yeah, he will go find him in a while. Just then, an explosion occurs. Boban asks what that was, and Salili inquires if he is alright and what just happened. Grandpa Albert explains that it was a shockwave released when a high rank monster is killed, and it came from the direction of the beast cave. He thinks it seems Chen Jilao has grasped elemental power and killed the beast king. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, Ratchetler asks if the Lord Beast King was killed. Philoga thinks that if he did not witness this with his own eyes, he really would not have believed someone could be so strong. Bross thinks that during that instant, the combat ability that he displayed was impressive, questioning if he was hiding his true power all this time. Chen Jilao thinks he can't believe he actually killed such a strong enemy, but the person who granted him the elemental power seems even stronger. He has already become his master, so does he reside in his body from now. Philoga asks if he is okay and questions why he is dazing off, adding that he won. Chen Jilao reassures them that he is alright and acknowledges that they both have serious injuries. He instructs them to wait there, stating that he will go rescue his companions now. Ross instructs Ratchetler to bring him to the place where people are locked up. Ratchetler waves toward him. Chen Jilao thinks that even though he won, he has so many questions about who that person is, why they entered that place, and whether it was really a coincidence that they entered the game and came here, or if someone is manipulating all these events. Feeling dizzy and about to fall down, Grandpa Albert comes there and holds him. He looks at him and says he has completed it. After a while, his mom calls him and tells him to wake up. He opens his eyes. She remarks that it's already afternoon and questions how long he wants to sleep. He looks at his mom and wonders if he has come back. She mentions that she cooked all his favorite dishes, so he should get up. He gets up, hugs her, and says he misses her. Boban asks what he is doing. He realizes that it was all a dream. Boban asks why he suddenly hugged him. He questions why he is here. Boban says not to misunderstand. He agrees to help the old man take care of him, and he still wants to duel him after he recovers. He leaves and says to eat and recover quickly. He will go tell Salili and Grandpa Alber. Chen Jilao is sitting alone on the bed, pondering whether that was a dream and how he ended up here. He recalls seeing Grandpa Alber last. He wonders about Bras and Philoga. The status window informs him that an unopened treasure chest and undistributed attribute points are present. He is urged to allocate them. He thinks that after he defeats Boban, he will obtain a key, maybe he can open the chest with that. The stats window notifies him that he has undistributed attribute points, asks if he wants to use them, and informs him that opening the chest will use the silver key if he wishes to use it. He clicks yes and it notifies him that he has successfully used it. Opening the mysterious chest, please wait. The status window notifies him about the details of the items he has collected. The status window notifies him that he has obtained Sunil's legendary ring of protection, and describes its abilities as obtaining a legendary hidden item. He wonders if the legendary item is an egg and if it is edible. Just then, the egg starts to crack. He wonders if it could be a pet. A little kid comes out of the egg. 
He wonders if the legendary item is a kid. The kid calls him Papa and jumps on him. He is shocked. He instructs the system to look it up and tell him just what the little brat is. He instructs it to check and see if there are any special abilities. He wonders why the reward from the chest is a little kid. The system notifies him with apologies, stating that it is not possible to identify living beings with the current admin rights. It suggests upgrading the system and trying again later, adding that the living being in question has been paired up with him, and he should take good care of it. He wonders about being paired up and whether he has to take good care of her, pondering if this means he has to take her with him to look for the temple. The kid jumps on his head. He tells the kid to get down, expressing confusion about not being his daddy, and urges the child to hurry and get off him. The kid continues to disturb him. He holds the child by the leg and reiterates that he is not the daddy, asking if the kid understands. He questions who on earth he is, expressing no interest in bringing a kid along for an adventure in the temple. He concludes that he can only ask Sailili and Grandpa Albert about who can take care of the child. The kid starts crying. He places the child in bed and says, Dear Ancestor, please stop crying and asks did he hurt him. The status window notifies that because he wished to abandon the living being, punishment has been activated, and the punishment will last for 30 minutes, with the countdown beginning now. He asks, what the hell is the punishment? A bright light appears, and he teleports to a dungeon. He mentions that he hasn't been told what the punishment is. He looks around and asks where he has been sent to. He tells the kid to stop crying, explaining that it's not that he wants to abandon him, but as a high school student, he doesn't know how to take care of him at all. Just then, an elite monster appears. The status window notifies that the punishment has begun. Please annihilate all monsters within 30 minutes. If he exceeds the time limit, he will be attacked by twice the number of monsters, and please protect the living being. If the living being dies, he will be obliterated by the system. And the countdown begins now, and no experience will be given for the monsters killed here. He thinks, wait a minute, what's this about being obliterated? He holds the kid, runs, and puts him aside, stating that he can't die, and instructs the child to hold on to his neck. He activates the elemental power and takes Ozil, declaring that they are going to battle. Meanwhile, Grandpa Albert mentions that Sailili went to town to buy food and has not come back yet. He asks how Chen Jilao is doing. Oban responds that he seems fine to him, still as energetic and lively as usual. He inquires about the progress of the team that's going to search for the temple. Grandpa Albert explains that things are worse than he thought. There's practically no one in town willing to join them, and everyone is scared stiff by the lies spread by Hicks and the others, and they all think that what they do will incur the wrath of those so-called gods, disturbing the peace of the town as a result. Boban suggests that if they can't recruit anyone, the few of them can still go ahead to look for the temple and leave this place, questioning why bother with all this trouble. He mentions that the monsters beyond the town are way stronger than either of them can imagine, and if he is not 100% confident, he won't risk taking them all out. He suggests that they'd better go look for Chen Jilao first, and he can tell him about what happened out there. Just then, Sailili arrives and asks what the two of them are talking about. He informs her that she is back, and Boban just said that Chen Jilao is awake, and it seems like Boban is taking pretty good care of him. She suggests they hurry and go check on him, as she still wants to know what kind of elemental power he has awakened. She holds his hand, and they run from there. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, Chen Jilao is killing the elite monsters one by one. The status screen notifies him that he has completed the mission and the countdown has ended. The kid cheers him up by calling him daddy. He thinks if he is really his daddy, he will really be done and by him. After killing the monster, he comes back to his room and says he is finally back. Just then, Sailili arrives and sees him with the kid and asks where this kid is from. She holds him and pampers him, saying he is so cute. She asks Chen Jilao where this child came from, and she finds the child so cute. He says the kid came from an egg. She tells him to stop joking with her, as she has never heard of a child hatching from an egg. He thinks, yeah, logically speaking, there's no way a child can come out of an egg, and on top of that, he can't send her away or leave her with anyone else, life is so tough. Grandpa Albert arrives with Boban and inquires of Sailili why she is screaming, as he can hear her from a distance. She shows him the child and mentions that Chen Jilao brought the child from somewhere, asking if he isn't cute. They are both surprised to see the kid. Boban asks why he didn't see the kid beside him earlier, and what he has been up to. He says he guesses the child crawled off the bed. He thinks about how to explain this, and even if he does, they won't understand. He suggests saying he rescued her from the beast's cave. Grandpa Albert agrees, adding that Chen Jilao just woke up, so they shouldn't make a fuss. He instructs them to go and prepare some food, 
and they can talk while eating. Sailily says, be good, big sister will make him yummy and delicious food. She and Bobin walk out, and Bobin asks if she has thought about being his girlfriend. She says no, she does not want to. The kid approaches Chen Jilao and requests food. Chen Jilao responds, just wait for a while, big sister is preparing food. Grandpa Albert expresses apologies, stating he is sorry. He inquires about the sudden apology, and Grandpa Albert explains that he was careless and he never expected a high-ranking monster to be inside that beast den, and he nearly died because of his carelessness. He asserts that it is not his fault, he chose to go there himself. He adds that were it not for this mission, he wouldn't have understood the things he said and wouldn't have known that coming here was not an accident. He recounts that when he was on the verge of succumbing to the Beast King in battle, he found himself in some kind of dimensional space, and there, he encountered a mysterious uncle who informed him that he had been awaiting his arrival for a considerable time. The uncle offered him the opportunity to leave that space by becoming his master, and given the circumstances, he had no alternative but to accept. He explains that upon emerging, he acquired the power of the chaos element as if everything had been preordained. He inquires whether he thinks he is overthinking and if everyone obtaining elemental power enters this dimensional space. Grandpa Albert responds that he has never heard of anyone entering space to acquire elemental power, and the chaos elemental power he gained had been encountered only once before in those ancient books dating back a thousand years. He inquires about what the book says, as it might provide them with some clues about what happened to him. He states that the books recount a tale from thousands of years ago when the evil god Miriuos descended into the human world. Chaos, slaughter, darkness, and pain spread across the world, and humans had no choice but to fight against the evil god to survive. However, Miriuos' power was too formidable, and the human army could not withstand the demon's attacks. When humanity was on the brink of extinction, a hero emerged named Hesiod. He wielded the power of the chaos element, unprecedented, and drove back the demons. Hesiod gathered an army under him and fought the evil god and his underlings for many years. Eventually, Hesiod killed Miruos and sealed his soul inside the Hell Tower Altalos. However, as a price for this victory, Hesiod also had to remain there. Chen Jilao asks if the person he saw could be the hero Hesiod. He speculates that if he possesses the element of chaos, then the individual he saw might indeed be Hesiod. Just then, Salili arrives and asks if the two are still talking, urging them to come as the food is ready. Grandpa Albert responds that they are on their way. He says to Chen Jileao, let's not tell anyone about the things they talked about just now until they can confirm them. After a while, they all gather for a meal. Chen Jileao comments on the festive atmosphere and praises Salili's cooking. She points to Ratchetler and remarks that he is just an assistant. The truly amazing one is he, and he should be thanked. Ratchetler expresses gratitude for her praise. Chen Jilao then inquires why Ratchetler is present. He explains that Uncle Albert brought him back and suggests that he should try the food he prepared. Grandpa Albert explains that they have limited knowledge about the outside of Latonia, but Ratchetler possesses expertise in scale and maps, which is why he brought him back. The kid starts playing with Ratchetler. He asks, what is this kid and then says, never mind, he is alright. Chen Jilao inquires about the other two who fought with him in the cave. She explains that Grandpa sent them to the town treatment station, suggesting they can go visit them after eating. He agrees and says let's eat them. Chen Jilao wonders if all beastmen are such talented cooks. Ratchetler clarifies that cooking is just his hobby. He instructs him to bring some milk as the little one cannot eat the current food. Ratchetler agrees. Meanwhile, a person informs Hicks that the outsider is still with Albert. Hicks responds, All right, let's go back and report this. Meanwhile, in the netherworld, Argolis, a dragon, approaches Lord Hades, and she states that he has finally arrived. Argolis transforms into a human and inquires why she urgently summoned him. She explains that she cannot sense Sunil's energy in Latanya, and it seems as if he has just disappeared. She has a feeling that he might be dead. Argolis insists that it's impossible, as none of those in Latanya can kill him. She acknowledges that she knows, which is why she wants him to go to Latanya and investigate what exactly transpired. She emphasizes that Sunil was stationed there to guard the seal, so it is crucial to determine what happened. Argolis expresses understanding and assures her that he will head over there immediately. Meanwhile, Chen Jiliao, Bobin, and Salili are in the market. Salili mentions that he has experienced many things in the Beast Cave, and she thought he simply had to kill some monsters, finding it amazing. Bobin questions what's so amazing about that, claiming he can do it more easily. Chen Jilao challenges him to go ahead, stating that he will prepare to retrieve his remains. Bobin asks what he said and suggests fighting right now. 
Sailily intervenes, saying she has wanted to ask him which element he awakened to use against the Beast King. He admits he doesn't know either and asks about the usual elements that healers awaken. She explains that healers typically awaken light elements, but she has also seen healers with powers related to other elements, such as fire and water. He speculates that perhaps he also awakened the light element and reflects on how he initially thought he would awaken a different element. Boban agrees, saying he also believes he awakened the light element. He recalls Grandpa Alber mentioning that he should wait for the right time to reveal information about his element. She notes that they have arrived. This is the best healing center in Delk Town. They enter the Delk Town Healing Center. Sailily tells Chen Jilao to hurry up. He agrees and hopes that Bras and Philoga are right. As he moves his foot forward, it lands on a portal gate, and he teleports, exclaiming, What is this? Meanwhile, Sailily asks why Chen Jilao is taking so long. She looks back and inquires about his whereabouts. On the other side, Chen Jilao asks what is it this time and wonders why he is suddenly here. Hicks arrives and says not to be so shocked. He simply used transport magic to bring him here. Introducing himself as Hicks, one of the four guardians of Latinea Delk Town. He explains that this is a place where only Latania's strongest individuals can come. He questions why he brought him here, and Hicks responds that they know he killed the Beast King, and they want him to join them, assuring him that they will do their best to satisfy his desires. He declines, stating that he is not interested in joining them, he just wants to leave this place. Hicks thinks to himself that he was told this youngster is the same as Albert, yet he was instructed to persuade him, considering it a waste of his time. Hicks informs him that their people are already on their way to kill his friends, giving him one last chance. If he doesn't agree, he won't get out of there alive. Chen Jilao counters, stating that he will also give Hicks a chance. If he doesn't see Sailily and the others when he leaves, there will be consequences. Hicks readies himself to attack. Sailily inquires about what's going on and where Chen Jilao is. Boban explains that he thought Chen Jilao was right behind them, but he smells something and quickly warns Sailily to be careful. Just in time, God almost grabs her, but Boban pulls her towards him, saving her from the attack. He asks if she's alright, and she confirms she's fine, thanking him for saving her. Boban shouts angrily, expressing his determination to rip the attacker to shreds for daring to hurt Sailily. Meanwhile, on the other side, Chen Jiliao is also attempting to escape from a trap and rescue a child. He mentions that he can't attack while carrying a child, and the kid becomes happy. Chen Jiliao questions why the child is so happy emphasizing the dangerous situation they are in. Hicks remarks that Chen Jilao is much stronger than he expected but advises him to worry about himself before the others. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao responds that he doesn't understand why they must fight and asks if they shouldn't work together to find a way to deal with the monsters outside. He laughs and questions why they would do something like that. It appears that Albert didn't tell him the truth that they have an agreement with the monsters. The deal is that the monsters stay away from the village and in return, the villagers send some humans as offerings from time to time. They also don't interfere with the monsters hunting outside. He adds that Albert was there and didn't oppose this arrangement, believing that sacrificing a few weaklings in exchange for the peace of the whole village was worth it. After a while, he responds that from the beginning, he never had any intention of leaving Latanya, and he was just using it as an excuse to send people to die. He asks if it's a great plan and suggests that he join them. He states that those monsters are sent by God, and they can't defeat them. Albert is just pretending to be kind and self-righteous because he's weak. He adds that Albert doesn't even know anything, yet he's thinking of challenging a god. He is told that the answer is still the same, and he's not interested in staying here like a coward. He believes Grandpa Albert won't agree to such shameless conditions, and he doesn't care how great the plan is, he will leave this place and go home. He reiterates that he doesn't care if it's humans, monsters, or gods. If they stand in his way, he will kill them all. Hicks dismisses his perspective, stating that he's too naive to think that way. Chen Jiliao makes the kid sit on the floor, instructing him to stay there and not run around. The kid agrees, and Chen Jiliao goes to attack Hicks. Sailily, Boban, and God engage in a fight while onlookers urge others to run, noting that someone is fighting there. Sailily employs her Hellfire skill, and Boban utilizes Shadow Assault, transforming his shadows to attack God. While God attempts to stop the attack, he instructs Sailily to use Hellfire Blaze again, resulting in an explosion. Suddenly, Chen Jilao arrives and warns God that he doesn't care about the deals they might have, but if God dares to touch his friends, he will destroy them all. God quickly disappears. Sailily approaches Chen Jilao, questioning what happened and where God went. Chen Jilao replies that he will tell her later, but first, they need to head back quickly because Grandpa Albert might be in trouble. 
Meanwhile, Grandpa Albert reads something while having tea. He mentions that if the element Chen Jilao has grasped is indeed chaos, then according to the book's prophecy, demons and gods will soon descend, and the whole world will be drowned in endless darkness. He thinks the only person who has grasped the element of chaos can save them. As they reach there, he calls for Chen Jilao and asks if they have seen their friends already, closing the book instantly. He continues, mentioning Hicks, Lucius, Sarkia, and the Palaise's land's strongest magician, Dorop. They were the first ones to come here a few hundred years ago, and this town was established by them. He recounts that at that time, Latanya was worse than hell because people who came there not only had to hide from monsters, but also from other humans who killed each other for food. Those who couldn't find any food started eating their companions' corpses, and some even used their children as trade for food. When people were in despair, Dorop saved them and brought everyone to this town. He gave them seeds, taught them how to farm, and established a civil society with a system. The thought of leaving Latanya was considered taboo because angering the monsters outside could put the whole village in danger. Boban asks why he didn't tell them that this town's peace was traded with the lives of innocents. He then asks Chen Jilao what he said. After a while, Chen Jilao replies that making an agreement with the monsters and sending innocent people as offerings to trade for this dirty piece is something Grandpa Albert should know about. Chen Jilao questions Grandpa Albert about why he didn't disclose the truth from the beginning or if he shares the same lack of guilt regarding treating innocent lives as a bargain. Salili informs him that Grandpa Albert isn't such a person. He is one of the twelve heroes. Grandpa acknowledges that Chen Jilao is correct and admits to agreeing to those criminal acts. Surprised, Salili asks for clarification. While Grandpa, unperturbed, asks Chen Jilao to consider a scenario, if his loved ones were on one side and those innocent strangers on the other, how would he choose? He asserts that he did what anyone would have done, chosen to protect his loved ones. As for those innocent people, he is not so self-righteous as to abandon his loved ones for someone he doesn't even know. He reflects on the past, uncertain if it was the right choice. At that time, Salili and Bulban's lives were used to keep him in check. Any attempt to break the balance would have resulted in their deaths. He emphasizes his willingness to sacrifice his life for justice, but he can't bear the thought of allowing Salili and Boban to die. They are the most important people in his life, and to ensure their survival, he had no choice but to agree to that arrangement. His sadness is palpable as she approaches, expressing concern. Once more, he asserts that if it were only his life at stake, he would have stood against them all to prevent this morally compromised trade from continuing. He asserts that he's not a coward and not afraid of dying. Chen Jilao counters, stating that if he were strong enough to protect both his loved ones and the innocent people, there would be no need for such a choice. He questions whether Grandpa Albert only agreed to the deal because he couldn't defeat all four guardians while safeguarding Salili and Boban. Boban, angered, issues a warning, threatening to stab him if he continues speaking in that manner. Salili adds that even if someone is strong, there will always be someone stronger, and compromising doesn't make Grandpa weak. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao inquires about Grandpa Albert's choice between Salili and Boban. He clarifies that it's just his perspective, and if any of his words are offensive, he offers an apology. Grandpa responds that there's no need to apologize, in fact, he should be thanked. He explains that he had long accepted being trapped there forever until Chen Jilao came along, reigniting his desire to leave. Grandpa expresses that Salili and Boban are now adults, and they should be allowed to make their own choices. If they don't want to take the risk, he has arranged everything for them in this place. After a while, she declares that no matter where Grandpa Albert goes, she will follow him. Boban adds that he doesn't care about whatever Grandpa arranged here, he will always stay by Salili's side to protect her. Chen Jilao suggests that it's time to fight back for the sake of the innocent townsfolk, their loved ones, and freedom, so they should fight together. Grandpa agrees but emphasizes that to leave the town, they must first defeat all four guardians, the Wind Magician, Hicks, whom Chen Jilao has already defeated, being the weakest, defeating the remaining three, Lucius, Sarkia, and the Combat Ability Specialist, Dorop, will be their biggest challenge. He thinks it won't be easy, and based on his understanding, they will come after them as soon as Hicks recovers. He contemplates that they have very limited time, if they can't defeat them, attempting to find God's palace is just suicide. He conveys to Salili, Boban, and Chen Jilao that they need to break through their limits and be at their strongest. From now on, whether they can stay alive or not depends on their strength. They all agree. The scene transitions to the mountains, where Chen Jilao reclines and contemplates that he has been stuck here for a while now. He believes his mom must have been worried sick about him and thinks don't worry, mom. 
He will come back to her very soon. Meanwhile, a child plays with butterflies and jumps from the edge of the mountain behind them. Chen Jiliao quickly grabs the child and cautions him to be careful because if he falls and dies, he will die too, so he shouldn't cause trouble for him. He checks his status screen and reflects that even though he killed the Beast King and obtained a large number of experience points, he only leveled up by 10 levels. He has 50 unused skill points, and that strange uncle also disappeared after the battle. Chen Jiliao thinks never mind, let's think about how to allocate these points. He contemplates that now that he has awakened, the Chaos Elemental skill Annihilate requires 90% HP consumption. Even though it allows him to ignore defense and deal true damage, his HP would become dangerously low, leaving him vulnerable. Although he can use the Berserk Warriors morning after employing Annihilate to instantly recover his HP, one potion costs 8 levels. In that case, his healing skills would be more useful. Perhaps he should level all MP to offense and give up on defense for now. Once he obtains a higher recovery skill, he can switch over to adding strength and defense, it's more worth it that way. He decides then, let's do it that way, and not many people should be able to survive his all-out true damage anyway. Meanwhile, his status screen notifies him that he received a message. He thinks about the message, checks it, and sees a message from Bursting Sweetheart X100, which he identifies as Kin Xiaomei's ID. Chen Jilao wonders what's going on as he receives Kin Xiaomei's message. He contemplates whether he can communicate with the outside world now, and checks his messages. Kin Xiaomei asks if he's online and informs him that she's near the Florces church's door in the newbie village. She urges him to come quickly, or she will get mad. She adds that if he keeps ignoring her, she will teach him a lesson in school. He wonders if the game is still showing that he's online. He ponders why his mother is moving to another city and who this bald uncle is. He doesn't remember any bald uncle among his mother's friends. Then he thinks, wait, something must have happened and inquires. Could it be because his consciousness is trapped here and his physical body went into a vegetative state? He wonders if his mother is planning to sell the house and move to a different city to cure him. However, the country's best hospital is in B-City, and it doesn't make sense for her to move to another city. With his mother's wealth, she doesn't need to sell the house either. He asks himself just what the hell is happening and how he can find out what's going on there. The kid comes and gives him a flower, but he pushes him away, saying not now and to go play by himself. The child starts crying, and he realizes what he did. He says, damn, he's sorry, and he didn't want to do that. Please don't cry. After a while, his status screen notifies him that punishment is activated because the bound being is feeling sad and unhappy. He thinks about what he has done, takes a deep breath, and says his life is so tough. He receives a punishment for transportation and finds himself in a volcano mountain. He sees a giant hellfire monster there and apologizes to the kid for his earlier actions, asking if he can forgive him and offering a flower. The child takes the flower and becomes happy. Chen Jilao says now, let's get this over with while taking out his sword. The scene shifts to the hospital, where Bross stands near the window, thinking he can't believe Albert is also here. He wonders why Albert is asking them to hide the details of the fight and what his intention is. He recalls asking Grandpa if he is one of the twelve heroes, the one who defeated the scary demon Quink in the O'Brien battle, and the strongest lightning warrior, Albert. Bross says he never thought he would see him in this lifetime and asks if he is also trapped here. Grandpa Albert replies that's all in the past and he's just an old man now. He confirms while elaborating he has been here for a very long time, so don't mention anything about the past anymore. He responds that he can't believe he's seeing the hero from the rumors and asks if he found him for something. Grandpa says, indeed, he needs him to promise something. He asks what he needs him to do, and he has to personally come to find him. Grandpa responds it's about Chen Jilao, and if anyone were to ask him about the details of how Chen Jilao killed the Beast King, he hopes he and Philorga will use discretion and he must not divulge any important information about him. He assures Uncle Alvar that he doesn't have to worry, even though he doesn't know why he wants them to hide it, but he can rest assured he won't tell anyone about it. Grandpa thanked him as he went out and said that he wouldn't disturb him anymore. He added take care and get well soon. The person replied okay, see him later. Ross thought that even one of the twelve heroes, Alvar, was trapped here, so his desire to leave was just a dream at this point. Grandpa also mentioned that if he wanted to leave this place, the only way was to find the god palace hidden somewhere in the Latinea desert. They had started recruiting talented people from the town, and if he was interested, he could come to the south side of the town to find him. He confirmed his interest. The scene shifts to the present, where Philoga states that he is already standing up. He notes that it seems like his wounds are mostly healed, but it's already late at night, 
and he asks why he isn't sleeping. The person replies that thanks to the high-level healer here, his broken bone is fully healed, and within a few days, he should be back to his former self. In these few days, he has experienced so many things that his heart can't stay calm. He mentions that one of the twelve heroes, Alber, also found him to talk about Chen Jiliao and the God Palace. Filoga asks what he says that he is one of the twelve heroes, Alber. He confirms and mentions that since he shares the same warrior profession, he saw his portrait and set him as his goal, otherwise, he wouldn't have recognized him either. He adds that there's no way the hero who ventured into the Black Sea alone and killed the scary demon Quinch in the O'Brien battle is also trapped here. He emphasizes that being one of the 12 heroes is not just a title, they are the world's strongest 12. He explains that every five years, the world hosts a battle to determine the strongest, and all the guilds send out five heroes to fight. The 12 guilds that reach the finals will then select the strongest hero. He further explains that this is how the 12 heroes came about. In that particular year, the Black Horse Thunderbird Guild shocked the whole world as Alber made the entire world remember him with his own power. He mentions that even though Alber's Thunderbird Guild lost to Chen Butong's Yunzi Guild and Azersk's Phoenix Guild, both of them just barely won. He explains that the five heroes from Yunzi and Phoenix Guild were all part of the 12 heroes from past competitions. Even though they are much older, their combat ability can't be underestimated. However, the newly established Thunderbird Guild defeated almost all of the 12 heroes from the past few competitions, with only Alber alone. He continues, stating that not long after, the rising star of the Thunderbird Guild disappeared after the O'Brien battle. Some say that, in that battle, five people other than him died, and he went alone to the Black Sea to kill the scary monster Quinch, thus ending the war. Ross adds that just hearing that story shocked him to the point where he couldn't think, and Chen Jilao's combat ability is on par with these heroes. Grandpa Alba recalls a terrible incident where he warned Sailili's parents to be careful when a monster attempted to attack them. However, when they turned around, the monster attacked them and killed them instantly. He was shocked to witness this and couldn't save them. As he looks at Morse's necklace and thinks about Morse and Luna, he decides to take Sailili and leave Latinea. Over the years, he has been living with guilt and regret, unable to accept the truth. He resigned himself to this fate, convincing himself that being trapped here forever was his punishment. However, he realizes that Sailili is innocent and shouldn't have to suffer with him. He believes that she should be able to go out into the world and enjoy her life to the fullest. He explains that he placed the Lightning God's enchantment within her body. If she encounters any danger that could harm her life, the enchantment will activate, and not even a god will be able to harm her. He assures that this time, he won't break his promise. The scene shifts to Chen Jilao, who comes back after his punishment has ended. He lies down on the grass, relaxing himself, and expresses that his little darling, this punishment was much harder than the last time and he wonders what's going on. Upon receiving a notification on his status screen, he learns that each time he activates the punishment, the monster's combat ability will increase by 10%. Shocked by this revelation, he quickly gets up, realizing that it will just get harder and harder. As the kid says Iluka, Chen Jilao questions the kid about what Iluka means, and if the kid understands anything about it, then he must have really bad luck. He reflects on how he thought he would summon something like a weapon or a pet. But instead, he has a child he needs to take care of. The kid repeats Iluka, and Chen Jilao acknowledges that the kid can't understand his words. After a while, he recalls something, thinks about it, and asks the kid if he can see this while touching his status screen. The kid replies, Iluka, and he wonders why neither Grandpa Albert nor Sailili was able to see the system. But this kid can. He asks if the kid, being able to see the system information, knows something he doesn't and if he has anything to do with him being able to receive Q Xiaomei's messages. He shakes his head, thinking it's useless to ask since he can't understand him anyway, but he still feels like this brat is the reason he was able to receive Xiaomei's messages. Sailili calls him from behind, having arrived there with Bobin, Bras, Philoga, and Grandpa. He says so everyone is here and tells Bras and Philoga that it's good to see them again. Meanwhile, Bross acknowledges that, yeah, since he didn't come to see them, they could only come to see him themselves, and he asks Philoga if that's right. Philoga nods his head in agreement. Chen Jileo apologizes, explaining that yesterday he encountered some things and had to rush back, and then it was late, so he didn't want to disturb their rest. But it seems like they have both recovered already. Bras adds that it's thanks to Sailili and Bobin that they could recover so quickly. Bobin asks who took care of them and wonders if they are familiar, while Bras says not to expose him. Chen Jiliao expresses his happiness that they too are alright and asks what brings them here today. 
he replies that they want to join Uncle Albert's expedition, emphasizing that they don't want to be trapped here either. He then asks about the kid, expressing surprise that he never thought he was already a dad. Chen Jiliao explains that the kid is, and when the kid says Lu Ka, he quickly corrects himself, saying her name is Luca. Boban interrupts, asking what he's doing, stating that they didn't come here to chat. He informs them that Grandpa Albert is going to start training them. Ross puts his hand on Chen Jiliao's shoulder and suggests to Boban that they haven't seen each other for so long. They can chat for a while. Meanwhile, Luca bites Bross's hand. Boban gets angry and says to stop the nonsense, emphasizing that they must take Grandpa Albert's training seriously. Grandpa starts laughing upon seeing them like that, while Bross asks what he is laughing at. He laughs and replies that it's nothing. It's just that ever since he came to Latinea, it hasn't been so lively, and it makes him feel alive again. Salili thinks it's her first time seeing Grandpa Albert laughing so happily. He continuously laughs and says that they all can relax for now, but once training starts, he won't let them off, even if they cry. Ratchetler prepares the food and informs Uncle Albert that he is cooking for the three of them, asking if there is anything specific he would like to eat. Luca sits nearby, playing with vegetables. He asks if he could go play somewhere else, expressing concern that if he gets injured while cooking, Chen Jilao will be upset. Albert suggests Ratchetler should prepare enough for twenty, not just three. He inquires if there are any guests coming today. Albert clarifies that no guests are expected. However, just then, they all arrive. Albert tells Ratchetler to start cooking more, to which he agrees, expressing surprise that the training ended so quickly, considering it's only been half an hour. They all sit down to have food. Chen Jiliao moves his bowl and asks Ratchetler for one more. He complies, and Albert comments that the group is really strong, managing to last more than half an hour against his clones. However, they all remain expressionless. Albert asks why they are not happy, and they respond that they absolutely are not. Salili expresses frustration, stating that they couldn't even fight properly despite trying for so long, and they barely damaged the clones. Ross agrees, acknowledging that they have faced higher level monsters and engaged in 1v1 duels before. But this experience was entirely different. Boban adds those guys are too cunning. He remarks on Chen Jiliao's clone's exceptionally strong combat ability. Chen Jiliao interjects, pointing out that their battle was more akin to a PvP mode and their opponents were not mindless monsters. The clones had the ability to think and strategize just like them. Reflecting on the encounter, he explains that initially, when the clones split up in different directions to conceal their locations, they thought the clones wanted to engage them one-on-one, -on -one, Consequently, they chased after them as a group, only to walk into an ambush, and he was surrounded and held back by the clones of Boban, Salili, Bras, and Philoga, while his clone eliminated the others in his team. In the end, it turned into a 5 versus 1 situation. He comments that, in a sense, they lost the battle before even engaging. Albert acknowledges his accurate analysis, stating that, as he mentioned, they had lost before the fight even began. He emphasizes that team battles are not solely about individual combat ability. Instead, they involve fighting in tandem with others and bringing out the best in each other. Drawing an analogy to chess, he explains that some pieces need to attack, some need to defend, and some have to sacrifice so that others can move forward and eliminate the king. He points out that their clones lack the ability to think. Instead, they analyzed their skills and formulated an effective strategic plan accordingly. It was the simplest and most effective plan to deal with a rookie team. Chen Jiliao reflects, acknowledging that it's like a math question. Once thoroughly understood, solving it becomes simple and easy. However, attempting the question without understanding it could lead to falling into a trap. He concludes that they need to learn how to fight as a team, understanding their own weaknesses while figuring out an effective way to defeat their enemy. Albert suggests ending today's training and announces that tomorrow morning, he will train them on how to work together. He advises them to rest well tonight. After a while, Chen Jiliao lies on his bed and reflects that even though he knows it's just training, witnessing his teammates get killed while he can do nothing makes him feel useless, and if today were a real battle, it would have been Luca and his mother who were killed. He thinks this won't do, he is still too weak, and he has to become strong enough to protect the people he cares about. Chen Jiliao listens to some voices and asks his uncle if that is him and where he is. He wonders what's going on and why there is no response, as the voice just now was definitely from his uncle. He asks Luca if he heard a weird uncle's voice just now. He finds it strange, as even he did not hear it, could it be that he is just too tired and started hearing things? Luca comes onto his belly, and he questions how he can sleep with him clinging like that. Observing that Luca is already asleep, he gently puts him on the bed. 
Chen Jilao wonders how his mother raised him by herself. He reassures his mother that he will be back soon, and now that everything is clear, he just needs to become stronger, defeat the guardians, and leave the town with Grandpa Albert and others. After a while, he finds himself in a mysterious place and reflects that even though he killed the Beast King, the strongest enemy he ever faced, in today's battle, he realizes that strength alone is not enough. He acknowledges that it's good he realized this so soon. Compared to the Brainless Beast King, those copies have better and stronger combat abilities, but it's not just that. He notices the old man in front of him and asks if it is him, confirming that he did not hear wrongly. He questions what this place is and why the old man suddenly appeared there. The old man explains that this is his inner heart's world, and ever since he became his master, he has resided here. He inquires about his inner heart world. He explains that after he came out from that place, he was too weak, so it took him until now to come and see him. He expresses understanding and gratitude for his help, acknowledging that because of him, he was able to kill the Beast King. However, he questions why his inner heart world is filled with flowers. The old man responds that each person's inner heart world is based on the things they truly care about the most. It seems these flowers are connected to his consciousness on a deeper level. He picks up a flower petal and questions if these flowers are connected to him, stating that he does not remember ever having any interest in flowers. He decides he can think about it later and mentions that he came here for something much more important. He proposes the idea that he can make him much stronger, even though he has only recovered at most 1% of his combat ability. It's enough to help him understand just how strong and scary the chaos element is, and currently, he can't even unleash 0.001% of the chaos element's power. Chen Jiliao asks if he is joking, emphasizing not even 0.001%. The old man defends his statement, saying it's just a conservative estimate. Chen Jiliao questions if he means exaggerated. The old man expresses his desire for him to learn how to tap into the true power hiding within him and grow stronger because if he dies, he will also cease to exist. The status window notifies him about the Chaos Element Master's Trial, and the mission requirement is to survive for three minutes against his opponent, with the reward being 400,000 experience. He thinks that he just needs to hang on for three minutes to earn 400,000 experience. The old man asks how he feels about it and if he is ready. He responds, bring it on, let's start. After a while, Lucius asks Hicks if Chen Jiliao is really that strong, mentioning that he has never seen him injured so badly before. Hicks dismisses Chen Jilao as just a weakling, stating that he got lucky because he was careless. She counters, suggesting that if Chen Jilao had gone all out and used his killer move, he might have already become a corpse. Lucius questions what he said, and she explains that Lord Dorop asked him to assess the opponent's combat ability, and he ended up getting himself injured badly. She expresses confusion about how someone like him became one of the four guardians. He asks why she is acting so arrogant and asserts that even she is no match for him. She hits him on the head with her heels and says she doesn't mind helping Lord Dorop get rid of him before he does. He gets angry and asks how she dares. She acknowledges that Chen Jilao is indeed strong, but from his perspective, he is just a barbarian without any battle strategy. Even if it's Alber in front of Lord Dorop, they are all ants waiting to be killed. A covered face guardian remarks that Alber started recruiting people from the streets, and since he's one of the twelve heroes, people would believe him. Still, if Lord Dorop interferes, the whole town will become chaotic, and people will start panicking. She asks what he is trying to say. He opens a portal, and a Latinea Wanderer monster appears. They both are shocked. He orders it to go and kill those people in town. The Latinea Wanderer monster runs out to attack. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao resides in his inner world and begins to launch attacks. The status screen notifies that the mission countdown is two minutes. He acknowledges that he feels sorry for his uncle but he decides to avoid engaging in a fight with him for three minutes, prioritizing the completion of the mission. Once he obtains the 400 Kelvin experience reward, he plans to train however he sees fit. However, he begins to wonder why his uncle hasn't caught up yet, and a sense of unease creeps in. Suddenly, an explosion occurs, throwing him away. As he gets up, he observes the ground breaking into two parts. He questions the nature of this training, realizing that it seems more like an attempt to kill him. Reflecting on the recent attack, he remembers using the Ring of Protection and acknowledges that he had to utilize the Beast King's Protection Shield just now to dodge the attack, otherwise, he would have already died. The old man inquires if he is attempting to avoid direct confrontation with him and mentions that he did not anticipate dodging that attack, and it appears he underestimated him, but such tactics will no longer be effective. Chen Jilao points behind him and questions who is behind him. 
He looks behind. Chen Jilao starts running from there and states that he just needs to prolong this for a while longer to complete the mission. He asks if they can pause for a moment and resume the fight after he rests for a few minutes. The old man asserts that fleeing from a fight is not a solution, and the enemy will not provide an opportunity to catch his breath. He comes from behind to attack him. Chen Jiliao employs the burst slash to counterattack. He begins ascending slowly. Chen Jiliao reflects that, since his attack was a physical one, he could employ the burst slash skill to evade it. The old man wonders how Chen Jiliao managed to get behind him so suddenly without any observable movement. It seems as though he directly teleported behind him. He contemplates whether this could be the case. He acknowledges that the skill has a cooldown of 5 minutes, and if his uncle were to attack again, he fears he might fail this mission, especially with only 30 seconds remaining in the countdown. He sets his sword aside and expresses his understanding, but he wonders if he could allow him to rest for a while just this time. He promises that afterward, he will continue the training and won't attempt to flee. The old man agrees but insists that he must explain the technique he used just now. He wonders if he means his skill, burst slash. The status window notifies that the countdown has ended, the mission is completed, and he has obtained 400k experience, resulting in a level up. After a while, Chen Jilao states that these skills are generated by the system after he levels up, and using skills is akin to following some sort of order. He reflects on it, and his body moves on its own to execute the skill. Just now, he used the skill burst slash to dodge her attack. He inquires if there is any problem with it. Meanwhile, Ratchetler is injured due to the house break-in and exclaims that it hurts. He questions what happened there, noting the severe damage to the house. He asks about Bobin's whereabouts and pleads not to inform him that Bobin is buried underneath the rubble. He calls out to Bobin, inquiring about his location and well-being, fearing the possibility that he might have been fatally crushed. Suddenly, a stone hits Ratchetler's face, causing it to bleed. He demands to know who is throwing things around at midnight, warning that such actions could lead to dire consequences. To his shock, he discovers the Latinea Wanderer monster attacking people and hurling objects. Bobin attempts to attack Latinea Wanderer, but he is effortlessly thrown aside. He believes he is not mistaken. He is the demon beast that killed his parents, and he will never forget him, even if he turns into ashes. He expresses that he has worked hard all these years just so that one day, he can find and kill him. He never expected him to come to him himself. Ratchetler asks Bobin if he is alright and questions why there is a demon beast present. He instructs him to leave. He declares that today, he will tear him apart limb by limb, dig out his bones one by one and then pour his blood on his parents' grave, moving to attack him. Meanwhile, Lucius observes all of this and remarks, Now, this is interesting. Hicks comments, but it seems too conspicuous that only they are being attacked in the whole town. A covered face guardian agrees, stating that's why he has already summoned other demon beasts into the village for when the time comes, and they just need to lure Albert over. She asserts that Lord Dorop will personally kill him, and Hicks should go deal with those other newcomers, emphasizing not to fail again this time. She also mentions that she will handle the new healer, expressing hope that he can last for a while, as it won't be fun if it ends too quickly. Meanwhile, Ratchetler runs toward Albert's house and exclaims, This is bad, a demon beast is in their house. He opens the door and asks, What is it? He responds that Boban is fighting with a demon beast. Just then, a boom explodes on that side. He instructs Ratchetler to go find Chen Jilao, and tells him to stay with Sailorly. Ratchetler says okay. He runs toward Boban. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao states that legend has it that the savior Hesiod can wield the power of the chaos element, and he defeats the evil god Murius and sealed him inside the hell tower Altalos. However, in the end, Hesiod also had to remain there. Chen Jilao asserts that he must be Hesiod and that the place he rescued him from must be the hell tower Altalos. He inquires about how it is and whether he remembers anything. He responds negatively, stating that his mind is still blank. He claims to have no memory of the world, and his name is just a title to him. Even if he is Hesiod, he still cannot recall his experiences. However, observing his skills evokes a familiar feeling, and for the first time, he feels slightly connected to this world. Chen Jilao wonders about him, pondering why he came here, how he rescued his uncle, and why he acquired the chaos element. He contemplates the numerous mysterious occurrences and considers that if his uncle is Hesiod and can regain his memory, he might be able to provide answers. He suggests to Chen Jilao to engage in another fight and use all the moves at his disposal, thinking it might trigger some recollection. 
He agrees, saying, okay, then, let's start. As he begins, he hears Luca's voice calling him, recognizing it as the little kid's voice. Meanwhile, Lucius enters the room and inquires about the child beside him. She reassures Luca not to be scared, mentioning that she is here to kill Chen Jilao, but won't harm him. Luca holds his leg and begins crying. She suggests that if he can't bear to part with Chen Jilao, he can let him accompany them. She uses magic to attack him, but it has no effect on either of them. Chen Jilao regains his senses and expresses gratitude to Luca for protecting him. He holds Luca and declares that he will handle the situation with her, noting that she is easier to deal with compared to the monsters in the punishment dungeon. Meanwhile, Latinea Town is overrun by Latinea Wanderer monsters, which are killing people and destroying everything. The town is filled with the screams of people calling for help. A monster spots a little girl crying near a dead body and approaches to attack her. However, at that moment, Grandpa Albert's triple thunder strikes the monster, killing it. He then holds the girl and asks if she is hurt. Numerous monsters gather around him. Bross and Philoba arrive and join the attack against the monsters. Bross questions Alber about what is happening and why the monsters suddenly attack the town. He explains that the town has a barrier surrounding it, with people guarding it 24 hours a day to prevent monsters from entering. These monsters couldn't have reached the town center without causing a commotion. Therefore, it appears that the Guardians couldn't wait any longer, and if he is not mistaken, these monsters are just a distraction. Bross speculates that their main motive is to kill them. Alber informs them that they need to save the town's citizens and bring them all to his house. When Bross asks where he is going, Alber replies that he needs to go to the town's outer area and seal the barrier. Bross suggests that the outer area would be filled with monsters, and they should go with him. Alber insists that there's no need, instructing them to stay and protect the town's citizens. He then uses the first royal thunder flash and flies away from there. Meanwhile, Lucius remarks to Chen Jilao that his speed is much faster than the last time they fought. He looks at her and thinks, so it's her, the hooded person who attacked Salili and Boban. He reflects on how he never expected that the Lucius Grandpa Alber mentioned would be a woman. Addressing her as Auntie, he asks why she attacked him. Lucius becomes angry and questions who he is calling Auntie. He explains that if they can find the god's palace, everyone in the town can obtain freedom, so why do they insist on killing them? She responds by saying that Lord Dorop spent a lot of time and effort to build this town, and he won't allow anyone to threaten it. Additionally, she dismisses the god palace as a lie, claiming that wanting to fight with god's will is just foolish behavior. He declares that the god palace is real, and no matter who tries to stop him from finding it or harms his friends, whether human, monster, demon, or god, he will defeat them all. She criticizes him for being too cocky and arrogant, questioning if he thinks he's strong just because he defeated Hicks. She asserts that he is the weakest among the four guardians and that she is as strong as Lord Dorop. Using her magic, she summons a wolf. The status screen indicates that the Shadow Sword Wolf is a level 45 Shadow Assassin summons, extremely fast and highly flexible. She commands Demon Shadow to go in battle. Chen Zhuliao employs an Annihilation Slash, attacking and killing them. She is shocked to witness this and thinks it is impossible. She uses magic to summon 3,000 Shadow Swords, but Chen Zhuliao uses the Ring of Protection Shield to save himself. He inquires if that is her strongest attack. She thinks that he blocked her attack so easily, it seems like she underestimated him. She moves to attack and asserts that, of course, it's not her strongest, as she is just getting started. She summons a big wolf holding a sword in its mouth and states let's see how long he can last under his true power. The status screen updates him about the mission progress, notifying him that once town integrity drops to zero, the mission will fail, and the reward will be calculated based on the progress of the beast tide and the integrity of the town. Meanwhile, through the town's outer area, many monsters enter the town. The heroes engage in a fight with the monsters, and some attempt to repair the crack in the barrier. Wagner asks Gria how much longer he needs to repair the crack in this corner. Gria responds that there are too many monsters, and the energy they are imbuing is not enough to block their attacks and seal the breach. If this continues, the barrier will collapse entirely. Teacher Daymont encourages them to hang in there, emphasizing that it is their team's duty to guard this area. Even if they die, they can't let those monsters break the barrier. He instructs Wagner and Luo Meng to hold the monsters back, emphasizing the need to protect the town. They affirm their commitment. The barrier cracks from the other side, and Gria states that they can't last any longer. Suddenly, the crack starts to repair and closes the barrier. They are all surprised and realize that the barrier is recovering. 
attributing it to Albert, one of the twelve heroes. Albert arrives and kills the monster, instructing Daemon to leave this place to him and go support the others in sealing the barrier. Daemon agrees, ordering everyone to head to the next breach in the barrier. Lord Dorop arrives and kills the monsters. Everyone is happy to see him, and Wagner remarks that Lord Dorop is also here. However, they are shocked when he attacks them. Albert questions what he is doing, and Dorop responds that he gave all this trash a chance to live here so he can claim their lives any time he wants. He tells Albert that this is the consequence of betraying him. Meanwhile, Chen Zhilao attempts to defend himself from Lucius's sword attacks. An elite monster with a sword comes forward to attack him, and he retaliates by throwing it away. Lucius is shocked to see the strength of his counterattack, wondering why a healer's attack is so powerful. Chen Zhilao suggests she admit defeat and focus on saving the town instead. Lucius insists that he doesn't even know what is happening right now. She reveals that Lord Dorop himself has opened the town's barriers, and tonight, all the traitors, including Albert, one of the twelve heroes, shall be punished. Furthermore, Lord Dorop will personally kill Albert. Chen Zhiliao questions if Grandpa Albert went to fight with Dorop. Concerned about his grandpa fighting without his sword, he worries that without his weapon, Albert might be at a disadvantage against a formidable opponent. He decides to defeat Lucius quickly and go help his grandpa. He uses his annihilation power. Lucius observes him and thinks this guy seems to have become stronger. She descends from her wolf, shocked to witness his power, and attempts to attack him. However, he counters with a burst slash, injuring her severely. Perplexed, she asks why he is not killing her. The status screen notifies him about his mission progress update. Meanwhile, Lord Dorop utilizes his power to destroy the town but Albert attempts to stop him with his magic. Dorop questions Albert, asking if he truly believes he can defeat him. He asserts that the era of the Twelve Heroes is in the past, emphasizing that Albert is just an old man, while he is a god who looks down on insignificant beings like him that inevitably meet their slow demise. Albert endeavors to attack him, but Dorop counters with Wind Tempest, attacking him and bidding farewell to Albert. Simultaneously, Lucius is badly injured and reflects on the pain, realizing that she can't move at all. She wonders why he spared her when he could have easily killed her. Dorop is shocked to see Albert alive. Albert transforms into a new state and attacks him from all sides with the Thunder Fist, throwing him away. Dorop gets up and comments on an old man past his prime, working so hard to protect a group of pests. He finds it touching, admitting that it's been a long time since an opponent made him so excited. However, he asserts that Albert has no chance of winning this fight. He uses his magical power and, out of respect for him, decides to let him experience the true terror of a four-element magician's power. He then summons many monsters. Meanwhile, inside the town, Bross and Philoga attack the monsters and eliminate them. Philoga remarks that there are no more monsters appearing here. Bross observes that it seems like Uncle Albert has fixed the barrier, and asks Philoga if he is alright. Philoga responds that he is fine, it's his first time seeing so many high-level monsters. Bross agrees, noting that he had never seen so many high-level monsters appearing endlessly either. He mentions that he can't imagine how the people who came here first survived, speculating that they must have faced a situation a thousand times worse than this. Bross suggests they go and help the people in the outer area, mentioning that they must be having a tough time. Philoga agrees, saying, yeah. At that moment, they heard a strange voice and turned to see what it was. They saw a big monster there. Philoga remarked that they are water and fire elemental summons, which is unbelievable. It's his first time seeing such a large summoned creature, and there is such a strong elemental magician in this town. He explained that many elemental magicians can use all types of elements, but their power is not as strong as a single element magician. Their combat ability would be weak, but the only magician who can use so many elements at once and display such combat strength can only be that person. Philoga tells Bross to quickly look there, indicating that it's Uncle Albert who is going to attack the monsters. Albert uses the triple thunder strike to attack them. A monster is about to hit him, but he punches it back and kills it. The monster attacks him back, injuring him. He reverts to his old state. Lord Dorop comments that he did not expect he could dodge his attack, and it seems he still underestimated him. However, he adds that, in the end, Alber is just a mortal, and his body has already become old, and Alber is no longer the same as when he fought the Demon Quink. Unlike Alber, Dorop still has his young body with unlimited magic power that everyone envies. He asserts that he is a god who rules over weak, pathetic mortals. Alber responds, stating that someone who sells their soul to demons in exchange for eternal energy is just a dog licking the god's feet. He questions if it is really worth living without any sense of taste, smell, 
or touch. He remarks that he thinks he is the one envying others, isn't that right? Lord Dorop responds by telling him to shut up and attacks him with magic. He asserts that he should see that his life and death are in his hands and that killing him is as simple as crushing an ant. He declares that he will tell everyone that he was the one who opened the barrier. He claims to be the hero who killed Albert and saved the whole town, concluding that it is now time for Albert to die. Just then, Chen Jilao arrives and attacks Dorop, saving Albert. Dorop asks who he is. After a while, Chen Jilao asks Albert if he is alright. Albert responds that he has just a few small injuries but wonders why Chen Jilao is here. Chen Jilao explains that after he defeats Lucius, she informs him that Dorop is prepared to kill Albert. So, he rushed here to return Albert's sword, expressing regret that if he had remembered to return Ozil sooner, Albert wouldn't have been hurt to this extent. Albert reassures him not to worry about it, stating that even if he had Ozil with him, he would not be able to defeat Dorop. Albert reveals that he already offered his soul to the devil in exchange for unimaginable power. As he said, he is not the man he was in the past, and his body has aged, his strength has deteriorated, and he is just a mortal since he already crossed the peak period. It's just a long path down the mountain. He insists that he left a transportation seal in the fields, advising Chen Jilao to take Salili and the others and leave the place while he stalls Dorop. Chen Jilao responds that he is not leaving without him and Salili, Philoga, Boban, Bross, and Ratchetler, he won't abandon any of them. Chen Jilao recalls his mother's words, emphasizing that it is never easy to live in this world, and they can't simply accept their fate, instead, they must fight for their beliefs. He hands Alber his sword and declares that they will defeat Dorop, bring everyone to find the God Palace, and then leave this place together. The status screen notifies that the mission is completed, the sword Ozil is returned, attributes decreased, and they obtained 150,000 experience. Dorop declares that he thinks he can defeat them and uses his magic to attack. Chen Jilao employs the Ring of Protection to create a shield for their defense. Dorop mocks them, referring to them as a bunch of weak trash daring to challenge him. He launches another attack using explosive fire rain, but their shield holds strong and remains unaffected. Suddenly, the shield starts to crack. Chen Jilao realizes that Dorop's attack is too strong, and the status window notifies him that the Beast King's protective shield is about to collapse. The shield shattered, and an explosion followed. Dorop laughed, claiming that no one could survive that attack, and Albert must have already been burnt into ash. He is shocked to see all of them fine. Luka uses his protection shield to protect Chen Jilao and Albert. Dorop thinks it's impossible that a little kid can use this level of protection shield magic. The status window notifies that Luka's battle will have been activated. His level is 5, and his skill is Aegis Shield. It describes the details. The Aegis Shield is a powerful magic shield that can absorb damage and convert 50% of it into the user's magic damage, consuming 100 HP, S with no cooldown. The status window notifies him about the details of his powers. Chen Jilao asks Luka if he is alright. Luka looks at him, about to fall down, and Chen Jilao holds him, saying it's okay, Papa is here. He mentions that even Beast King's shield could not block the attack, yet Luka was able to hold it back. And if it were not for Luka, both Grandpa Albert and he would have been turned into ashes. The system notifies that Luka's battle will have dispersed and will now enter the storage space to recover, which will take up to 24 hours. Chen Jilao expresses his gratitude, telling Luka to have a nice sleep as he will take care of things here. The system notifies that Luka has entered the storage space. Albert mentions that Dorop used a lot of magic skills continuously, so he must be in a cooldown state. He plans to attract Dorop's attention. And in the meanwhile, Chen Jilao can find a chance to get near him and attack with his strongest move. Chen Jilao agrees, saying, All right. Albert initiates the first style, Lightning Jump. Chen Jilao wonders what level Dorop is, assuming it must be higher than Beast King Suno. He attempts to check Dorop's details, but the system is unable to detect them. He concludes that it's just like that time with the Wandering Dominator, and he is unable to see Dorop's level. Albert goes to attack Dorop who remarks that he is really as annoying as a pest. Albert responds, stating that it's time they settle this once and for all. Dorop questions why he is talking as if it's a fight when it's just a one-sided slaughter. Albert asserts that they will see about that and uses the second style lightning charge to attack. Dorop dismisses him as just an old relic, overestimating himself and using his magic to throw Albert away. Fire and water elemental monsters come there to attack Albert, but he knocks them out. Dorop advises him to save his strength, emphasizing that he can never come near him. At that moment, Chen Jilao comes behind him to attack, 
Thinking that this is his chance, the system notifies that Obliterate has activated, deducting 90% of his HP, with the remaining 10% to be noted. Chen Jileao punches him and says, die. But Dorop counters by tying him with magic. Dorop questions if Chen Jilao thinks such a cheap trick will work on him and dismisses it as a joke. Chen Jilao attacks him, injuring him. The system notifies that Blessing has activated, using 70 MP, increasing the movement speed by 20%, removing the negative state of the wind lock, and within 5 meters, one target will receive 20 attacks. It also uses Obliterate's effect and changes Annihilation's attack from critical damage to true damage. Chen Jilao continues to attack him constantly. Albert notes that it's his cue, emphasizing that even if Dorop offered his soul to demons and obtained great power, he still possesses a magician's weak defense. Despite Dorop no longer being at his peak, Albert believes that this attack is enough to kill him and launches his attack, resulting in a big explosion. Albert declares that everything is over now. Chen Jileao reflects on the power commanded by one of the twelve heroes, realizing that the power unleashed in that last attack is not any weaker than Dorop's and may even be stronger. Albert mentions that the barrier still needs fixing in many places, suggesting that they need to split up and go help. He decides to go to the west side, leaving the east side to Chen Jilao as they are still fighting monsters there. Chen Jilao agrees, thinking about a strange feeling as if he is forgetting something. He realizes that even though the battle has ended, he has not received any system notification, which means he is not dead. Just then, Dorop comes back and says he did not expect that kid to break through his control. However, in the end, it does not matter because the power he has is beyond mortal imagination. He starts to heal his wounds. Chen Jileao observes and thinks that all his wounds are healing at a rapid rate, just like the wandering dominator he faced. Albert mentions that it seems he misjudged, Dorop's power did not come from the demons, and his source of power should be the god of the underworld, Hades. Chen Jileao asks about the god of the underworld. Albert explains that he still remembers the man who killed Salili's parents. At that time, the power he used was similar to Dorop's, and he never heard him mutter something about Hades. The story goes to the flashback, where Argolis kills a girl, stating that none of them is the one he came here for, and he feels he has come for nothing again. He wonders how he should explain it to Lord Hades and throws the girl away. Albert questions where he is going and declares that he will kill him. Argolis responds that no matter where he goes, he will find him one day and he will kill him. The story returns to the present. Albert observes that the power he is feeling from Dorop now is similar to that individual. He speculates that this might be related to why they are trapped in Latinea. Dorop admits that he didn't realize he knew that much already and he intended to kill him without using his real power but he didn't anticipate that he would be so troublesome to deal with. Dorop questions if he not understands yet, asserting that his elemental powers won't be able to harm him, and all his attacks are useless. He initially wanted to give him a painless death, but now he decides to torture him until he begs to be killed. Dorop uses the fading away power and disappears from there. They both are shocked and look around. The system notifies Chen Jilao with a warning that the target has disappeared. The system issues a warning, indicating that Chen Jilao's HP is less than 10%, and advises him to restore his health. Chen Jilao is badly injured and reflects on Dorop's stealth skill, noting that his attacks are swift and powerful. Remembering Grandpa Albert's words about Dorop obtaining power from a god, he realizes that they are unable to land an attack, experiencing the formidable power of the god of the underworld, Hades. He wonders how they are supposed to fight back against such overwhelming power. Dorop taunts him, asking if he is feeling despair. He declares that humans are inherently ruthless, exploiting the weak for their own gain and delighting in their struggles. Now, with his elevated status, he revels in watching them suffer, feeling excitement and overwhelming joy. Dorop captures Chen Jilao with magic and scoffs at the idea of him wanting to be a hero for the world, dismissing it as a joke. He suggests that if Chen Jilao can provide him with more joy, he might consider giving him a chance to live. However, Albert intervenes, coming from behind, and insists that Dorop let Chen Jileao go. Albert employs the lightning first style, blinding slash, to attack Dorop, but he effortlessly flicks him away and ensnares him with magic. Dorop questions whether he comprehends that all elemental attacks are futile against his godly powers. He asserts that, regardless of the strength of elemental powers, mortals cannot kill a god, such is the rule of nature, and the reality they must confront. Chen Jileao contemplates whether elemental powers are ineffective against gods and ponders if this is a part of the Cosmos game's setting. Dorop hands a sword to Chen Jileao, declaring that he promised to give him a chance, 
and proposes that if he kills the old man, Albert, he will allow him and his friend to live. Chen Jilao rejects the proposal, stating, Stop dreaming. Dorop warns that if he doesn't comply, he will force him to witness the torture and death of Albert, followed by the same fate for his friends. He launches an attack on Albert with stones, suggesting that a quick death without prolonged suffering would be preferable. Chen Jilao intervenes, expressing his willingness to kill Albert. Dorop presents him with a choice, either watch his loved ones suffer and perish or kill Albert to save them. Feeling powerless, Chen Jilao questions why he is so weak that he can only witness the torture and death of Albert and his friends. Reflecting on his friends, Luca, and his mother, he acknowledges that he is still unaware of what happened at home. He wonders what he should do. The old man arrives and questions if this weak individual is also considered a god. Chen Jilao is surprised to see him and enters his inner heart world, where the old man remarks that it would be embarrassing if the person he chose as his master was killed by such trash. Chen Jilao mentions that even when he utilized elemental power, he couldn't harm Dorop due to the latter having acquired the power of a god. The old man agrees, emphasizing that the gods residing above the mortal realm wouldn't grant humans the means to kill them. However, he clarifies that this restriction only applies to normal elements. Chen Jilao asks for clarification. He explains that if he were to die, he would also vanish. Consequently, he cannot permit his master to perish at the hands of a false god. While acknowledging the formidable and frightening nature of the god of the underworld's power, the old man asserts that Dorop has encountered someone special. According to him, ordinary elemental powers cannot harm a god, but the chaos elemental power possessed by him is unique and different. This is because it has the power to kill a god. He declares that it's time to reveal the true nature of the chaos element, allowing him to unleash 3% of its power. Meanwhile, outside, Dorop inquires if he has given up, asserting that if that's the case, he shall kill him. Turning to Albert, he declares that it's time for him to die. Chen Jilao snaps back to his senses, stating that he does not think so. The system notifies that the cooldown for blessing and annihilation slash has ended, removing negative effects. His speed increases by 20%, and his attack power is imbued with an HP absorbing effect. Dorop expresses his amusement at Chen Jilao, announcing that he will kill him first. He attacks, but Chen Jilao holds his sword from the front, stopping the attack. Dorop is shocked, wondering how he did that. Chen Jilao punched and attacked Dorop. The system notifies that Dorop's HP has decreased. He kicked Dorop and threw him away. The old man explains that if a god's power is like fire, then the chaos element is the water that can extinguish it. The status screen notifies that the skill has increased to level 12. Now, the chaos element can damage enemies with god's power. Under the obliterate state, each time he lands an attack, the cooldown of blessing and annihilate will be reduced by one second. If he attacks the same target 10 times in a row, it will deal 20% additional explosive chaos element damage. Upon killing an elite rank or berserk rank enemy, all skill cooldowns will be reset. He remarks that he is a natural born god killer. The system notifies that the obliterate state has 20 seconds remaining. Albert observes all of this and acknowledges that this is the true power of the chaos element. Chen Jiliao asks the old man why he didn't let him use the true chaos elemental power until now. The old man responds that if the enemy today wasn't using a god's power, he wouldn't have revealed the god-killing ability. The god-killing power is an absolute taboo, and once its presence is known to gods, they won't allow it to exist. Perhaps some of those gods with higher awareness have already perceived its presence at this moment. From now on, his enemies will only get stronger and stronger, and they won't stop until they kill him. He emphasizes that he is not just fighting simple monsters anymore but the high and mighty gods themselves. The status window notifies that he has unlocked the true power of the chaos element, and he has obtained advanced healing supplies, doses tears, and received a new mission, chaos training, with specific conditions. Chen Jilao declares that even if he has to face the gods, he will leave this place. The status window notifies him about doses pure tears, stating that after consumption, he will immediately recover 1000 HP and 700 MP, refresh all skill cooldowns, increase skill cooldown speed by 100%, and each attack will recover 50 MP for the next minute, with the added ability to identify hidden targets. After drinking the Dosa Pure Tears, he affirms that it's time to end everything once and for all. The status window notifies that Obliterate has recovered 1000 HP 800 MP, all skill cooldowns refreshed, and cooldown speed increased by 100%, with the Dosa attack state activated for 6 seconds. Dorop regains consciousness, finding the situation implausible. 
He reflects on losing all his senses when Lord Hades accepted his soul. However, he is puzzled about the current intense pain he is experiencing and questions when it occurred. Chen Jilao seizes the opportunity and launches an attack using both Blessing and Annihilation. In response, Dorop uses his magic to vanish to the side. The status window notifies that Dosa's eye conceal has been activated but proves ineffective, locking onto a target. Chen Jilao, guided by the activated Dosa's eye, continues his assault. Dorop is puzzled about how he remains visible to his opponent. Chen Jilao inflicts substantial damage on him, prompting the system to notify that Dorop's HP has decreased by 36 -0, accumulating 30 attacks and gaining 3 explosive chaos damage. Additionally, his HP is reduced by 300, the blessing cooldown is refreshed, and the target's HP falls below 10%. The system indicates that Dosa's tears effect will dissipate in 2 seconds, and the obliterate state will conclude in 5 seconds. Addressing Dorop Chen Jilao declares that it is time for him to meet his end, showcasing the power of a god killer. Chen Jiliao launches an attack, triggering a massive explosion with a brilliant light illuminating the surroundings. The spectacle captivates everyone's attention as they gaze towards the radiant display. Chen Jilao successfully defeats Dorop, and the system promptly notifies him of the accomplishment. The notification relays that he has slain Dorop, earning 3 million experience points. The system further details the rewards he obtains for vanquishing his foe. The system notifies that all conditions have been met. He used Dosa Tears in the battle, employed the Blessing skill twice, utilized the Killing God power to defeat Dorop, and completed the Mission Chaos training. As a result, he obtained 1.5 million experience, acquired God's Element X1, leveled up, and activated the Synthetic Smelting System. The Evaluate function, Map, and Sense function are also activated. Chen Jiliao descends, and Albert approaches him. He declares victory and subsequently falls unconscious. Meanwhile, in the Netherworld, Lord Hades sits, has tea, and observes as the light extinguishes in a vase. He contemplates whether Dorop's soul has been extinguished, considering he was Latinea's guardian. He acknowledges that the God Killer has truly appeared in Latinea, and Argles should have reached there by now anyway. Meanwhile, in the Endless Sea, Argles is on the boat and expresses frustration, stating that the boat is so slow. However, he acknowledges that it is the only way to traverse the Endless Sea. Argles then inquires of Cecil how much longer they need to reach Latinea. Cecil responds, saying they are right in front of it. After a while, Chen Jiliao falls asleep, and someone calls him, saying, wake up. He opens his eyes and wonders if it's his mom. He gets up and finds himself on the train, pondering what's happening and why he's there. A bald man asks if he's crazy, mentioning that he just scared him. The system announces the next station, Zhu Yuan Lu Station, and instructs passengers about to leave to be prepared. Chen Jilao contemplates whether he has returned to reality, and screams happily, expressing his joy at finally being back. The bald man asks him what he is talking about. The system announces the arrival at Zhu Yuan Lu Station, advising passengers to stay away from the left side train door. Chen Jilao remarks that he had just experienced a nightmare. The status screen issues a warning, alerting him to nearby danger and advising caution. He wonders why he is still receiving system alerts, realizing that he has not returned to reality. A person from behind questions what everyone is doing. Guards approach the scene. Chen Jilao hears a voice urging him to run and leave the place, and he wonders if it's his mom's voice. He vanishes from there. The bald man is shocked, questioning if he just disappeared. The guard comes closer and asks where the high school kid went. The bald man explains that the kid disappeared, asking if the others did not see it. The scene shifts and Chen Jilao wakes up in Latinea town, wondering if he is back in Latinea again and if it was all just a dream. He contemplates the reality of the experience, finding it strangely vivid. He ponders how he heard his mom's voice out of nowhere, whether it was real or part of the dream. Just then, Salili arrives, holding food, and informs him that he is finally awake. Concerned, he asks about the well-being of Grandpa Albert and the others. Salili reassures him, stating that everyone is fine and Grandpa Albert, in particular, has spent the past 10 days resting. She mentions that he was feeling bored and insisted on helping with the town's repairs. Chen Jilao is surprised to learn that he was asleep for 10 days. Salili explains that his wounds have healed, and despite the initial worry, Ratchetler made medicinal tonic and food for him. She urges him to finish eating and join them in the town afterward. She informs him that the townspeople have prepared a big feast to thank him for saving the town, and since he has already awakened, he should prepare a speech for the occasion. Attempting to respond, he finds it challenging. 
She departs, mentioning that she has arranged new clothes for him outside, advising him to change into them. He agrees with an okay. He reflects that Luca must still be inside the system's space. Checking the system, he anticipates that Luca should have recovered by now. However, the system displays an error, indicating that Luca has not recovered yet, and there is an unread mail. Intrigued, he contemplates the mail. The status screen notifies him that he has passed the Cosmos Hell Difficulty Chapter's first area, unlocking all system functions, including crafting, alchemy, appraisal, map sense, title, teleport array, and Chaos God Killer Power Growth Systems. Amazed, he considers the possibility that the inability to exit the game in Hell Difficulty may have led to unlocking the complete system. He decides to check the new features. The system notifies him that he has activated the crafting system and describes its details. He contemplates that the craft system resembles the one he knows from the game, and therefore, alchemy should be similar as well. He acknowledges that everything seems to resemble a game and appreciates the inclusion of an appraise function. This feature would be useful if he encounters anyone dangerous, allowing him to appraise them to gain information. The status screen notifies him about the appraisal system, explaining that after activating the appraise function, the system will automatically record all creatures and items he encounters. To appraise high-level beings, he will need to upgrade the appraise system. Checking the status window, he notes that Luca and the Wandering Dominator only have question marks, indicating that he can view their details only after upgrading the appraise system. The status window provides detailed information about map sense, titles, and teleport array. He thinks that the main focus now is on the Chaos God Killer Power Growth System. The system notifies him that he has a God Killing Element, and that using it will unleash 1% of its power. It asks if he wishes to use it. He reflects on how, originally, he needed to obtain God's Element Power to unleash that strength. Currently, he can only unleash 3% of the Chaos God Killing Power. Still, he needs to find the Kebli God's Palace and defeat the monster Nabus, so it's best for him to increase his strength. He starts to use the God Kill element, thinking it's just a 1% increase, yet this power feels like a bottomless sea. He recalls obtaining some items and checking the system, which notifies him that the Earth's ring is a high-level Earth elemental ring, and the Frost armor is high-level body armor, describing their details. He wears the Frost armor and Earth ring. He thinks now the only thing remaining is this key, and the last time he used a key, he got an egg with Luca in it. He wonders what it will be this time. The scene shifts. Bross informs Uncle Albert that he has already ensured the treatment of all the injured individuals and the repair of the barrier in all locations. Uncle Albert acknowledges this and inquires about tonight's ceremony. Bross responds that they just need to take care of a few small things, and the town should return to normal from tomorrow. He mentions that Ratchetler and Philoga woke up early in the morning to start preparing. He believes the arrangements should be mostly completed by that time. Additionally, he mentions that the two guardians, Hicks and Lucius, are locked up and being watched by Boban. However, the last one, Sarkia, escaped, and his current location is unknown. He inquires if Sarkia has escaped from the town and notes that Sarkia is strange. Bross responds that if Sarkia chooses to live outside the town, he won't be able to survive for long. He suggests that maybe, but he feels Sarkia has some secrets of his own, secrets that could make him more dangerous than Dora. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao sits in his room holding a key and wonders if it is a dungeon key. The system notifies him that the crimson red key, when the blood moon descends onto the world, a hero will rise to slaughter the evil and obtain endless power, it can be used to activate a dungeon, and he will be teleported to a designated dungeon. He will gain x3 experience in killing monsters, and he must kill the dungeon boss within the time limit to complete the mission. The rewards are random legendary rank equipment and notes that if his character dies in the dungeon, his real body will also die, and he is asked if he wishes to use it. He contemplates whether, if the character dies, his real body will also perish. He received a similar notification during Luca's punishment, and when he was killed by the Wandering Dominator before, the system did indeed notify that his character had died, but it did not mention anything about his real body. He wonders if his consciousness is trapped in the game, but if that's the case, he questions why his body appeared on the train. Growing frustrated, he reflects on whether that was just a dream, and he finds it challenging to discern what is real anymore. Just then, the old man arrives and inquires if Chen Jiliao is alright. He asks how he is feeling. He explains that it's just his phantom and expresses a desire to convey that it's not a dream. He genuinely left Latinea, even though he does not know how or why he came back again. 
Chen Jiliao asks for clarification, questioning whether he is saying he really left Latinea. The old man affirms, stating that he saw everything through him. He mentions the bald guy who was looking for him, suggesting that it seemed like he knew he would appear on the train. Then, he recalls hearing his mom's voice asking him to leave quickly. The old man responds that he did not hear any voice, but he acknowledges that he has never seen this type of teleportation method before. He emphasizes that no elemental power or god's power was involved, describing it as something he has never witnessed before. Chen Jiliao contemplates the possibility that if he truly left Latinea, there are only two scenarios. First, his consciousness may have never left the game, and it was Latinea that was transmigrated to the train station map. Second, he may have actually returned to reality, but he was unconscious during his time on the train, meaning that only his consciousness initially entered the game. He asserts that, regardless of the scenario, it all proves one thing, the world they are in is not real but a virtual one. And this leads him to question whether the bald man he saw could be the same person Zio May mentioned. He wonders if his mom is captured by them and seeks to understand the reason behind all this, why he is the only one teleported here. Angrily, he questions why this is happening. The old man advises him to remain calm. The system asks if he wishes to use the crimson red key and notifies him that if there is no response within 10 seconds, the system will automatically use it. He reassures, saying not to worry, he is fine, but he wants to ask if he has ever killed a true god before. He wonders if, upon recovering his full strength, he can defeat the strongest god in this world. After a moment of contemplation, he apologizes, stating that his brain is blank and he doesn't think he can answer these questions. However, he acknowledges that he should have killed a god before, as otherwise, why would he be locked up in that place? He states that he knows all gods fear the power of chaos elements, and he is confident that one day, he will be able to kill the strongest god. Chen Jilao agrees, emphasizing that what he needs to do now is keep getting stronger. He mentions that he should be able to activate the god-killing power now and those gods will start causing trouble for him soon, so he needs to be prepared. Chen Jilao asserts that it doesn't matter. He refuses to die here and is determined to leave this world, uncovering all the mysteries one by one. Since there's some time before the ceremony, he suggests grinding some more levels. Meanwhile, in the town, Ratchetler is cooking food and tells Sailily that she has asked this question ten times already, and everything is prepared. All they need to do is wait for Chen Jilao. Sailily responds by saying that even if she asks ten times if he messes up anything, she will punish him. Boban asks how he dares to annoy Sailily, and Ratchetler admits it's his fault. Grandpa Alber and Bross also sit there, and Bross mentions that he has not felt so comfortable since he came to Latinea. He must definitely enjoy tonight's ceremony. Alber agrees, stating that if Chen Jalal had not defeated Dorop, they do not know in what state they would be right now. Ross expresses his enduring belief that Chen Jilao would not lose, citing witnessing him killing the Beast King with his own eyes. He adds that the Beast King can't be compared to Dorop, the latter's power comes from Hades. Ross asks if he means the underworld god Hades. Just then, Chen Jilao arrives and remarks that it seems Bross is as lively as ever. He tells Grandpa Albert that he is glad to see he is alright. Everyone welcomes him. Albert suggests that since their hero is here now, they should begin tonight's ceremony. They all light up the fire and start calling him a hero. Sailily goes on stage and instructs everyone to calm down. She suggests inviting their hero, Chen Jilao, who saved their town, to give a speech. Grandpa Albert tells him to go, as everyone is waiting for him. He asks if Chen Jilao is nervous about speaking in front of everyone. Chen Jilao responds that it's not nerves, he just doesn't think he is a hero. According to him, the town was saved because of everyone's efforts, including Grandpa Albert, Bross, Philoga, Boban, and all the people who fought to protect the town, each one a hero. He emphasizes that without their help, he could not have defeated Dorop. He states that he can't take all the credit for himself and everyone should be praised as heroes. Albert advises him not to minimize his own efforts, emphasizing that everyone knows if it weren't for him, everyone in the town would have died. Furthermore, Albert adds that the town desperately needs a hero, a ray of hope to cling to, and Chen Jilao embodies that hope. Ratchetler and Bross express their belief in him. Albert encourages him to go, give the people hope, be their light, and lead everyone out of this challenging situation. He goes on stage and reflects on Grandpa Albert's words, realizing that the townsfolk have just experienced a small-scale war. He acknowledges the need for someone they can rely on, and since they see him as a hero, he must become much stronger to protect them all. Chen Jilao acknowledges that being a hero is not easy, but it does feel good to be praised. The crowd cheers for him, 
Chen Jilao addresses the people of Delk Town, introducing himself. He admits uncertainty about whether he is a hero, but he knows one thing for certain, they will leave this place. He promises that if they believe in him, he will bring every one of them out of Latinea. Meanwhile, Argalis emerges from the boat and instructs Cecil to stay and wait for him, assuring him that he will be back soon. Cecil responds with an understanding nod. Argalis comments that even after hundreds of years, the weather in the area is still poor. He suggests finding out what exactly happened to Sunil, and identifying who in the vicinity is strong enough to have killed him. He then transforms into a dragon. Simultaneously, Chen Jilao sits on the rooftop. Bross and Bobin join him, with Bross complimenting his speech, expressing surprise at his ability to remain calm and composed while speaking in front of so many people. Bobin adds that anyone can speak fancy words, but they don't mean anything unless he can back them up with actions. Chen Jilao remarks that if it were up to Bobin, everyone would be angry and sulking all the time, and he inquires about the whereabouts of Grandpa Albert and Salili. Bobin asks who is angry and sulking. Ross responds, All right, calm down and let's not argue over small things at such a time. He explains that Grandpa Albert drank a lot, so Salili took him home, and Philoga brought food to Lucius and the other prisoners. Ross then asks if Grandpa Albert told him anything about their next step, specifically when they are going to the God Palace. Chen Jilao replies that not yet, but before they set out, he wants to increase his combat ability further and become much stronger. Otherwise, even if they find the God Palace, they won't be able to defeat the Guardian Beast there. He explains that, from what he knows, compared to that Guardian Beast, Dorop should only be a weakling. Therefore, if they want to get past it, they need to become much stronger than they are now. Chen Jilao jumps from there and announces that he is going to rest, advising the others to sleep early. Ross comments that he is getting more and more mysterious. After a while, Chen Jilao reaches the mountaintop and checks his status window. He thinks that after defeating Dorop, his hidden level reacher is 78, and now, he has 41 levels to use, along with 65 undistributed attribute points. Considering the upgraded obliterate skill, which reduces all other skills' cooldown times but consumes a lot of MP, he decides to increase MP's related attribute. Wisdom and wearing Earth's ring further increases his wisdom by 30. Chen Jilao then opts to increase wisdom by 15 and split the remaining points towards strength and agility, allocating 25 points to each. He clicks on confirm. Chen Jilao reflects that he still does not have a weapon, and after unlocking the weapon store, he will only have 11 levels to use. He concludes by saying that he will see if he can find a decent weapon within his budget. The system notifies him that he used 30 levels to unlock the weapon store. As he examines the items on the status window, he remarks that this gold tier glory light is not bad, but it costs 40 levels, and it still can't be compared to Ozil, though. The status screen then provides details about the elite Karthus magic sword. He notes that it doesn't have any special attributes, but the MP recovery effect suits him, so he decides to get it. The system notifies him that he used 10 levels to exchange for the elite Karthus magic sword. Chen Jiliao comments, not bad and now it's time to challenge the dungeon. He takes out the key, and the system asks if he wishes to use the crimson red key. He responds with yes, and the teleport portal gate opens in front of him. The system notifies him to check his equipment and consumables and go through the teleport portal, stating that the mission will begin in 5 seconds. The countdown begins, and he takes his sword entering the portal. The system notifies that he has successfully entered the crimson red dungeon, and Bay CT's endless slaughter covers the whole land in blood turning it into a river and changing the moon in the sky. He wonders why this name sounds familiar. The system notifies him to find the evil Bay CT before the moon sets and defeats it. The mission reward is a random legendary weapon or equipment, a purple moon key, and 10 million experience. He contemplates the generosity of the reward, a legendary weapon and 10 million experience. After leveling up, he believes he can purchase better items from the store, however, he needs to find this Bay CT before Moonset, and he ponders where he should start the search. Recognizing that this place lacks markings or signs, he is unsure of the direction in which to proceed and concerned that searching without a plan will lead to getting lost before finding Bay CT, he realizes that the moon will set. He acknowledges the need to locate Bay CT before Moonset, and decides that he knows where to find him. To him, it seems like a riddle and the phrase before Moonset not only indicates the time but also hints at Bay CT's location. After a while, large monsters come into view, and the system notifies him that Bay CT's undead spirit beast is at level 60. 
he finds himself surrounded by monsters. Observing the level 60 undead spirit beasts, he remarks that there are quite a number of them. In the past, dealing with them would have been tough. He begins to attack the monsters, swiftly eliminating them and reflects that they are all just free experiences. Meanwhile, Argalis finds himself in the beast's den and states that Sunil has indeed been killed. And even though Sunil lacks godly powers, Argalis asserts that he should not have been killed so easily. He detects a pervasive scent of bugs in the air and wonders if it could be him. He then dismisses the idea, deeming it impossible, as he believes that he should have been killed a long time ago. Upon observing the corpses of the monsters, he contemplates whether the alleged perpetrator did not perish, and is now concealing himself among the swarm of bugs. Meanwhile, in Delk Town, Alber sits and reads a book. He asserts that the sealing of the evil god Murius is not the end of the story, but the start of everything. He explains that the appearance of Hesiod and his absolute power instilled fear in the gods about humans. Referring to what goddess Jephon saw in the Book of Prophecy, Albert states that a god killer will emerge among humans to judge the gods, and then the world will reset. And gods upset that humans create their own power that could threaten them will retaliate by slaughtering and killing humans. The oppressed humans will eventually resist and fight back. Albert believes that after the fight with Dorop, there is no doubt that Chen Zhilao is the god killer who will lead humanity to defeat the gods. He wonders if humans and gods will really go to war. Hearing a voice, he looks out of the window, considering if the barrier is under attack. He observes a fireball falling into a place and exploding. Angered, he realizes it is Argolis and declares that it's him who killed Morse and Luna. Argolis inquires if he is the guardian of this place and demands to know the whereabouts of the man who killed Sunil. He promises a painless death if the information is provided. Meanwhile, Chen Zhilao engages in combat with the monsters, utilizing blessings. The system notifies that Elite Karthus's magic sword burn inflicts an additional 300 horsepower of damage, resulting in the elimination of Bay CT's undead spirit beasts X3 and the acquisition of 30,000 experience points. He remarks that if only Annihilation Slash could also stack passively, he would have unlimited MP. As the monster approaches to attack, he jumps and decides to give it a try, stating that at least it's better than nothing. Employing the Annihilation Slash, he attacks the monster and earns points. Chen Zhilao notes that, as expected, the MP he used quickly recovered, alleviating any concerns about MP, and it significantly enhances the efficiency of the hunt. The system notifies him that he has successfully defeated Bay CT's undead spirit beast. After eliminating all the monsters, the status window informs him of the experience points gained. He observes that the experience required for leveling up has now reached 500,000. And no wonder, he reflects, he hasn't leveled up even after eliminating numerous undead spirit beasts. He comments that if the experience continues to increase at this rate, even 10 million experience won't contribute much to his leveling up. The system notifies him about his weapon's current durability, which is at 93% and points out that once the durability reaches 0%, the weapon will be destroyed. Reflecting on this, he realizes he almost forgot about the weapon's durability. He notes that this sword gets damaged too quickly, he hasn't even fought 30 undead spirit beasts, and its durability is already down by 7%. He acknowledges that he can still battle the monsters without it, but it's challenging to avoid using it. During the time he had to choose professional skills, he recalls there was a skill called Holy Light that could increase a weapon's durability, but its damage was too low. Consequently, he didn't choose it and wonders if he will acquire stronger skills as his level increases. He hears Luca's voice and acknowledges that Luca has woken up. He thinks to bring him out and clicks to activate. Luca emerges and hugs him. He affirms that he knows Luca misses him too much. He reassures Luca, stating that it's fine now as he has defeated Dorop, and they are safe. However, he notes that he hasn't thanked Luca yet. Expressing gratitude, he thanks Luca for saving him and Grandpa Albert. Luca jumps with excitement and returns to Chen Zhiliao. Chen Zhiliao asks if Luca is inquiring about their current location and explains that they are in a dungeon for a mission. They need to find the boss and quickly eliminate it, so he urges Luca to go without falling behind. They both start running. The scene then shifts to the real world in S-City, in the emergency department. A patient is in a critical state and the doctor observes that his heartbeat is too weak. The doctor quickly injects epinephrine and prepares aid. They take the patient into the operating room and attempt to save him, but the doctor sadly announces that there is no more heartbeat. Meanwhile, Chief Su watches the news on TV. A man with glasses reports that this is the 3,000th person to die of cardiac arrest this month. 
All these individuals are around 20-year-old males, and the reason for the cardiac arrest is unknown. Even after the pathological autopsy, no problems are found. Chief Su inquires if they have anything in common, such as attending the same schools or living in the same areas. The man responds that these people have no real-life relationships or connections. However, according to their investigation, they all played a game called Cosmos. Chief Su observes that all these people played the same game and died, indicating more than just a coincidence. Additionally, she notes there's another case related to Cosmos. He plays Chen Jilao's mother's video on the screen and states that last month, a woman visited the West Area Police Station to report that her son, Chen Jilao, went missing while playing the same game, Cosmos. Initially, they didn't pay much attention to it. But last week, someone uploaded a video where a young man suddenly appeared on a train out of nowhere, and then disappeared. The video quickly went viral on TikTok. After examining the case file, they can now confirm that the young man in the video is Chen Jilao. He asks how they should proceed with this case now. She advises him to first take down the video and control the discussions surrounding it, ensuring it does not cause panic in the public. Next, she instructs him to get in touch with the management of Cosmos to see if they can find any additional information. If there is any progress, she requests that he inform her right away. He agrees, stating that he will get on it. Meanwhile, in Delk Town, Argolis inquires of Alber whether he is deaf. He moves to attack him, but Argolis blocks and throws him away. Boban arrives and asks if he is alright. Albert questions why Boban came there and advises him to leave quickly, as he is no match for Argolis. Boban reassures him, stating not to worry, as he did not come alone. He came with Lucius and Hicks. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao remarks that the closer they get to the moonlight, the more of these death spirit beasts appear, and their level is also much higher than those he killed before. To prevent the weapon's durability from dropping too quickly, he stops using Annihilation Slash and switches to normal attacks to deal with them. However, it takes a while to kill them this way, and if it continues, he won't have enough time to defeat the boss. Monsters come to attack Chen Jilao, but Luka intervenes, attacking and killing them. Chen Jilao compliments Luka, stating that he is quite impressive. Observing many monsters ahead, he acknowledges that he should deal with these death spirit beasts quickly. He can't waste any more time. Meanwhile, Albert and Argolis engage in conversation, drawing the attention of town citizens who come out of their houses to see them. A man in a blue shirt questions what's happening and speculates if demon beasts are attacking again, expressing a bad feeling about it. Argolis dismisses the situation, calling them just a bunch of weak bugs. However, he expresses his unwillingness to waste time there and demands to be told where the person who killed Sunil is, emphasizing that his patience has limits. Boban responds defiantly, stating that he doesn't care about what Argolis wants and asserts that the town is under their protection. He warns Argolis to leave now. Argolis approaches, ready to attack and states that mere human trash always overestimates themselves. But Albert intervenes and gets injured in the process. Boban questions why he did that, to which Albert insists that he is fine and urges everyone to leave the area quickly, emphasizing that none of them is a match for Argolis. Frustrated, Boban exclaims, if he is serious, who is he? Albert reveals that he's not a human but someone from the underworld. Neither god Hades is underling nor dragon Argolis. Argolis tastes Albert's blood from his hand and remarks that the blood tastes familiar. He wonders where he has tasted it before. Albert reveals that he is the one who killed Sailili's parents, emphasizing that their elemental powers are useless against him. He offers to stall him, advising him to take the chance and leave quickly. Argolis dismisses the idea, stating that he's consumed too much of his trash to remember. He declares that once he tastes fresh blood, he won't let any prey leave alive. Lucius summons her beast, a monster with a sword, and apologizes to Albert, stating that they are not leaving, whether he likes it or not, as they are the guardians of the village, and there is no way they are running away. Boban asserts that since this man killed Sailili's parents, whether he is human or a god, he won't be forgiven. He suggests to Grandpa Albert that if they attack him together, they can definitely defeat him. Albert agrees, stating, All right, since it has come to this, let's go all out and attack him together. Argolis dismisses them as foolish bugs. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, Chen Jilao kills the monster, and the system notifies him that he has leveled up. He asks Luca if he is all right and suggests resting for a while. Reflecting on the situation, he notes that even after killing many death spirit beasts, he only leveled up once. Additionally, the weapon's durability is almost at its limit. With his current stats and skills, he is strong in 1v1 duels, but grinding multiple monsters at once is lacking. He thinks at the time of choosing skills, he could only pick two out of three. 
he chose skills with more damage despite Holy Light having lesser but fixed damage. However, Holy Light is an AoE skill that can reduce the rate at which a weapon's durability decreases. He expresses the wish that he could choose another profession to obtain better and stronger skills. He questions why he could only choose two skills and not all three. The system notifies that when a player's hidden level reaches level 100, a new skill slot will be unlocked. Chen Jilao thinks that he will get a new skill slot at level 100, which means he can unlock it after defeating Bay CT. He decides to speed up the process, defeat Bay CT, and acquire the new weapon and equipment. And with the new skill slot, fighting the God Palace's Nabus will be much easier. He tells Luka to get going. An elite monster appears in front of him, and Chen Jilao wonders if this is Bay CT. He comments that it's just another big kitty and advises Luca to be careful and not get killed, as it would result in his own demise, too. Luca replies in his language, and he acknowledges that he knows Luca is strong but emphasizes the importance of being careful. He then says, let's go finish this. Meanwhile, in B-City, the news reports that for the past few days, several death cases with unknown causes have been reported globally. Some speculate that there has been a deadly virus outbreak, which the government is trying to hide. Others suggest it is related to nuclear contamination. However, a rumor gaining major traction is that these cases are connected to Cosmos, the latest metaverse game. The news reporter Liu Yao Yao states that people are currently protesting against the game company and requesting the government to investigate and provide an explanation. Today afternoon, their government invited Country K, Country J, Country A, Country Y, and many other countries for an emergency conference to address these deaths. They have been told they will be given an explanation for these special death cases in tonight's press conference. Just then, a boy falls unconscious, and someone calls for an ambulance. The news reporter identifies herself as Lu Yaoya from Neo TV, continuing to bring all the latest updates. Meanwhile, in a conference, Lai Yuman, a medical specialist, states that all the the victims of these death cases had been thoroughly examined by various medical experts. However, there were no traces of a virus or any signs of poisoning, and during the autopsy, they discovered something unexpected. Lai Yuman explains that these victims did not die due to heart failure, as initially believed. Instead, what they found was something illogical and much more complicated, and it appears that the victims' organs were damaged by some sort of sharp weapon or the like. He expresses his belief that these victims were killed by the illusions produced by their own brains. He shares that he is currently part of a brain dish project in Europe. In this project, a small amount of brain matter is placed into a Petri dish for research purposes. They use electric signals to excite and teach these brains to play simple games, discovering that these brain tissues learn much faster than the AI they created. He suggests that they might say these things are not related. But he believes this research and what is happening now are all pointing towards one thing, there is a chance that the world they are living in might not be real. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, an explosion occurs, throwing Chen Jiliao and Luka away. They quickly get up. Chen Jiliao wonders why he could not avoid that explosion, realizing that he used an annihilation slash to dodge. But it seemed like it locked onto him. The system notifies that Bay CT's attacks have a mark effect and after being marked by the Death Spirit's imprint, the attacks will lock onto the target. Chen Jilao reflects on this, understanding that's why it did not attack immediately and waited until he got close to locking him with the Death Spirit imprint, and Bay CT then used explosions to deal damage, which is a critical blow for someone like him who uses close combat. He contemplates what he should do next. Another explosion occurs, prompting Chen Jilao to run from the area. He observes that the summoned Death Spirit's speed has also increased. He advises Luca to be careful, noting that the summoned death spirits have become faster. Bay CT approaches to attack them, but Luca's protection shield saves them from the attack. He uses the Annihilation Slash to counter-attack. He asks Luca if he is alright and contemplates that he can only rely on Luca's protection and find a chance to get close to attack. However, this will greatly exhaust Luca's energy, and Bay CT's movement speed is increasing. He is concerned that if he activates Obliterate and cannot kill Bay CT, the skill of going into a long cooldown would put them in an even worse situation. However, Luca is already too tired, and he can't put more pressure on him. He realizes that, in addition to facing Bay CT, he needs to dodge the Death Spirit's attacks as well. He wonders what he should do now, recalling a long-range sword technique he practiced with his uncle. And if he can use that technique, he believes he can defeat Bay CT. He calls out to the old man, asking if he is there and expressing the need for his help to defeat Bay CT. 
He questions if he can hear him, speculating that the inability to communicate might be due to being in the middle of a mission. He points out that even when he went back to reality, the old man was still with him. The system notifies that there are 30 minutes remaining for the mission. Realizing he doesn't have much time left, Chen Zhiliao considers whether he has to give up on the 10 million experience points in the legendary weapon. Bei CT's monster approaches to attack, but he moves back. He contemplates that if he can't defeat a dungeon boss, he won't stand a chance against God Palace's Nabus. Simultaneously, Luca protects himself from monsters. Chen Zhilao refuses to give up, believing there must be a way to defeat Bei CT. As Bei CT comes to attack again, Chen Zhilao notes that its speed has increased once more. He attacks Bei CT's monster, causing an explosion that throws him away, and Chen Zhilao is badly injured. The system issues a warning, indicating that his HP is lower than 10%, and advises recovering his HP. He reflects that unleashing the skill completely drained his energy, rendering him unable to move. Fortunately, it is finally over, and he successfully kills the Bay CT monster. The system notifies him that he has killed the evil Bay CT, completing the Crimson Moon mission. At that moment, a huge light emanates from the dead monster towards the moon. Chen Jilao warns Luca to be careful. The moonlight shines on Chen Jilao, and the system notifies him that he has obtained 2 million experience points and 10 million experience points. He has leveled up, and his hidden level has reached level 100. Sensing an energy around himself, he acknowledges that this is the experience, and it feels amazing. Leveling up also brings a healing effect as his body's wounds start to recover. Additionally, he unlocks his third skill. The status screen reveals the new skill, Execute the Gods. Once the attack is unleashed, it will mark the target for 30 seconds and ignore stealth and other defensive stats. When the skill is used again, it will unleash three normal attacks towards the target, causing 300% explosive damage. The cooldown time is 4 minutes. He contemplates that the skill is similar to Bay CT's skill, and combined with Annihilation Slash, it will cause great damage. Now, he needs to distribute his attribute points and then head to the God Palace to challenge Nabus. The system notifies him that he has obtained the Violet Moon Key, a legendary chest, and a God Element. He wonders if he obtained another God Element by defeating Bay CT, this is unexpected. He speculates that the Violet Moon Key might open another dungeon, like a Crimson Red Key. Examining the chest, he remarks that he had a bad experience before. Looking at Luca, he jokes and says he is just kidding. He wonders if the chest contains legendary equipment or a weapon. He opens a chest, and the system notifies him, congratulations. He obtained the legendary equipment set, and this set includes the Cape of Fortune, which increases his chance of obtaining magic equipment by 20%, and Autumn's Nether Spirit Song Earrings. Impressed, he notes that, as expected of legendary equipment, it provides not only a wisdom attribute buff but also an 8% dodge effect. With this, he can add more points to strength and agility, However, he realizes he doesn't have his ears pierced, so he simply pushes the earring against his ear. Pressing the equip button on the status window, the earring fits into his ear along with all the other equipment. The system notifies that the mission has ended, and the teleport gate has been opened, with the countdown beginning. He tells Luca, let's go, it's time to head to the God Palace. They come out from the dungeon. Chen Jileo remarks that he finally came back and questions why it is so quiet. He wonders if time was stopped when he was in the dungeon. To his surprise, he sees the town in this state. He observes that everything is destroyed in the town. Entering a house, he discovers Grandpa Albert in an unconscious state, with his arms cut. Saluli, Bross, and Ratchetler stand nearby. Disturbed, he inquires about who did this to Grandpa, expressing that he had only left for the night. He questions what happened in his absence. However, they remain silent, directing his question to Ratchetler. He seeks a detailed account of what occurred while he was away. Ratchetler explains that he went missing for three days, and they thought he had abandoned them. Seeking further clarification, he asks what he said. Bobin enters the room, asserting that it's time to stop acting dumb. He points out that the promise was to protect everyone, yet he was nowhere to be found when they needed him. Bobin emphasizes that Grandpa Albert's condition and the deaths of thousands in the town resulted from his absence. He demands that he better tell them who he is and why that guy came all the way there just to find him. Meanwhile, in B-City's Public Security Bureau, a lady officer warns that if the two continue to spout nonsense, she will have to lock them up for wasting their time. The blue shirt man insists that what they said is true. A male officer arrives and inquires about the situation. The lady officer explains that these two are claiming they were attacked by a monster. He confirms that it's true and describes the experience as truly terrifying. 
He recounts that a girl came and used her sword to kill the monster. The male officer, after hearing their story, takes them away, stating they can't stay there or they will be locked up for disturbing the officers. They plead, asking to be believed. Just then, the lady officer receives a call from the chief. She answers the call and learns about an unknown creature. She assures the chief that she will gather everyone and wait for further orders. The male officer asks what's wrong. She reveals that the chief said they are declaring an emergency evacuation of B-City as many unknown creatures have been spotted across the city. Meanwhile, Boban questions Chen Jilao about why he is not speaking and if he thinks he will be let off if he stays silent. He further asks if Chen Jilao knew that the man would come for him and if that's why he disappeared at the right time. Accusing him of being a selfish coward who is afraid of dying, Boban becomes angrier and demands to know why Chen Jilao is not saying anything, threatening to punch him. Chen Jilao holds his hand, apologizing, stating that he was not there when he should have been. He admits that he did not know someone would come there so quickly, but regardless, he caused all of this and is willing to shoulder the responsibility. He asserts that he will find the person responsible and kill him. Ross intervenes, expressing doubt, saying it's impossible because the guy they're talking about is not someone they can defeat. He is too strong. However, he is curious about why someone like that would come for Chen Jilao. Chen Jilao explains that he possesses the power to kill gods, which was revealed in his battle with the Guardian Dorop. He and Grandpa Albert discovered that elemental attacks couldn't harm Dorop at all, as he had sacrificed his soul in exchange for power from the god of the netherworld, Hades. The others are shocked. Chen Jilao reveals that the element he awakened is the power to kill gods, the chaos element. Consequently, when he killed Dorop, Hades should have sensed it. Meanwhile, Argolis checks the ground, contemplating if this is the right place. Observing a magic portal on the ground, he identifies it as the palace where Lord Hades sealed the god killer. Entering the portal, he encounters a palace in front of him and expresses his belief that this is it. On the other side, Chen Jilao contemplates whether this is really a game world, as everything feels real yet unreal. He acknowledges that sight, hearing, smell, taste, and even touch can be replicated to trick the brain. However, as a human, he emphasizes that his instincts and feelings are real and he possesses consciousness. He experiences emotions like happiness, sadness, anger, and fear, something that distinguishes humans from robots. Reflecting on Grandpa Albert's loss of both arms and the deaths caused by it, Chen Jilao admits that even if he tells himself that none of this is real, he can't seem to shake it off his mind. Before leaving, he resolves to find the man responsible and take revenge for Grandpa Albert and those who died. Contemplating a visit to the medicine store, he wonders if there's something that can heal Grandpa Albert, and if it's a high-level medicine it should be able to restore his arms. The status window notifies him about a medicine called Asclepius Protection, which costs 10 levels. Created by the god Dr. Asclepius, this godly medicine can immediately restore damaged body parts. Chen Jilao thinks this is it and great, giving this medicine to Grandpa Albert should heal him. He senses some strange movement aside and looks in that direction. He wonders what happened there, feeling the ground vibrating under his feet. To generate such a large amount of energy in an instant is quite remarkable. The stats screen notifies him that the attention to the Kebli God Palace has been activated. Chen Jilao notes that the Kebli God Palace is now activated, explaining the surge of energy. He speculates that it must be that guy who activated it, if he is not mistaken. Meanwhile, Argolis enters the Kebli God Palace, stating that if it were not for Lord Hades instructing him to come here, he would have refused even if it were Zeus's order and Lord Hades wanted him to check the seal's power before leaving, but never mention the name of the god sealed here. As he inspects the seal, he notes that this is an exiled god palace, and since Latinia placed such a large seal on it, it must be a god that Lord Hades is afraid of. Observing a room in front, he speculates that it should be the sealed throne room, and inside, there should be the god beast that protects the seal. He performs some magic to break the seal. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao wonders why he went to the Kebli God Palace, knowing that gods can sense the chaos element's power, and if that guy comes to find him again, everyone remaining here will be in danger. He asks the old man how the gods sense his presence and if there's any way to prevent it. The old man arrives and explains that when he first used Chaos Elemental Power, it reformed his aura, leaving traces that only a god can sense. These aura traces, unless he dies, cannot be hidden or erased. He emphasizes that if he wants to obtain strong power, he has to pay a price for it and cannot hide, and he can only either kill those who want to kill him or accept his death. Chen Jileao contemplates that before more gods come to kill him, he has to head to the god palace, remove the desert seal, 
and bring everyone out of this place. He believes that is the only thing he can do for his friends. After a while, he enters Grandpa Albert's room, contemplating that Boban is right. He is the reason for everything that happened, bringing disaster to the town. Sitting near Grandpa Albert, he acknowledges that he doesn't know how many innocent people in the town died because of him. He expresses his apologies, stating that he is sorry. Just then, Ratchetler enters the room and inquires about when he arrived. He responds that he came just a while back and asks where he went. Ratchetler explains that Salili told him to find some medicine, and though he couldn't find much, he hopes what he brought could help. He advises not to blame Boban and Salili, acknowledging that with something so significant happening to Uncle and the town, everyone is feeling sadness. Chen Jiliao hands over a bottle and instructs them to feed the medicine to Grandpa Albert before heading to leave the room. Ratchetler questions his destination, and he responds that he's just going to take care of Grandpa Albert and the others. Upon exiting, he contemplates that he lacks the power to revert everything to its original state. Still, he is determined to do everything within his capability to protect what remains. He apologizes to everyone, asking for forgiveness for leaving without bidding farewell, but he believes it's for the best. He swiftly departs, thinking that if he hurries, he might encounter that guy. Meanwhile, numerous monsters invade the real world, attacking people who cry out for help. Clan leader Kin arrives on the scene, and her system notifies her that this is currently the strongest monster encountered, possibly even an S rank. Three heroes around level 120 are rushing to her location, and the system advises her to wait for their arrival as facing such a monster alone is too dangerous, even for her. She acknowledges the information and orders to inform the heroes to head to S City immediately, leaving the area. The system insists she should wait for at least one hero. Despite this, she moves to attack and mentions that there are three monsters with similar levels in the East Senior S City, and they must stop them before reaching the city. As she engages the monster, she reflects that the connection between the two worlds seems faster than they estimated. The news reports that simultaneously, numerous monsters have been appearing all around the world, causing chaos and destroying everything in sight. Humanity's nuclear weapons prove useless against them, marking the fall of human society and pushing them into an existential crisis. Meanwhile, the system notifies Chen Jilao that he has been traveling for 3 hours and 28 minutes and has 8 hours and 37 minutes left to reach the destination. He inquires if he still needs to walk for so long and mentions that even though he can use the teleport array, he doesn't know where to teleport to. The old man suggests that if he had a dragon as a mount, he could save time. Chen Jiliao asks where he can find a dragon now and dismisses the suggestion as useless. He looks at Luca and realizes he can fly, asking why he doesn't carry him for a while. They both laugh, and he mentions he was just joking. Just then, he sees a monster in front, sitting and eating something. He thinks it's the guy who killed him when he first entered Latinea, and the system's detection sensor did not notify him that a monster had appeared. The monster also looks at him and says it smells familiar. Chen Jilao thinks he sees the system as unable to detect creatures of this rank. In that case, his plan to depend on the system to forewarn him of any high-ranking monsters so that he can avoid them won't work. Should he encounter any, he will have no choice but to fight. The system notifies a warning that an elite monster has been encountered, a wandering dominator, and the level is unknown. He says they meet again. The wandering dominator monster says he is that bug he killed, and he is still alive. He says thanks to him, not only is he alive, but he is also doing very well. He moves to attack him and says, then he will just have to kill him once more. Chen Jilao steps back and goes to attack, throwing the wandering dominator away. He asks if he thinks he is still that weakling who only knows how to hack and slash. Taking his sword, he declares that he is now someone who can kill even gods, a god slayer. The wandering dominator monster gets angry, uses all his powers, and declares that, in that case, he will just cut him to pieces. The system notifies him that the wandering dominator monster has used the skilled dominator's sickle attack, and power has increased by 30%. He says that should be that shithead's elemental power. The old man advises him to be cautious, as being capable of manipulating elemental power to such a high degree, he must be careful of him. Chen Jiliao agrees, acknowledging that back then, all his stats had been increased by 100 points, but he still managed to kill him so easily which alone is enough to prove his capabilities. He thinks he is now at level 100 after killing the beast, and his weapon and equipment are also the best he has had so far. If he still can't kill him, he can forget about the temple. This battle is a critical test of whether he will be able to leave this place or not. 
he moves to attack, but the monster disappears and reappears behind him, saying he is still as slow as ever. Chen Jilao uses a sacred slash and attacks him. The wandering dominator monster is shocked to see his attack and asks how this is possible. The system notifies that his weapon's durability is at less than 70%. He thinks his weapon's durability is dropping too quickly, and he must end this immediately. He attacks, surprised to see the monster does not counterattack. He wonders why he did not dodge. The wandering dominator monster kneels down and says it's impossible, there is no way. He tells him not to tell him if he is the master. Meanwhile, Chief Su informs Jia Wusen, the cosmos's chief executive officer, that tons of unidentified creatures have suddenly appeared in the northern waters of the Pacific Ocean. Country J and Country H's joint squad is already on their way there, and troops from Country A, which lies to its east, have also departed from Hawaii. She requests him to explain why the cosmos's monsters are appearing in the real world. He apologizes, stating that they are just a game company, and that the monsters in the game are merely bits of code that they have written. And as for why these monsters are appearing in the real world, he doesn't believe he is the one she should be asking. She states that she is now representing Country C's Special Law Enforcement Department to request that he shut down Cosmos's operations at once and accept their investigation. He responds, stating that the game's servers are all in Europe, and neither Country A nor Country C has the authority to investigate them. He moves to leave, mentioning he has other obligations, so he will be taking his leave. Before leaving, he adds that there's something he'd like to tell her. The monsters they have designed are not based on pure imagination, and they have all been modeled after the ancient legends of countries all over the world. Therefore, the target of her investigations should not be him, but rather those ancient legends. She wonders if he is trying to say that those ancient legends are all real. Meanwhile, Lai Zian Qian, Baling Dafu, and Bruce encounter 3S rank monsters. Baling Dafu remarks that it's his first time seeing 3S rank monsters gathered together. Lai Zian Qian agrees, recalling the last time they dealt with just 1S rank monster. It required 4 level 80 elite heroes and 2 level 120 heroes. Bruce adds that, indeed, they won't be able to win with just the 3 of them and S rank heroes alone and President Kin mentioned they only have to stall these monsters, and reinforcements have already been called for. Baling Dafu suggests preparing themselves for battle. They are all shocked to see a big monster also arrive. Baling Dafu wonders about the kind of land beyond that entrance and questions if it is an SS rank monster. Meanwhile, Chen Jilao asks what the hell he is talking about. The wandering dominator monster explains that what he just used was his master's power. He gets up, Chen Jileo moves back and demands an explanation about what he means by master's power and what he is trying to pull. He wonders why his master's power is inside a bug's body and what happened. Chen Jilao asks the old man if he is the master this guy is talking about. The old man responds that he has lost all his memories, and even if he is, he can't remember at all. He wonders if his uncle could be the master and asks if his master is a middle-aged man with silver hair. He denies it, stating that the master is no human being but their highest supreme god, Ra. Chen Jilao is surprised, thinking if Ra is not the head of the Egyptian pantheon of nine deities. He clarifies that whoever he is, if the master's power is within him, then he is now his master. Chen Jilao checks the status window, and the system notifies that a new divinity database has been discovered, Ra's sole subordinate, Scarab god, Kepri. The wandering dominator monster pleads for Chen Jilao to accept him. The system then asks if he will accept Kepri as his mercenary soul subordinate. Chen Jilao thinks about Kepri as the main character of his mission, Kepri's revenge, and despite not liking him much, having him on his side would make it easier to defeat the temple's boss, Nablus. Considering this, he decides to accept. The system notifies him that he has accepted Kepri as his soul subordinate. He can use Kepri's skill during battle to summon him to fight alongside him. Soul subordinates won't use any MP and there is no limit to how long they can stay in battle. Chen Jilao wonders if soul subordinates are that powerful. Does it mean he won't have to fight anymore if he gathers more of them? The system notifies that after attaining a soul subordinate, each one will take 30% of any experience he gains as their own. Additionally, if a soul subordinate dies in battle, they won't be revived, and he will lose that soul subordinate permanently. He realizes that things won't be as easy as he thought. Having more soul subordinates means more experience will be taken away from him, and plus, if they die, it would mean the experience given to them would have been all for nothing. He thinks these are the only things to think about in the future. Now that he has Kepri's help, his chances of beating Nablus are greater. The status window notifies that he has used the soul subordinate skill. 
He asks Kepri to share everything he knows. Meanwhile, on Earth, the Glasses Man informs Chief Su that HQ has called, stating unidentified monsters have appeared in many cities worldwide, and HQ wants her to set off to B-City immediately to discuss countermeasures. She acknowledges and instructs him to inform the others to prepare for the flight in 15 minutes. He complies. Zhao Zhengi, the head of the Special Affairs Department, displays a photo and states that this is a recording sent by H-City and in it, a mysterious woman is seen killing that monster. She takes the phone to view it. He mentions that the Maritime Patrol in S-City has also sent a recording, revealing three monsters larger than the others and more notably, three people are currently holding back those three monsters. He adds that upon receiving these recordings, he promptly forwarded them to the experts in B-City. After making some comparisons, they replied, stating that these monsters are all from a game called Cosmos. What's even more shocking is that they are monsters recorded in the Legends of Country R. She recalls Jia Wusen's words, emphasizing that what she needs to investigate is not him but those ancient legends. Meanwhile, in the East China Sea, Lai Xiankian binds the monster with chains and declares that he has restrained the SS rank monster. He urgently instructs Baoling Dafu and Bruce to swiftly eliminate the two S rank monsters. Baoling Dafu and Bruce acknowledge the command and proceed to attack the monsters. However, Lai Xiankian loses his grip on the SS rank monster and it starts dragging him. Simultaneously, another monster approaches to attack Baoling Dafu and Bruce. The SS rank monster leaps into the sea with Lai Xiankian. They manage to rescue him, but Bruce expresses concern, stating that it's impossible to fend off the SS rank monster. He questions the absence of Chairman Kin's reinforcements. Baoling Dafu emphasizes that they cannot allow the monsters to enter S-City. Chief Fuhai Jiusi arrives on the scene and assures them to leave it to him. He attacks the monster using Moon of Snow's spatial cleave and freezes them. Meanwhile, Kepi states that they will have to start from tens of thousands of years ago, before the appearance of the god of evil Morpheus and after the Battle of the Titans. The three brothers Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon were dissatisfied with how humans worshipped Luther's gods. Consequently, they summoned Morpheus from the Abyss of Hell, Tartarus, to punish the humans. However, their actions displeased gods from other beliefs, such as Ra, Buddha, Heavenly Father, and Izanami. Despite this, because no one wanted to wage war among gods over humans, they all chose to turn a blind eye. He continues, stating that the ambitions of the three brothers did not end there. Hades deceived Buddha and imprisoned Ra, the Heavenly Father, Izanami, and their factions in the jails of Latinea, Gixu, and Tartarus. He mentions that he spent tens of thousands of years crossing the boundless sea to finally arrive at Latinea, all for the sake of seeking Ra. Chen Jiliao asks why Hades brought humans into Latinea. He states that in the eyes of the god, humans are merely food, and they are no different from the bugs on the ground, and their only purpose is to feed the monsters that guard this place. Chen Jiliao thinks that the mystery of Latinea has finally been revealed, however, more questions have arisen. He wonders why Kepi said that he senses Ra's power from him. He wonders if this could have something to do with his chaos elemental power, or if he has some kind of connection with Ra. He believes that if he wants answers, he has no choice but to find Ra and ask him himself. Chen Jiliao decides that the temple is still a long way away, so they should hurry. Kepi suggests that this can help them get there quicker by transforming into insects. The system notifies that Kepi can transform into a form capable of flight, and this form will cost Hu's master 10 MP per 10 kilometers. Chen Jiliao acknowledges that he can transform into something like this, and the mana cost is not too much, either. He says, please get on. They sit on him, and he says, let's head out, and they will go save Ra. Meanwhile, in the real world, Chief Fuhai Jiusi informs President Kin that the situation is spiraling out of control, and if they still can't come up with a solution, every last human on Earth will be wiped out. She states that it won't just be on Earth, she is afraid the humans in the cosmos won't be spared either. She uses her status window to open a portal, jumps toward it, and says Hades' army has already arrived at Bergama and it won't be long before Sporades is pulled into battle, too. Meanwhile, Chen Jiliao asks the old man if he still cannot remember anything. The old man confirms that it is true, his memory is completely blank. He believes he does not even know who he is, and he truly does not understand what needs to be done to recover his memories. He reassures him not to worry, as there is a solution to everything, and this won't last forever. The system notifies him that he has arrived at the temple. He observes the temple and instructs Kepri to descend. Meanwhile, Argolis is inside the palace and detects a strange smell. Outside the palace, Kepri transforms back. He acknowledges that, whatever the case, he has worked hard. 
he responds that he is just doing his duty. He explains that this is the temple, and all he has to do is defeat the guardian, then he will be able to leave this place and return to the real world. Chen Jilao speculates that if the person who activated the temple and attacked the village is the same, they might still be inside the temple. Argali stands on the top of the palace, looks at Chen Jilao, and remarks that it's the smell, they finally meet. Chen Jilao thinks that this is the guy who attacked the village. Argalis gathers his magic and assures him, don't worry, he will cut his head off gently so he can die comfortably. He descends to attack, but Kepri intervenes, being a soul servant. Chen Jilao marvels at the incredible speed, realizing that the attack should have landed without question. Yet Kepri is far stronger than he imagined. Argalis contemplates that he actually has a soul servant, a privilege only gods can possess, and it seems Hades' worries were not unfounded. As he moves to attack again, Lucius arrives and grabs his arm. Her imposter monster joins the confrontation and attacks, capturing Argolis into a grave. Everyone gathers, and Boban instructs Chen Jilao to inform him of how they should settle the score with him for abandoning his teammates. Chen Jilao is surprised to see them and asks how they found this place. Sailili explains that it's all thanks to Lucius. She adds that her shadow wolf remembered his scent and followed its trail, but the scent disappeared before they got very far. Ross mentions that they could only keep walking along the same path, but there was still no trace of him. And fortunately, Grandpa Albert suddenly sensed a strong burst of power from this area just now. He looks at Grandpa Albert and notes that his arm has recovered. Grandpa Albert confirms that it has healed completely, thanking him. He replies he is welcome. Grandpa Albert points to Kepri and asks who that is. He states that's Kepri, his sole subordinate. They are all surprised to hear. Ross adds that Kepri is the bodyguard of the legendary Ra also known as the Scarab God and leader of the Egyptian pantheon. Argolis emerges from the grave with magic. They all see him. He uses his magic to attack them and declares that all of them will die. Kepri deploys a protection shield to safeguard them and instructs Chen Jilao to leave dealing with this opponent to him while the others should go look for the position of the seal. They all run toward the temple, and Chen Jilao says, All right, he will take care. Argolis sees them approaching the temple and is about to launch a magic attack on them but Kepri intervenes. He says, not again. They all stand outside the temple door, and the system asks him if he will enter the temple of Nablus. He affirms with a yes. The door opens, and he says, let's go, and they enter the temple. Argolis and Kepri observe them entering the temple. Kepri remarks that it's just them left. Inside the place, Chen Jilao thinks this is strange. They have been walking for such a long time, but there's still no end in sight. He stops and tells everyone to hold on. Boban asks if it's an enemy. He replies that there's no enemy. Boban questions why he did that and if he is trying to scare them on purpose. He asks if they have not noticed that there's still no end in sight after so long. Something's fishy. He observes the walls and remarks that he had studied the structure of the temple when he was outside. Just the distance they have covered since entering should already be more than the length of the temple by now. It's very likely that the structure of space and time here is completely different from the outside world. Grandpa Albert takes his sword, makes a cross mark on the wall, and says if they are simply going in circles, they will see this mark again after they move on. Grandpa Albert suggests they continue onwards. They run to start a new way. Chen Jilao notes that since entering the temple, the system has stopped providing the map function, and there are no mission prompts either. He wonders if he has overlooked something. Salili says, look here. They see a magical cross on the wall. Boban questions why they haven't reached the exit yet, noting that they have been walking for a long time. Ross reassures them to wait a little longer, explaining that according to their calculations, the exit should be right in front of them. Salili points out that their current movement speed is much faster than before, and they should have reached the exit a long time ago. Chen Jilao speculates that the exit is probably gone. Lucius adds that if she is not mistaken, the place in front of them should be the place they had marked. Chen Jilao concludes that they were sent into a loop by the temple. He checks the status window and remarks that they started looping in a circle, and the system has given no hints at all. He thinks Kepri is still battling that guy, and they can't afford to waste any more time here, and if they were caught by him, it would be the end for them. They all approach him, and Bras mentions that they have checked all the walls and floors, but there are no hidden doors or mechanisms. Grandpa Alber informs them that the walkway's protective array and formation have been destroyed, too. Chen Jilao asks about the ceiling and if he found anything. Grandpa Alber replies that they have checked everything, and it's not that there are no clues, they just need to think of a different way to get out of there. Boban suggests Sailili try using her fireball here to see if it can pierce through this wall. Maybe it will break due to the spell, 
and they will be able to exit this place. Sailily asks if they can really do that. Ross responds that there's nothing else they can do now, so there's no harm in trying. Sailily starts her flame dance and throws explosive fireballs toward the walls, saying, it worked. They see a big hole in the wall. Ross inquires if this means they have found the way out of there. He looks inside the broken wall and discovers the exact small space within. He remarks that this looks exactly like the sword Mark Grandpa Albert left behind. She wonders how this can be possible. Boban challenges anyone playing tricks on them to come out if they dare. Chen Jilao thinks he had seen something like this back when he was studying. Someone had compared the Earth to humanity's prison, and the entire walkway was designed in a circle and due to gravity, they did not realize it. And the other wall would just be another loop. He wonders how they are supposed to escape from here. Meanwhile, in Country J, at the Tokyo building, Chief Su presents photos to Professor Miyatake and states that these photos depict all the monsters that have suddenly appeared recently on Earth. They would like to request her help, as these monsters closely resemble those in a game called Cosmos. She mentions that the designs of these monsters were modeled after characters in mythological stories from around the world. Professor Miyatake examines the photos and confirms that these monsters are indeed recorded in said mythologies. Chief Su asks if she is sure, and if it's true, wouldn't that mean all those mythological stories are true? She responds affirmatively, stating that if those are true, then it also proves that the thing she is researching is not just a mythological story, but history. Meanwhile, they all sit in the temple, and Boban expresses that he doesn't know how to get out at all. He wonders if they are really going to be trapped here until death. Lucius asks if he can stop yelling around here. He becomes angry and questions what she said to him, asking if she wants to fight. Ross intervenes and tells him to calm down. Sailily asks Chen Jilao if he has thought of something. He replies that he hasn't yet. He wishes this had been a mission. At least there's always a way to complete a mission. And he must have missed out on something. And he wonders what he missed. The old man arrives and remarks that this is really like Auroboros. He recalls seeing a name like this in a mythology book and mentions that Auroboros is the symbol of a serpent devouring itself in an endless cyclic loop. He thinks of Jormungandr in Nordic legends and Shesha from Indian mythology, noting that all of these creatures are recorded to be a snake biting its tail. He inquires whether he is stating that they are presently inside Auroboros' stomach and wonders if they will be able to leave after cutting open its stomach. He clarifies that Auroboros is not as he imagined. It is the god of dreams, Waniros, imposing godly restrictions and from the moment they stepped into the temple, their senses were paralyzed by these godly restrictions. He asks if he knows a way to break this godly restriction. The old man responds that, of course, if he finds out who is casting this godly restriction and kills them, the restriction will be broken. He looks at everyone and asks if he is saying someone among them is not real and is the one that Waniros created instead. He says yes, but he must be careful, they are almost akin to a god inside Auroboros. Chen Jilao thinks if that's the case, then he will have to lay low for a while. He needs to give them a fatal strike when they are least expecting it and wonders who it will be. He observes everyone to find out who created Waniros and thinks about the guy who's disguising himself, trying to identify which one of them it is. Meanwhile, on the edge of the underworld, Waniros contemplates what's going on inside Latinea's temple, and the seal of dreams has been triggered. Lord Hades arrives and says it's been a while. She asks why he is here. He asks if he is unwelcome, questioning her expression. She says he is getting it wrong. It's just that he has never come to the edge of the underworld before, so she is a little surprised. She asks if he came here for something special. He says his beloved father, Cronus, has escaped the prison of Tartarus. She insists that it's impossible. The seal of dreams in the prison of Tartarus has not been activated, and there's no way he can escape unnoticed. He insists that before Zeus and Poseidon find out, she must help him bring him back quickly, otherwise, she will take his place in hell. She agrees, saying she understands. He leaves from there. She ponders what Cronus did to avoid triggering the Divine Seal, and evading the three-headed Cerberus, and also what exactly is going on inside Latinea's temple. Meanwhile, in the temple, Grandpa Albert asks what he said. He wants to undergo Hollingcam's training here. Chen Jilao confirms that's right, as they are trapped here, they might as well use the time to attempt the challenge again. After all, they lost terribly last time. Boban asks just what on earth he is up to. He questions what's wrong with doing it again and says there's nothing better to do anyway. He lost so badly last time, Tuwin asks if he is scared or something. Boban asks what he said and tells Grandpa Albert to hurry and use that weapon. Sailily advises Grandpa Albert not to listen to their nonsense. Chen Jilao thinks if they try it out one by one, they will be discovered by that guy soon enough. It would be better to cause chaos directly, 
and the bigger and more sudden the conflict, the greater the chance of that guy slipping up. He thinks if that's the real Grandpa Albert, he would surely agree to his request because he'd know that he did not ask for no reason. Grandpa Albert declares, All right, let's commence the training. Everyone is taken aback upon hearing this. He considers him one of the twelve heroes from the past, and with the most powerful sense of smell in the world, he is confident that he can understand the situation. The old man acknowledges that he did not expect him to devise a method like this, however, it is impossible to identify the imposter solely based on the other party's combat power. He remarks that combat techniques can be imitated, but what cannot be replicated is a person's habits. He emphasizes that during battle, everyone will have their unique ideas about combat, and these ideas, along with thought patterns, are ingrained in one's very bones, and such aspects are impossible to mimic. He adds that he must closely observe each participant during the fight to identify the imposter. The old man states that he has only one chance, if their knowledge of the dreamscape is discovered. They will be thrown into the God of Dreams time vortex, and it will be impossible to leave in that case. He reassures the old man not to worry, expressing confidence in his success. Grandpa Albert declares, All right, then the training is about to begin and take care, everyone. They all draw their weapons and commence fighting. Lucius expresses disinterest in such boring games and urges them to quickly find a way to leave. Chen Jilao believes Lucius's choice aligns with his strategy, eliminate the weakest opponent at the start of the fight. Based on their previous experience, he concludes that she should be genuine. He moves to attack Sailui, stating that she will hold back his clone, and together, he will eliminate the other imposters with Lucius. She agrees. He realizes the importance of their choices, as they can uncover any weaknesses the imposter may have through these decisions. They all engage in a fight with an imposter. Ross also joins the fray. Lucius comments that he can't even defeat an imposter of this level, deeming it too weak. Ross offers him her number, but he tells her to get lost. Chen Jiliao believes that Boban has attacked Lucius's clone, who is also a shadow assassin. As for Bross and Philago, they have opted to play it safe and confront their own clones. He thinks he and Lucius are going to attack Sailily's clone, who is the weakest, as Sailily is always indecisive about how she should fight. However, he realizes that he seems to have overlooked something and now knows who the imposter is. Bross fights with Lucius, and Boban attacks the imposter, thinking he has won. Chen Jiliao approaches Bross. He inquires about what he is looking at. Chen Jiliao attacks him with his sword, cutting him in half. Falago questions what he is doing. Boban asks if he is going insane. Bross transforms into a liquid, shocking everyone. Chen Jiliao thinks it looks like he got it right. Bross is indeed the imposter. The ceiling starts breaking, and a huge light emerges from there. They all sit down. Chen Jiliao wonders if they have escaped. Falago asks Bross if he is alright. Ross says he is fine and asks what happened and why they are sitting there. Boban asks what he is up to. He inquires about what he is looking at. Chen Jilao says they have escaped the loop, and a big door appears in front. Meanwhile, outside the temple, Kepri tells Argolis that giving his soul to the Hades dragon of the netherworld makes him garbage. He had hoped to play with him a little longer, but he finds him boring. Kepri picks him up by the neck. Argolis screams and asks who he is. Kepri replies that he should go to hell and inquire with his despicable master, Hades while tightening his grip. He observes Hades's divine seal around Argolis and mentions that the flame of the netherworld was in this bastard's body. Argolis manages to free himself. Meanwhile, Lord Hades senses something and believes the divine seal on Argolis has been activated, confirming that the god slayer is in Latinea for sure. Meanwhile, Grandpa Albert asks if everything that happened just now was because of the God of Dreams' divine seal. Chen Jilao confirms, saying yes. Sailily asks Grandpa Albert what divine seals are and why she has not heard of such a thing before. Boban adds that he doesn't know anything about it either and questions how Chen Jilao learned of it. Ross asks what else he is hiding from them. Lucius stands aside and explains that every god is given a divine seal unique to themselves, which can be used on either people or objects and once a divine seal is cast, it will remain in place until triggered unless the god dispels it on their own accord. She emphasizes that divine seals can be cast on gods as well, considering them the ultimate weapon of the gods. She mentions it's a miracle they escaped the god of dreams divine seal alive. Lucius asks Chen Jilao how he knew that killing Ross would dispel the divine seal. Ross questions him about killing him and asks what he just did. Chen Jilao explains that they were trapped in the Divine Seal and only managed to escape by killing him. He assures them that he is fine now. The system issues a warning that the sole subordinate, Kepri, 
has been sealed, and this will last for 30 hours. Chen Jiliao urges them to hurry, as the person outside the temple has sealed his soul subordinate, and should be there very soon. They all start running toward the door and go inside. Grandpa Albert advises everyone to be careful. Salili remarks that this is really strange, as there are zero guardian beasts in sight. The door starts closing, and they see many murmurs in front of them. Bross comments that he knew there would be monsters behind this door, but he did not think there would be so many. Moreover, the combat power of these monsters is far greater than that of the monsters in Latinea. He thinks even though these netherworld demons are 20 levels higher than the undead beasts in the Crimson Moon mission, tons of them have emerged all at once, and they seem really intimidating in this narrow passageway. As such, they are giving off a terrorizing aura that's hard to suppress. The status window notifies that it triggered the mission of Nablus's Eye of the Netherworld. The system provides him with mission completion requirements. The Eye of the Netherworld, created by Nablus, will continuously summon Netherworld ghouls, and the goal is to kill all the demons and destroy the Eye of the Netherworld, and upon completion, the Temple Guardian, Nablus, will be summoned. He observes Netherworld ghouls emerging from the Eye and realizes that the monsters are being summoned from within it, and their objective is clear, they need to destroy it. Salili expresses concern to Grandpa Alber about the increasing number of ghouls. Chen Jiliao moves quickly between them, attacking the ghouls, and believes that the most important thing now is to regain everyone's confidence. Everyone is shocked to see Chen Jiliao. He instructs them to keep their chins up, stating that the monsters are being summoned by that eye. He urges them to cover him while he makes his way there, assuring them that they will get past this. Bobin comments, what a show off. Grandpa Albert takes out his sword and instructs everyone to do their best to cover Chen Jiliao while he approaches the eye. He says, let the battle begin, and thinks he has to let them know they are not on their own and that he is someone they can absolutely rely on. They all move to fight. Bobin adds they can't let that man get all the glory. Chen Jiliao attacks a ghoul, but it does not hit him and passes through it. The status notifies that the netherworld ghouls have become spirits, and spirits are immune to all physical attacks. A ghoul moves to attack him, but he stops its attack. Bross notes that their attacks don't seem to work anymore. Salili attacks ghouls. Chen Jilao looks at her and thinks, however, Salili is the only mage among them. Luka uses the protection shield to shield them, and Salili employs her fire element, casting fire prison to attack the monsters. Chen Jilao uses a healer to heal Bobin, and the system notifies that using heal on Bobin has a duration of 30 seconds. Bobin complains, asking why his healing is so slow. He responds with a retort and thinks that the heal spell requires one minute of uninterrupted casting when used on others, and it seems like there are many rules he has not yet explored, especially regarding these troublesome high-level monsters that are immune to physical attacks. He contemplates how they can kill them. He realizes that they can't rely solely on Salili and Luka to hold the monsters back, as they won't last long against these formidable foes. They are already helpless in dealing with these monsters, and if that eye continues to summon more and more creatures, they will all die here. The system notifies that the healing is completed. Bobin announces that he is fully recovered and praises the effectiveness of the healing. Chen Jilao suggests that since he has recovered, they need to find a way to kill these monsters, as Salili and Luka won't last long. He considers that the old man disappeared while they were fighting, but he might know some ways to kill these monsters. He calls him and says he needs his help, however, there's no response. He wonders what to do now and looks at Grandpa Albert, pondering about his actions. He calls him again, and he asks if Bobin is alright. Chen Jilao responds that Bobin is fine now, but they need to think of a way to deal with these monsters soon. He asks if Grandpa Albert has seen this type of monster before. Grandpa Albert confirms, saying it's his second time encountering this type of monster. Chen Jiliao asks about the first time and inquires if he knows how to kill them. Grandpa Albert explains that during the Battle of O'Brien when he was fighting the troll Quink at the Black Sea, he also faced a similar skill. He could not deal any damage and was forced to just defend. The story transitions to a flashback in the Black Sea where Grandpa Albert fights with a monster, and the monster comes to attack him. In the present, he recalls that at that time, he thought he was going to die there, and out of nowhere, a sword crackling with blue lightning appeared in front of him, and his instincts told him that it was the god's blessing that would help him kill the monster. With that sword, he could not only hit the troll Quink but also deal devastating damage to it. Eventually, after a long battle, he killed Quink. He explains that it was only later that he found out the sword was the legendary Kara Daboga's sword containing the element of endless thunder. Rather than being injured by the slash, Quink was killed by the thunder magic on the sword's blade. 
Chen Jilao says thunder element magic on the sword blade and thinks he gets it now, and the so-called magic and physical damage are strictly distinguished in this virtual game world. He notes that Alber, Philoga, Boban, Bross, and Lucius all have warrior and assassin professions. Despite possessing different elemental attributes, their attacks were ineffective against the monsters because the system judged them as physical damage and only Salili's attack as a magician was recognized as a magic attack. Therefore, it can be concluded that the profession affects the judgment of the attack. He checks the status window and thinks Obliterate can upgrade all skills to elemental skills, which involve magic damage and Crescent Moon Slash is a magic attack similar to enhancing the weapon with the power of the Chaos Element. Grandpa Alba remarks that he has never seen a magician who can enchant a weapon. Chen Jilao thinks if his analysis is correct, killing these monsters will be simple. All ghouls scream to attack. Salili says to Grandpa Alba that she can't hold them back anymore. The system notifies that Autumn's Nether Spirit Song earrings have triggered providing a 100% damage bonus to death spirits. He attacks the ghouls and kills them. The system notifies that he has caused a 100% bonus damage to undead enemies, and he has killed the hell ghouls x5, earning 50,000 x. He uses the annihilation power to attack and tells everyone to follow him. He thinks the monsters are increasing rapidly, so before his skill goes into cooldown, he must get as close to the eye as possible. He employs Crescent Moon Slash. The system notifies that the Nether Spirit Song earrings have triggered a 5% increase in magic critical damage, and he has slain 20 Hell Ghouls, gaining 200,000 experience. He thinks that once they destroy the eye, they will finally reach Nablus. The system notifies that Execute the Gods has been activated, and its targets will be marked for 30 seconds. He believes he won't give up. He employs Annihilation Slash on the marked ghouls and attacks them. He believes he is very close. The system notifies that upon executing this god, he has killed 18 hell ghouls and obtained 180,000 experience. He believes he will go back no matter what. 